Chapter Fifteen, Part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, Part A. He strikes no coin, tis true, but coins new phrases, and vends them forth as knaves vend gilded counters, which wise men scorn, and fools accept in payment. Old Play In the morning Christie of the Clinthill was nowhere to be seen, as this worthy personage did seldom pique himself on sounding a trumpet before his movements. No one was surprised at his moonlight departure though some alarm was excited lest he had not made it empty-handed. So in the language of the national ballad, some ran to cupboard and some to kist, but naught was a way that could be missed. All was in order, the key of the stable left above the door, and that of the iron grate in the inside of the lock. In short, the retreat had been made with scrupulous attention to the security of the garrison, and so far Christie left them nothing to complain of. The safety of the premises was ascertained by Halbert, who, instead of catching up a gun or crossbow, and sallying out for the day as had been his frequent custom, now, with a gravity beyond his years, took a survey of all around the tower, and then returned to the spence or public apartment in which, at the early hour of seven, the morning meal was prepared. There he found the Euphuist in the same elegant posture of abstruse calculation which he had exhibited on the preceding evening, his arms folded in the same angle, his eyes turned up to the same cobwebs, and his heels resting on the ground as before. Tired of this affectation of indolent importance, and not much flattered with his guests persevering in it to the last, Halbert resolved at once to break the ice, being determined to know what circumstance had brought to the Tower of Glendinning a guest at once so supercilious and so silent. "'Sir Knight,' he said with some firmness, "'I have twice given you good morning, to which the absence of your mind hath, I presume, prevented you from yielding attention, or from making return. This exchange of courtesy is at your pleasure to give or withhold. But, as what I have further to say concerns your comfort and your motions, in an especial manner, I will entreat you to give me some signs of attention.' that I may be sure I am not wasting my words on a monumental image." At this unexpected address Sir Piercy Shafton opened his eyes, and afforded the speaker a broad stare. But as Halbert returned the glance without either confusion or dismay, the knight thought proper to change his posture, draw in his legs, raise his eyes, fix them on young Glendinning, and assume the appearance of one who listens to what is said to him. Nay, to make his purpose more evident, he gave voice to his resolution in these words. "'Speak. We do hear.' "'Sir Knight,' said the youth, "'it is the custom of this halidome, or patrimony of St. Mary's, to trouble with inquiries no guests who receive our hospitality, providing they tarry in our house for only a single revolution of the sun. We know that both criminals and debtors come hither for sanctuary and we scorn to extort from the pilgrim, whom chance may make our guest, an avowal of the cause of his pilgrimage and penance. But when one so high above our rank as yourself, Sir Knight, and especially one to whom the possession of such preeminence is not indifferent, shows his determination to be our guest for a longer time, it is our usage to inquire of him whence he comes, and what is the cause of his journey. The English knight gaped twice or thrice before he answered, and then replied in a bantering tone, "'Truly, good Villaggio, your question hath in it somewhat of embarrassment, for you ask me of things concerning which I am not as yet altogether determined what answer I may find it convenient to make. Let it suffice thee, kind juvenile, that thou hast the Lord Abbot's authority for treating me to the best of that power of thine.' which, indeed, may not always so well suffice for my accommodation as either of us would desire. "'I must have a more precise answer than this, Sir Knight,' said the young Glendinning. "'Friend,' said the knight, "'be not outrageous. It may suit your northern manners thus to press harshly upon the secrets of thy betters. But believe me, that even as the lute struck by an unskilful hand doth produce discords, so... At this moment the door of the apartment opened, and Mary Avenel presented herself. "'But who can talk of discords?' said the knight, assuming his complimentary vein and humour, 
when the soul of harmony descends upon us in the presence of surpassing beauty. For even as foxes, wolves, and other animals void of sense and reason, do fly from the presence of the resplendent sun of heaven when he arises in his glory, so do strife, wrath, and all ireful passions retreat, and as it were scud away from the face which now beams upon us, with power to compose our angry passions, illuminate our errors and difficulties, soothe our wounded minds, and lull to rest our disorderly apprehensions. For as the heat and warmth of the eye of day is to the material and physical world, so is the eye which I now bow down before to that of the intellectual microcosm. He concluded with a profound bow, and Mary Avenel, gazing from one to the other, and plainly seeing that something was amiss, could only say, For heaven's sake, what is the meaning of this? The newly acquired tact and intelligence of her foster brother was as yet insufficient to enable him to give an answer. He was quite uncertain how he ought to deal with a guest who, preserving a singularly high tone of assumed superiority and importance, seemed nevertheless so little serious in what he said that it was quite impossible to discern with accuracy whether he was in jest or earnest. Forming, however, the internal resolution to bring Sir Piercy Shafton to a reckoning at a more fit place and season, he resolved to prosecute the matter no farther at present, and the entrance of his mother with the damsel of the mill, and the return of the honest miller from the stack-yard, where he had been numbering and calculating the probable amount of the season's grist, rendered farther discussion impossible for the moment. In the course of the calculation it could not but strike the man of meal and grindstones, that after the church's dues were paid, and after all which he himself could by any means deduct from the crop, still the residue which must revert to Dame Glendinning could not be less than considerable. I wot not if this led the honest miller to nourish any plans similar to those adopted by Elspeth but it is certain that he accepted with grateful alacrity an invitation which the dame gave to his daughter, to remain a week or two as her guest at Glendearg. The principal persons being thus in high good humour with each other, all business gave place to the hilarity of the morning repast, and so much did Sir Piercy appear gratified by the attention which was paid to every word that he uttered by the nut-brown misie, that notwithstanding his high birth and distinguished quality, he bestowed on her some of the more ordinary and second-rate tropes of his elocution. Mary Avenel, when relieved from the awkwardness of feeling the full weight of his conversation addressed to herself, enjoyed it much more, and the good knight, encouraged by those conciliating marks of approbation from the sex, for whose sake he cultivated his oratorical talents, made speedy intimation of his purpose to be more communicative than he had shown himself in his conversation with Halbert Glendinning and gave them to understand that it was in consequence of some pressing danger that he was at present their involuntary guest. The conclusion of the breakfast was a signal for the separation of the company. The miller went to prepare for his departure, his daughter to arrange matters for her unexpected stay, Edward was summoned to consultation by Martin concerning some agricultural matter, in which Halbert could not be brought to interest himself. The dame left the room upon her household concerns, and Mary was in the act of following her, when she suddenly recollected that if she did so, the strange knight and Halbert must be left alone together, at the risk of another quarrel. The maiden no sooner observed this circumstance than she instantly returned from the door of the apartment, and seating herself in a small stone window-seat resolved to maintain that curb which she was sensible her presence imposed on Halbert Glendinning, of whose quick temper she had some apprehensions. The stranger marked her motions, and either interpreting them as inviting his society, or obedient to those laws of gallantry which permitted him not to leave a lady in silence and solitude, he instantly placed himself near to her side, and opened the conversation as follows. "'Credit me, fair lady,' he said, addressing Mary Avenel, it much rejoiceth me, being as I am a banished man from the delights of mine own country, that I shall find here in this obscure and sylvan cottage of the north a fair form and a candid soul, with whom I may explain my mutual sentiments. And let me pray you in particular, lovely lady, that according to the universal custom now predominant in our court, the garden of superior wits, 
you will exchange with me some epithet whereby you mark my devotion to your service. Be henceforward named, for example, my protection, and let me be your affability. Our northern and country manners, Sir Knight, do not permit us to exchange epithets with those to whom we are strangers, replied Mary Avenel. Nay, but see now, said the knight, how you are startled, even as the unbroken steed which swerves aside from the shaking of a handkerchief, though he must in time encounter the waving of a pennon. This courtly exchange of epithets of honour is no more than the compliments which pass between valour and beauty, wherever they meet, and under whatever circumstances. Elizabeth of England herself calls Philip Sidney her courage, and he in return calls that princess his inspiration. Wherefore, my fair protection, for by such epithet it shall be mine to denominate you. Not without the young lady's consent, sir, interrupted Halbert. Most truly do I hope your courtly and quaint breeding will not so far prevail over the more ordinary rules of civil behaviour. Fair tenant of an indifferent copyhold, replied the knight, with the same coolness and civility of mien, but in a tone somewhat more lofty than he used to the young lady. We do not in the southern parts much intermingled discourse, save with those with whom we may stand on some footing of equality. And I must in all discretion remind you that the necessity which makes us inhabitants of the same cabin doth not place us otherwise on a level with each other. "'By St. Mary,' replied young Glendinning, "'it is my thought that it does, for plain men hold that he who asks the shelter is indebted to him who gives it. And so far, therefore, is our rank equalized, while this roof covers us both. Thou art altogether deceived, answered Sir Piercy, and that thou mayest fully adapt thyself to our relative condition, know that I account not myself thy guest, but that of thy master, the Lord Abbot of St. Mary's, who for reasons best known to himself and me, chooseth to administer his hospitality to me through the means of thee, his servant and vassal, who art therefore in good truth as passive an instrument of my accommodation as this ill-made and rugged joint-stool on which I sit, or as the wooden trencher from which I eat my coarse commons. Wherefore, he added, turning to Mary, fairest mistress, or rather, as I said before, most lovely protection. Footnote. There are many instances to be met with in the ancient dramas of this whimsical and conceited custom of persons who formed an intimacy, distinguishing each other by some quaint epithet. In every man out of his humour, there is a humorous debate upon names most fit to bind the relation betwixt Sogliardo and Cavaliero Shift, which ends by adopting those of countenance and resolution. What is more to the point is in the speech of Hedon, a voluptuary and a courtier in Cynthia's revels, you know that I call Madame Palantia my honour, and she calls me her ambition. Now when I meet her in the presence, anon I will come to her and say, Sweet honour, I have hitherto contented my sense with the lilies of your hand, and now I will taste the roses of your lip. To which she cannot but blushing answer, Nay, now you are too ambitious. And then do I reply, I cannot be too ambitious of honour, sweet lady. Wilt not be good? I think there is some remnant of this foppery preserved in Masonic lodges, where each brother is distinguished by a name in the lodge, signifying some abstract quality, as discretion, or the like. See the poems of Gavin Wilson. End footnote. Mary Avenel was about to reply to him, when the stern, fierce, and resentful expression of voice and countenance with which Halbert exclaimed, Not from the King of Scotland did he live, would I brook such terms induced her to throw herself between him and the stranger, exclaiming, For God's sake, Halbert, beware what you do. Fear not, fairest protection, replied Sir Piercy with the utmost serenity, that I can be provoked by this rustical and mistaught juvenile to do aught misbecoming your presence or mine own dignity. For as soon shall the gunner's linstock give fire unto the icicle, as the spark of passion inflame my blood tempered as it is to serenity by the respect due to the presence of my gracious protection. "'You may well call her your protection, Sir Knight,' said Halbert. "'By St. Andrew it is the only sensible word I have heard you speak. But we may meet where her protection shall no longer afford you shelter.'" End of chapter 15, part A
Chapter Fifteen, Part B of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, Part B. Fairest protection, continued the courtier, not even honouring with a look, far less with a direct reply, the threat of the incensed Halbert. Doubt not that thy faithful affability will be more commoved by the speech of this Rudesby than the bright and serene moon is perturbed by the baying of the cottage cur proud of the height of his own dunghill which in his conceit lifteth him nearer unto the majestic luminary to what lengths so unsavoury a simile might have driven halbert's indignation is left uncertain for at that moment edward rushed into the apartment with the intelligence that two most important officers of the convent the kitchener and refectioner were just arrived with a sumpter mule loaded with provisions announcing that the lord abbot the sub-prior and the sacristan were on their way thither a circumstance so very extraordinary had never been recorded in the annals of st mary's or in the traditions of glendearg though there was a faint legendary report that a certain abbot had dined there in old days after having been bewildered in a hunting expedition amongst the wilds which lie to the northward but that the present lord abbot should have taken a voluntary journey to so wild and dreary a spot the very kamchatka of the halidome was a thing never dreamt of and the news excited the greatest surprise in all the members of the family saving halbert alone this fiery youth was too full of the insult he had received to think of anything as unconnected with it i am glad of it he exclaimed i am glad the abbot comes hither i will know of him by what right this stranger is sent hither to domineer over us under our father's roof as if we were slaves and not freemen i will tell the proud priest to his beard alas alas my brother said edward think what these words may cost thee and what will or what can they cost me said halbert that i should sacrifice my human feelings and my justifiable resentment to the fear of what the abbot can do our mother our mother exclaimed edward think if she is deprived of her home expelled from her property how can you amend what your rashness may ruin it is too true by heaven said halbert striking his forehead then stamping his foot against the floor to express the full energy of the passion to which he dared no longer give vent he turned round and left the apartment mary avenel looked at the stranger knight while she was endeavouring to frame a request that he would not report the intemperate violence of her foster-brother to the prejudice of his family in the mind of the abbot but sir piercy the very pink of courtesy conjectured her meaning from her embarrassment and waited not to be entreated credit me fairest protection said he your affability is less than capable of seeing or hearing far less of reciting or reiterating aught of an unseemly nature which may have chanced while i enjoyed the elysium of your presence the winds of idle passion may indeed rudely agitate the bosom of the rude but the heart of the courtier is polished to resist them as the frozen lake receives not the influence of the breeze even so the voice of Dame Glendinning, in shrill summons, here demanded Mary Avenel's attendance, who instantly obeyed, not a little glad to escape from the compliments and similes of this court-like gallant. Nor was it apparently less a relief on his part, for no sooner was she past the threshold of the room than he exchanged the look of formal and elaborate politeness which had accompanied each word he had uttered hitherto, for an expression of the utmost lassitude and ennui and after indulging in one or two portentous yawns broke forth into a soliloquy what the foul fiend sent this wench hither as if it were not sufficient plague to be harboured in a hovel that would hardly serve for a dog's kennel in england baited by a rude peasant boy and dependent on the faith of a mercenary ruffian but i cannot even have time to muse over my own mishap but must come aloft frisk fidget and make speeches to please this pale hectic phantom because she has gentle blood in her veins by mine honour setting prejudice aside the mill wench is more attractive of the two but patienza piercy shafton thou must not lose thy well-earned claim to be accounted a devout service of the fair sex a witty brained prompt and accomplished courtier rather thank heaven piercy shafton which hath sent thee a subject wherein without derogating from thy rank since the honours of the avenel family are beyond dispute 
thou mayest find a whetstone for thy witty compliments, a strop whereon to sharpen thine acute engine, a butt whereat to shoot the arrows of thy gallantry. For even as a Bilboa blade, the more it is rubbed, the brighter and sharper will it prove. So, but what need I waste my stock of similitudes in holding converse with myself? Yonder comes the monkish retinue, like some half-score of crows winging their way slowly up the valley. I hope, Agad, they have not forgotten my trunk-mails of apparel amid the ample provision they have made for their own belly-timber. Mercy, Agad, I were finally helped up if the vesture has miscarried among the thievish borderers. Stung by this reflection, he ran hastily downstairs, and caused his horse to be saddled, that he might, as soon as possible, ascertain this important point by meeting the Lord Abbot and his retinue as they came up the glen. He had not ridden a mile before he met them advancing with the slowness and decorum which became persons of their dignity and profession. The knight failed not to greet the Lord Abbot with all the formal compliments with which men of rank at that period exchanged courtesies. He had the good fortune to find that his mails were numbered among the train of baggage which attended upon the party, and satisfied in that particular, he turned his horse's head and accompanied the abbot to the tower of Glendearg. Great in the meanwhile had been the turmoil of the good dame Elspeth and her coadjutors to prepare for the fitting reception of the father lord abbot and his retinue. The monks had indeed taken care not to trust too much to the state of her pantry, but she was not the less anxious to make such additions as might enable her to claim the thanks of her feudal lord and spiritual father. Meeting Halbert, as with his blood on fire, he returned from his altercation with her guest, she commanded him instantly to go forth to the hill, and not to return without venison, reminding him that he was apt enough to go thither for his own pleasure, and must now do so for the credit of the house. The miller, who was now hastening his journey homewards, promised to send up some salmon by his own servant. Dame Elspeth, who by this time thought she had guests enough, had begun to repent of her invitation to poor Mysie and was just considering by what means, short of giving offence, she could send off the maid of the mill behind her father, and adjourn all her own aerial architecture till some future opportunity, when this unexpected generosity on the part of the sire rendered any present attempt to return his daughter on his hands too highly ungracious to be farther thought on. So the miller departed alone on his homeward journey. Dame Elspeth's sense of hospitality proved in this instance its own reward, for Mysie had dwelt too near the convent to be altogether ignorant of the noble art of cookery, which her father patronized to the extent of consuming on festival days such dainties as his daughter could prepare in emulation of the luxuries of the abbot's kitchen. Laying aside, therefore, her holiday kirtle, and adopting a dress more suitable to the occasion, the good-humoured maiden bared her snowy arms above the elbows and as Elspeth acknowledged, in the language of the time and country, took entire and a fold part with her, in the labours of the day, showing unparalleled talent, and indefatigable industry, in the preparation of mortreux, blanc manger, and heaven knows what delicacies besides which Dame Glendinning, unassisted by her skill, dared not even have dreamt of presenting. Leaving this able substitute in the kitchen, and regretting that Mary Avenel was so brought up that she could entrust nothing to her care, unless it might be seeing the great chamber strewed with rushes and ornamented with such flowers and branches as the season afforded, Dame Elspeth hastily donned her best attire, and with a beating heart presented herself at the door of her little tower, to make her obeisance to the Lord Abbot as he crossed her humble threshold. Edward stood by his mother, and felt the same palpitation which his philosophy was at a loss to account for. He was yet to learn how long it is ere our reason is enabled to triumph over the force of external circumstances, and how much our feelings are affected by novelty, and blunted by use and habit. On the present occasion he witnessed with wonder and awe the approach of some half-score of riders, sober men upon sober palfreys, muffled in their long black garments, and only relieved by their white scapularies, showing more like a funeral procession than aught else, and not quickening their pace beyond that which permitted easy conversation and easy digestion. The sobriety of the scene was indeed somewhat enlivened by the present of Sir Piercy Shafton, who, to show that his skill in the menage was not inferior to his other accomplishments, kept alternately pressing and checking his gay courser, forcing him to piaf, to caracol, 
to passage, and to do all the other feats of the school to the great annoyance of the Lord Abbot, the wonted sobriety of whose palfrey became at length discomposed by the vivacity of its companion, while the dignitary kept crying out in bodily alarm, I do pray you, Sir Knight, good now, Sir Piercy, be quiet. Benedict, there is a good steed, so, poor fellow, and uttering all the other precatory and soothing exclamations by which a timid horseman usually bespeaks the favour of a frisky companion, or of his own unquiet nag, and concluding the bead-roll with a sincere Deo gracias, so soon as he alighted in the courtyard of the tower of Glendearg. The inhabitants unanimously knelt down to kiss the hand of the Lord Abbot, a ceremony which even the monks were often condemned to. Good Abbot Boniface was too much fluttered by the incidents of the latter part of his journey to go through this ceremony with much solemnity, or indeed with much patience. He kept wiping his brow with a snow-white handkerchief with one hand, while another was abandoned to the homage of his vassals, and then signing the cross with his outstretched arm, and exclaiming, Bless ye, bless ye, my children, he hastened into the house, and murmured not a little at the darkness and steepness of the rugged winding stair, whereby he at length scaled the spence destined for his entertainment, and overcome with fatigue, threw himself, I do not say, into an easy chair, but into the easiest the apartment afforded. End of chapter 15, part B Chapter 16, part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16, part A a courtier extraordinary who by diet of meats and drinks his temperate exercise choice music frequent bath his horary shifts of shirts and waistcoats means to immortalize mortality itself and makes the essence of his whole happiness the trim of court magnetic lady when the lord abbot had suddenly and superciliously vanished from the eyes of his expectant vassals the sub-prior made amends for the negligence of his principal by the kind and affectionate greeting which he gave to all the members of the family, but especially to Dame Elspeth, her foster-daughter, and her son Edward. Where, he even condescended to inquire, is that naughty Nimrod Halbert? He hath not yet, I trust, turned, like his great prototype, his hunting spear against man, said Dame Glendinning. Halbert is up at the glen to get some venison, or surely he would not have been absent when such a day of honour dawned upon me and mine. "'Oh, to get savoury meat such as our soul loveth,' muttered the sub-prior. "'It has been at times an acceptable gift. I bid you good morrow, my good dame, as I must attend upon his lordship the father abbot.' "'And, O oh, reverend sir,' said the good widow, detaining him, "'if it might be your pleasure to take part with us, if there is anything wrong.' and if there is anything wanted, to say that it is just coming, or to make some excuses your learning best knows how, every bit of vassail and silver work have we been spoiled of since Pinky Clutch, when I lost poor Simon Glendinning, that was the worst of all. Never mind, never fear, said the sub-prior, gently extricating his garment from the anxious grasp of Dame Elspeth. The refectioner has with him the abbot's plate and drinking cups, and I pray you to believe that whatever is short in your entertainment will be deemed amply made up in your good will. So saying, he escaped from her and went into the spence where such preparations as haste permitted were making for the noon collation of the abbot and the English knight. Here he found the lord abbot, for whom a cushion composed of all the plaids in the house had been unable to render Simon's huge elbow chair a soft or comfortable place of rest. Benedicite, said Abbot Boniface, how merry fie upon these hard benches with all my heart. They are as uneasy as the scabella of our novices. St. Jude be with us, Sir Knight. How have you contrived to pass over the night in this dungeon? And your bed was no softer than your seat. You might as well have slept on the stone couch of St. Pacomius. After trotting a full ten miles, a man needs a softer seat then has fallen to my hard lot. With sympathizing faces the sacristan and the refectioner ran to raise the Lord Abbot and to adjust his seat to his mind, which was at length accomplished in some sort, although he continued alternately to bewail his fatigue and to exult in the conscious sense of having discharged an arduous duty. 
"'You errant cavaliers,' said he, addressing the knight, "'may now perceive that others have their travail and their toils to undergo as well as your honoured faculty. And this I will say for myself and the soldiers of St. Mary, among whom I may be termed captain, that it is not our want to flinch from the heat of the service, or to withdraw from the good fight. No, by St. Mary, no sooner did I learn that you were here, and dared not for certain reasons come to the monastery, where with as good will and with more convenience we might have given you a better reception, than, striking the table with my hammer, I called a brother. Timothy, said I, let them saddle Benedict, let them saddle my black palfrey, and bid the sub-prior and some half-score of attendants be in readiness to-morrow after matins. We would ride to Glendirk. Brother Timothy stared, thinking, I imagined, that his ears had scarce done him justice, but I repeated my commands, and said, Let the kitchener and refectioner go before to aid the poor vassals to whom the place belongs in making a suitable collation, so that you will consider, good Sir Piercy, our mutual incommodities, and forgive whatever you may find amiss. By my faith, said Sir Piercy Shafton, there is nothing to forgive. If you spiritual warriors have to submit to the grievous incommodities which your lordship narrates, it would ill become me, a sinful and secular man, to complain of a bed as hard as a board, of broth which relished as if made of burnt wool, of flesh which in its sable and singed shape seemed to put me on a level with Richard Coeur de Lion, when he ate up the head of a moor carbonadoed, and of other viands savouring rather of the rusticity of this northern region. "'By the good saints, sir,' said the abbot, somewhat touched in point of his character for hospitality, of which he was in truth a most faithful and zealous professor, it grieves me to the heart that you have found our vassals no better provided for your reception. Yet I crave leave to observe that if Sir Piercy Shafton's affairs had permitted him to honour with his company our poor house of St. Mary's, he might have had less to complain of in respect of easements.' To give your lordship the reasons, said Sir Piercy Shafton, why I could not at this present time approach your dwelling, or avail myself of its well-known and undoubted hospitality, craves either some delay, or, looking around him, a limited audience. The Lord Abbot immediately issued his mandate to the refectioner. Hide thee to the kitchen, brother Hilarius, and make their inquiry of our brother the kitchener, within what time he opines that our collation may be prepared since sin and sorrow it were, considering the hardships of this noble and gallant knight, no whit mentioning, or weighing those we ourselves have endured, if we were now either to advance or retire the hour of refection upon the time when the viands are fit to be set before us. Brother Hilarius parted with an eager alertness to execute the will of his superior, and returned with the assurance that punctually at one afternoon would the collation be ready. Before that time, said the accurate refectioner, the wafers, flams, and pastry-meat will scarce have had the just degree of fire which learned pottingers prescribe as fittest for the body, and if it should be past one o'clock, were it but ten minutes, our brother the kitchener opines that the haunch of venison would suffer in spite of the skill of the little turnbroche whom he has recommended to your holiness by his praises. How, said the abbot, a haunch of venison, from whence comes that dainty? I remember not thou didst intimate its presence in thy hamper of vivers. So please your holiness and lordship, said the refectioner. He is a son of the woman of the house who has shot it and sent it in. Killed but now. Yet, as the animal heat hath not left the body, the kitchener undertakes it shall eat as tender as a young chicken. And this youth hath a special gift in shooting deer, and never misses the heart or the brain, so that the blood is not driven through the flesh, as happens too often with us. It is a heart of grease. Your holiness has seldom seen such a haunch. Silence, brother Hilarius, said the abbot, wiping his mouth. It is not beseeming our order to talk of food so earnestly, especially as we must oft have our animal powers exhausted by fasting, and be accessible, as being ever mere mortals, to those signs of longing, he again wiped his mouth, which arise on the mention of victuals to an hungry man. Minute down, however, the name of that youth, it is fitting merit should be warded, and he shall hereafter be a frater ad secorendum in the kitchen and buttery. Alas, reverend father and my good lord, replied the refectioner, I did inquire after the youth, and I learned that he is one who prefers the cask to the cowl, and the sword of the flesh to the weapons of the spirit. And if it be so, said the abbot, 
See that thou retain him as a deputy-keeper and man-at-arms, and not as a lay-brother of the monastery, for old Tallboy our forester waxes dim-eyed, and hath twice spoiled a noble buck by hitting him unwarily on the haunch. Ah, tis a foul fault, the abusing by evil killing, evil dressing, evil appetite, or otherwise the good creatures indulged to us for our use. Wherefore secure us the service of this youth, Brother Hilarius, in the way that may best suit him. And now, Sir Piercy Shafton, since the fates have assigned us a space of well nigh an hour, ere we dare hope to enjoy more than the vapour or savour of our repast, may I pray you of your courtesy to tell me the cause of this visit, and above all to inform us why you will not approach our more pleasant and better furnished hospitium. Reverend Father, and my very good lord, said Sir Piercy Shafton, it is well known to your wisdom that there are stone walls which have ears, and that secrecy is to be looked to in matters which concern a man's head. The abbot signed to his attendants, accepting the sub-prior, to leave the room, and then said, Your valour, Sir Piercy, may freely unburden yourself before our faithful friend and counsellor, Father Eustace, the benefits of whose advice we may too soon lose, inasmuch as his merits will speedily recommend him to an higher station, in which we trust he may find the blessing of a friend and adviser as valuable as himself, since I may say of him, as our claustral rhyme goeth, footnote, the rest of this doggerel rhyme may be found in Fosbrook's learned work on British monachism. End footnote. Dixit abbas ad prioris, tu es homo boni mores, quia semper saniores, mihi das concilia. Indeed, he added, the office of sub-prior is altogether beneath our dear brother, nor can we elevate him unto that of prior, which for certain reasons is at present kept vacant amongst us. Howbeit, Father Eustace is fully possessed of my confidence, and worthy of yours, and well may it be said of him, Intravit in secretis nostris. Sir Piercy Shafton bowed to the reverend brethren, and heaving a sigh as if he would burst his steel cuirass, he thus commenced his speech. Sirs, reverend sirs, I may well heave such a suspiration, who have, as it were, exchanged heaven for purgatory, leaving the lightsome sphere of the royal court of England for a remote nook in this inaccessible desert, quitting the tilt-yard, where I was ever ready among my compeers to splinter a lance, either for the love of honour or for the honour of love, in order to couch my knightly spear against base and pilfering pisagnios and marauders exchanging the lighted halls wherein i used nimbly to pace the swift caranto or to move with a loftier grace in the stately galliard for this rugged and decayed dungeon of rusty-coloured stone quitting the gay theatre for the solitary chimney-nook of a scottish dog-house bartering the sounds of the soul-ravishing lute and the love-awaking viol de gamba for the discordant squeak of a northern bagpipe and above all exchanging the smiles of those beauties who form a gay galaxy around the throne of england for the cold courtesy of an untaught damsel and the bewildered stare of a miller's maiden more might i say of the exchange of the conversation of gallant knights and gay courtiers of mine own order and capacity whose conceits are bright and vivid as the lightning for that of monks and churchmen but it were discourteous to urge that topic End of chapter 16, part A. Chapter 16, part B of The Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16, part B. The abbot listened to this list of complaints with great round eyes, which evinced no exact intelligence of the orator's meaning. And when the knight paused to take a breath, he looked with a doubtful and inquiring eye at the sub-prior, not well knowing in what tone he should reply to an exordium so extraordinary. The sub-prior accordingly stepped in to the relief of his principal. "'We deeply sympathize with you, Sir Knight, in the several mortifications and hardships to which fate has subjected you, particularly in that which has thrown you into the society of those who, as they were conscious, they deserved not such an honour, so neither did they at all desire it. But all this goes little way to expound the cause of this train of disasters, or, in plainer words, the reason which has compelled you into a situation having so few charms for you. 
"'Gentle and reverend sir,' replied the knight, "'forgive an unhappy person who, in giving a history of his miseries, dilateth upon them extremely, even as he who, having fallen from a precipice, looketh forward to measure the height from which he hath been precipitated. Yea, but, said Father Eustace, methinks it were wiser in him to tell those who come to lift him up which of his bones have been broken. You, reverend sir, said the knight, have in the encounter of our wits made a fair attaint, whereas I may be in some sort said to have broken my staff across. Footnote a taint was a term of tilting used to express the champion's having attained his mark, or in other words struck his lance straight and fair against the helmet or breast of his adversary, whereas to break the lance across intimated a total failure in directing the point of the weapon on the object of his aim. End footnote. Pardon me, grave sir, that I speak in the language of the tilt-yard, which is doubtless strange to your reverend years. Ah, brave resort of the noble! the fair and the gay, ah, throne of love and citadel of honour, ah, celestial beauties by whose bright eyes it is graced. Never more shall Piercy Shafton advance, as the centre of your radiant glances, couch his lance, and spur his horse at the sound of the spirit-stirring trumpets, nobly called the voice of war, never more shall he baffle his adversaries and counter boldly break his spear dexterously, and ambling around the lovely circle receive the rewards with which beauty honours chivalry. Here he paused, wrung his hands, looked upwards, and seemed lost in contemplation of his own fallen fortunes. "'Mad, very mad,' whispered the abbot to the sub-prior. "'I would we were fairly rid of him, for of a truth I expect he will proceed from raving to mischief. Were it not better to call up the rest of the brethren?' But the sub-prior knew better than his superior how to distinguish the jargon of affectation from the ravings of insanity, and although the extremity of the knight's passion seemed altogether fantastic, yet he was not ignorant to what extravagancies the fashion of the day can conduct its votaries. Allowing therefore two minutes space to permit the knight's enthusiastic feelings to exhaust themselves, he again gravely reminded him that the Lord Abbot had taken a journey, unwanted to his age and habits, solely to learn in what he could serve Sir Piercy Shafton, that it was altogether impossible he could do so, without his receiving distinct information of the situation in which he had now sought refuge in Scotland. The day wore on, he observed, looking at the window, and if the Abbot should be obliged to return to the monastery without obtaining the necessary intelligence, the regret might be mutual, but the inconvenience was like to be all on Sir Piercy's own side. The hint was not thrown away. O oh, goddess of courtesy, said the knight, can I so far have forgotten thy behests as to make this good prelate's ease and time a sacrifice to my vain complaints? Know then, most worthy, and not less worshipful, that I, your poor visitor and guest, am by birth nearly bound to the Piercy of Northumberland whose fame is so widely blown through all the parts of the world where English worth hath been known. Now this present Earl of Northumberland, of whom I would propose to give you the brief history— "'It is altogether unnecessary,' said the abbot. "'We know him to be a good and true nobleman, and a sworn upholder of our Catholic faith, in the spite of the heretical woman who now sits upon the throne of England. And it is specially as his kinsman— and as knowing that ye partake with him in such devout and faithful relief and adherence to our holy mother church, that we say to you, Sir Piercy Shafton, that ye be heartily welcome to us, and that we wist how we would labour to do you good service in your extremity. For such kind offer I rest your most humble debtor, said Sir Piercy, nor need I at this moment say more than that my right honourable cousin of Northumberland, having devised with me and some others, the choice and picked spirits of the age, how and by what means the worship of God, according to the Catholic Church, might be again introduced into this distracted kingdom of England, even as one deviseth by the assistance of his friend to catch and bridle a runaway steed. It pleased him so deeply to entrust me in those communications, that my personal safety becomes, as it were, entwined or complicated therewith. Natheless, as we have had sudden reason to believe this Princess Elizabeth, who maintaineth around her a sort of counsellor skilful in tracking whatever schemes may be pursued for bringing her title into challenge, or for erecting again the discipline of the Catholic Church, has obtained certain knowledge of the trains which we had laid before we could give fire unto them. 
Wherefore my right honourable cousin of Northumberland, thinking it best belike, that one man should take both blame and shame for the whole, did lay the burden of all this trafficking upon my back, which load I am the rather content to bear, in that he hath always shown himself my kind and honourable kinsman, as well as that my estate, I wot not how, hath of late been somewhat insufficient to maintain the expense of those braveries, wherewith it is incumbent on us, who are chosen and selected spirits, to distinguish ourselves from the vulgar. So that possibly, said the sub-prior, your private affairs rendered a foreign journey less incommodious to you than it might have been to the noble earl, your right worthy cousin? You are right, reverend sir, answered the courtier. Remick you, you have touched the point with a needle. My cost and expenses had been indeed somewhat lavish at the late triumphs and tourneys, and the flat-capped citizens had shown themselves unwilling to furnish my pocket for new gallantries for the honour of the nation, as well as for mine own peculiar glory, and to speak truth, it was in some part the hope of seeing these matters amended that led me to desire a new world in England. "'So that the miscarriage of your public enterprise, with the derangement of your own private affairs,' said the sub-prior, "'have induced you to seek Scotland as a place of refuge?' Remick you once again, said Sir Piercy, and not without good cause, since my neck, if I remained, might have been brought within the circumstances of a halter, and so speedy was my journey northward, that I had but time to exchange my peach-coloured doublet of Genoa velvet, thickly laid over with goldsmith's work, for this cuirass, which was made by Bonamico of Milan, and travelled northward with all speed, judging that I might do well to visit my right honourable cousin of Northumberland at one of his numerous castles, but as I posted towards Alnwick, even with the speed of a star which, darting from its native sphere, shoots wildly downwards, I was met at North Allerton by one Henry Vaughan, a servant of my right honourable kinsman, who showed me that, as then I might not with safety come to his presence, seeing that, in obedience to orders from his court, he was obliged to issue out letters for my incarceration. This, said the abbot, seems but hard measure on the part of your honourable kinsman. "'It might be so judged, my lord,' replied Sir Piercy. "'Nevertheless, I will stand to the death for the honour of my right honourable cousin of Northumberland. Also Henry Vaughan gave me from my said cousin a good horse and a purse of gold, with two border-prickers, as they are called, for my guides, who conducted me by such roads and by-paths as have never been seen since the days of Sir Launcelot and Sir Tristram, into this kingdom of Scotland.' and to the house of a certain baron, or one who holds the style of such, called Julian Avenel, with whom I found such reception as the place and party could afford. And that, said the abbot, must have been right wretched, for to judge from the appetite which Julian showeth when abroad, he hath not, I judge, overabundant provision at home. You are right, sir. Your reverence is in the right, continued Sir Piercy. We had but Lenten fare, and what was worse, a score to clear at the departure. For though this Julian Avenel called us to no reckoning, yet he did so extravagantly admire the fashion of my poniard, the poignet being of silver exquisitely hatched, and indeed the weapon being altogether a piece of exceeding rare device and beauty, that in faith I would not for very shame's sake but pray his acceptance of it, words which he gave me not the trouble of repeating twice, before he had stuck it into his greasy buff belt, where credit me, reverend sir, it showed more like a butcher's knife than a gentleman's dagger. "'So goodly a gift might at least have purchased you a few days' hospitality,' said Father Eustace. "'Reverend sir,' said Sir Piercy, "'had I abidden with him, I should have been complimented out of every remnant of my wardrobe, actually flayed by the hospitable gods, I swear it. Sir, he secured my spare doublet, and had a pluck at my galligaskins. I was enforced to beat a retreat before I was altogether unrigged. That border knave, his serving-man, had a pluck at me, too, and usurped a scarlet cassock and steel cuirass belonging to the page of my body, whom I was fain to leave behind me. In good time I received a letter from my right honourable cousin, showing me that he had written to you in my behalf, and sent to your charge two mails filled with wearing apparel, namely my rich crimson silk doublet, slashed out and lined with cloth of gold which i wore at the last revels with baldric and trimmings to correspond also two pair black silk slops with hanging garters of carnation silk 
also the flesh-coloured silken doublet with the trimmings of fur in which i danced the salvage man at the gray's inn mummery also sir knight said the sub-prior i pray you to spare the farther inventory of your wardrobe the monks of st mary's are no freebooting barons and whatever part of your vestments arrived at our house have been this day faithfully brought hither with the mails which contained them i may presume from what has been said as we have indeed been given to understand by the earl of northumberland that your desire is to remain for the present as unknown and as unnoticed as may be consistent with your high worth and distinction alas reverend father replied the courtier a blade when it is in the scabbard cannot give lustre a diamond when it is in the casket cannot give light and worth when it is compelled by circumstances to obscure itself cannot draw observation my retreat can only attract the admiration of those few to whom circumstances permit its displaying itself i conceive now my venerable father and lord said the sub-prior that your wisdom will assign such a course of conduct to this noble knight as may be alike consistent with his safety and with the weal of the community for you wot well that perilous strides have been made in these audacious days to the destruction of all ecclesiastical foundations and that our holy community has been repeatedly menaced hitherto they have found no flaw in our raiment but a party friendly as well to the queen of england as to the heretical doctrines of the schismatical church or even to worse and wilder forms of heresy prevails now at the court of our sovereign who dare not yield to her suffering clergy the protection she would gladly extend to them my lord and reverend sir said the knight i will gladly relieve you of my presence while you canvass this matter at your freedom and to speak truly i am desirous to see in what case the chamberlain of my noble kinsman hath found my wardrobe and how he hath packed the same and whether it has suffered from the journey there are four suits of as pure and elegant device as ever the fancy of a fair lady doted upon every one having a treble and appropriate change of ribbons trimmings and fringes which in case of need may as it were renew each of them and multiply the four into twelve there is also my sad coloured riding suit and three cutwork shirts with falling bands i pray you pardon me i must needs see how matters stand with them without farther dallying thus speaking he left the room and the sub-prior looking after him significantly added where the treasure is will the heart be also st mary preserve our wits said the abbot stunned with the knight's abundance of words were man's brains ever so stuffed with silk and broadcloth cut-work and i wot not what besides and what could move the earl of northumberland to assume for his bosom counsellor in matters of death and danger such a feather-brained coxcomb as this had he been other than what he is venerable father said the sub-prior he had been less fitted for the part of scapegoat to which his right honourable cousin had probably destined him from the commencement in case of their plot failing i know something of this piercy shafton the legitimacy of his mother's descent from the piercy family the point on which he is most jealous hath been called in question if hare-brained courage and an outrageous spirit of gallantry can make good his pretensions to the high lineage he claims these qualities have never been denied him for the rest he is one of the ruffling gallants of the time like howland york stukely footnote york says camden was a londoner a man of loose and dissolute behaviour and desperately audacious famous in his time amongst the common bullies and swaggerers as being the first that to the great admiration of many at his boldness brought into england the bold and dangerous way of fencing with the rapier in duelling whereas till that time the english used to fight with long swords and bucklers striking with the edge and thought it no part of man either to push or strike beneath the girdle having a command in the low countries york revolted to the spaniards and died miserably poisoned as was supposed by his new allies three years afterwards his bones were dug up and gibbeted by the command of the states of holland thomas stukeley another distinguished gallant of the time was bred a merchant being the son of a rich clothier in the west he wedded the daughter and heiress of a wealthy alderman of london named curtis after whose death he squandered the riches he thus acquired in all manner of extravagance his wife whose fortune supplied his waste represented to him that he ought to make more of her stukeley replied i will make as much of thee believe me as it is possible for any to do and he kept his word in one sense 
having stripped her even of her wearing apparel before he finally ran away from her. Having fled to Italy, he contrived to impose upon the Pope, with a plan of invading Ireland, for which he levied soldiers and made some preparations, but ended by engaging himself and his troops in the service of King Sebastian of Portugal. He sailed with that prince on his fatal voyage to Barbary, and fell with him at the Battle of Alcazar. Stukely, as one of the first gallants of the time, has had the honour to be chronicled in song in Evans' Old Ballads, Volume 3, edition 1810. His fate is also introduced in a tragedy by George Peel, as has been supposed, called The Battle of Alcazar, from which play Dryden is alleged to have taken the idea of Don Sebastian. If so, it is surprising he omitted a character so congenial to King Charles the Second's time as the witty, brave, and profligate Thomas Stukely. End footnote. And others who wear out their fortunes and endanger their lives in idle braveries in order that they may be esteemed the only choice gallants of the time, and afterwards endeavour to repair their estate by engaging in the desperate plots and conspiracies which wiser heads have devised. To use one of his own conceited similitudes, such courageous fools resemble hawks, which the wiser conspirator keeps hooded and blinded on his wrist until the quarry is on the wing, and who are then flown at them. St. Mary, said the abbot, he were an evil guest to introduce into our quiet household. Our young monks make bustle enough, and more than is beseeming God's servants about their outward attire already. This night were enough to turn their brains from the vestiarius down to the very scullion boy. A worse evil might follow, said the sub-prior. In these bad days the patrimony of the church is bought and sold, forfeited and distrained, as if it were the unhallowed soil appertaining to a secular baron. Think what penalty awaits us were we convicted of harboring a rebel to her whom they call the Queen of England. There would neither be wanting Scottish parasites to beg the lands of the foundation, nor an army from England to burn and harry the halidome. The men of Scotland were once Scotsmen, firm and united in the love of their country, and throwing every other consideration aside when the frontier was menaced. Now they are, what shall I call them, the one part French, the other part English, considering their dear native country merely as a prize-fighting stage, upon which foreigners are welcome to decide their quarrels. Benedictine, replied the abbot, they are indeed slippery and evil times. And therefore, said Father Eustace, we must walk warily. We must not, for example, bring this man, this Sir Piercy Shafton, to our house of St. Mary's. But how then shall we dispose of him? replied the abbot. Bethink thee that he is a sufferer for Holy Church's sake, that his patron, the Earl of Northumberland, hath been our friend, and that lying so near to us he may work us weal or woe according as we deal with his kinsmen. And accordingly, said the sub-prior, for these reasons, as well as for discharge of the great duty of Christian charity, I would protect and relieve this man. Let him not go back to Julian Avenel. That unconscientious baron would not stick to plunder the exiled stranger. Let him remain here. The spot is secluded, and if the accommodation be beneath his quality, discovery will become the less likely. We will make such means for his convenience as we can devise. Will he be persuaded, thinkest thou, said the abbot? I will leave my own travelling bed for his repose, and send up a suitable easy chair. With such easements, said the sub-prior, he must not complain, and then, if threatened by any sudden danger, he can soon come down to the sanctuary, where we will harbour him in secret, until means can be devised of dismissing him in safety. Were we not better, said the abbot, send him on to the court, and get rid of him at once? Ay, but at the expense of our friends. This butterfly may fold his wings and lie under cover in the cold air of Glendearg, but were he at Holyrood, he would, did his life depend on it, expand his spangled drapery in the eyes of the Queen and Court. Rather than fail of distinction, he would sue for love to our gracious Sovereign. The eyes of all men would be upon him in the course of three short days, and the international peace of the two ends of the island, endangered for a creature who, like a silly moth, cannot abstain from fluttering round a light. Thou hast prevailed with me, Father Eustace, said the abbot, and it will go hard, but I improve on thy plan. I will send up in secret not only household stuff, but wine and wassail bread. There is a young swanky here who shoots venison well. I will give him directions to see that the knight lacks none. 
"'Whatever accommodation he can have, which infers not a risk of discovery,' said the sub-prior, "'it is our duty to afford him.' "'Nay,' said the abbot, "'we will do more, and will instantly dispatch a servant express to the keeper of our revestiary to send us such things as he may want, even this night. See it done, good father.' "'I will,' answered Father Eustace, "'but I hear the gull clamorous for some one to truss his points.' Footnote. The points were the strings of cord or ribbon, so called because pointed, with metal like the laces of women's stays, which attached the doublet to the hose. They were very numerous, and required assistance to tie them properly, which was called trussing. End footnote. He will be fortunate if he lights on any one here who can do him the office of groom of the chamber. I would he would appear, said the abbot, for here comes the refectioner with the collation. By my faith, the ride hath given me a sharp appetite. End of chapter 16, part B Chapter 17 of The Monastery by Walter Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 I'll seek for other aid. Spirits, they say, flit round invisible as thick as motes dance in the sunbeam. If that spell or necromancer's sigil can compel them, they shall hold counsel with me. James Duff The reader's attention must be recalled to Halbert Glendinning, who had left the Tower of Glendearg immediately after his quarrel with its new guest, Sir Piercy Shafton. As he walked with a rapid pace up the glen, old Martin followed him, beseeching him to be less hasty. Halbert, said the old man, you will never live to have white hair if you take fire thus at every spark of provocation. "'And why should I wish it, old man?' said Halbert, "'if I am to be the butt that every fool may aim a shaft of scorn against. What avails it, old man, that you yourself move, sleep, and wake, eat thy niggard meal, and repose on thy hard pallet? Why art thou so well pleased that the morning should call thee up to daily toil, and the evening again lay thee down a wearied-out wretch?' Were it not better to sleep and wake no more than to undergo this dull exchange of labour for insensibility, and of insensibility for labour? "'God help me,' answered Martin. "'There may be truth in what thou sayest, but walk slower, for my old limbs cannot keep pace with your young legs. Walk slower, and I will tell you why age, though unlovely, is yet endurable.' "'Speak on, then,' said Halbert, slackening his pace. But remember we must seek venison to refresh the fatigues of these holy men, who will this morning have achieved a journey of ten miles, and if we reach not the Broxburn head, we are scarce like to see an antler. "'Then know, my good Halbert,' said Martin, whom I love as my own son, that I am satisfied to live till death calls me, because my Maker wills it. Ay, and although I spend what men call a hard life, pinched with cold in winter and burnt with heat in summer, though I feel hard and sleep hard, and am held mean and despised, yet I bethink me that were I of no use on the face of this fair creation, God would withdraw me from it. Thou poor old man, said Halbert, and can such a vain conceit as this of thy fancied use reconcile thee to a world where thou playest so poor a part? My part was nearly as poor, said Martin, my person nearly as much despised, the day that I saved my mistress and her child from perishing in the wilderness. "'Right, Martin,' answered Halbert, "'there, indeed, thou didst what might be a sufficient apology for a whole life of insignificance. "'And do you account it for nothing, Halbert, that I should have the power of giving you a lesson of patience and submission to the destinies of Providence? Methinks there is use for the grey hairs on the old scalp, were it but to instruct the green head by precept and by example.' Halbert held down his face, and remained silent for a minute or two, and then resumed his discourse. "'Martin, seest thou aught changed in me of late?' "'Surely,' said Martin, "'I have always known you hasty, wild, and inconsiderate, rude, and prompt to speak at the volley, and without reflection. But now methinks your bearing, without losing its natural fire, has something in it of force and dignity, which it had not before. It seems as if you had fallen asleep a carl, and awakened a gentleman. "'Thou canst judge, then, of noble bearing?' said Halbert. "'Surely,' answered Martin. "'In some sort I can, for I have travelled through court and camp and city with my master, Walter Avenel, 
although he could do nothing for me in the long run but give me room for two score of sheep on the hill. And surely, even now, while I speak with you, I feel sensible that my language is more refined than it is my wont to use, and that although I know not the reason, the rude northern dialect so familiar to my tongue has given place to a more town-bred speech. And this change in thyself and me thou canst by no means account for? said young Glendinning. Change, replied Martin. By Our Lady, it is not so much a change which I feel as a recalling and renewing sentiments and expressions which I had some thirty years since, ere Tib and I set up our humble household. It is singular that your society should have this sort of influence over me, Halbert, and that I should never have experienced it ere now. Thinkest thou, said Halbert, thou seest in me aught that can raise me from this base, low, despised state? into one where I may rank with those proud men who now despise my clownish poverty?" Martin paused an instant, and then answered, "'Doubtless you may, Halbert. As broken a ship has come to land. Heard ye never of Huey Dunn, who left this Halidome some thirty-five years gone by? A deliberately fellow was Huey, could read and write like a priest, and could wield brand and buckler with the best of the riders. I mind him. The like of him was never seen in the Halidome of St. Mary's, and so was seen of the preferment that God sent him." "'And what was that?' said Halbert, his eyes sparkling with eagerness. "'Nothing less,' answered Martin, "'than body-servant to the Archbishop of St. Andrews.' Halbert's countenance fell. "'A servant! And to a priest? Was this all that knowledge and activity could raise him to?' Martin, in his turn, looked with wistful surprise in the face of his young friend. "'And to what good fortune lead him farther?' answered he. "'The son of a kirk fewer is not the stuff that lords and knights are made of. Courage and schoolcraft cannot change churl's blood into gentle blood, I trow. I have heard, forby, that Huey Dunn left a good five hundred puns of Scots money to his only daughter, and that she married the bailey of Pittenween. At this moment, and while Halbert was embarrassed with devising a suitable answer, a deer bounded across their path. In an instant the cross-bow was at the youth's shoulder. The bolt whistled, and the deer, after giving one bound upright, dropped dead on the green sward. "'There lies the venison our dame wanted,' said Martin. "'Who would have thought of an outlying stag being so low down in the glen at this season? And it is a heart of grease, too, in full season, and three inches of fat on the brisket.' Now this is all your luck, Halbert, that follows you. Go where you like. Were you to put in for it, I would warrant you were made one of the abbot's yeoman prickers, and ride about in a purple doublet as bold as the best." "'Tush, man,' answered Halbert, I will serve the queen or no one. Take thou care to have down the venison to the tower, since they expect it. I will on to the moss. I have two or three bird bolts at my girdle, and it may be I shall find wild fowl. He hastened his pace and was soon out of sight. Martin paused for a moment and looked after him. There goes the making of a right gallant stripling, and ambition have not the spoiling of him. Serve the queen, said he. By my faith, and she hath worse servants from all that I e'er heard of him. And wherefore should he not keep a high head? They that eddle to the top of the ladder will at least get up some rounds. They that mint, footnote, mint, aim at, end footnote at a gown of gold, will always get a sleeve of it. But come, sir, addressing the stag, you shall go to Glendearg on my two legs somewhat more slowly than you were frisking it even now on your own four nimble shanks. Nay, hey, by my faith, if you be so heavy, I will content me with the best of you, and that's the haunch and the nombles. And e'en heave up the rest on the old oak tree yonder, and come back for it with one of the yods. Footnote, yods, horses more particularly horses of labor. While Martin returned to Glendearg with the venison, Halbert prosecuted his walk, breathing more easily since he was free of his companion. The domestic of a proud and lazy priest, body squire to the Archbishop of St. Andrews, he repeated to himself, and this with the privilege of allying his blood with the bailey of Pittenween, is thought a preferment worth a brave man struggling for, nay more, a preferment which, if allowed, should crown the hopes past, present, and to come of the son of a Kirk vassal. 
by heaven, but that I find in me a reluctance to practice their acts of nocturnal rapine. I would rather take the jack and lance, and join with the border riders. Something I will do. Here, degraded and dishonored, I will not live the scorn of each whiffling stranger from the south, because forsooth he wears tinkling spurs on a tawny boot. This thing, this phantom, be it what it will, I will see it once more. Since I spoke with her, and touched her hand, thoughts and feelings have dawned on me of which my former life had not even dreamed. But shall I, who feel my father's glen too narrow for my expanding spirit, brook to be bearded in it by this vain gewgaw of a courtier, and in the sight, too, of Mary Avenel? I will not stoop to it by heaven. As he thus spoke, he arrived in the sequestered glen of Corinanshian, as it verged upon the hour of noon. A few moments he remained looking upon the fountain, and doubting in his own mind with what countenance the white lady might receive him. She had not indeed expressly forbidden his again evoking her, but yet there was something like such a prohibition implied in the farewell, which recommended him to wait for another guide. Halbert Glendinning did not long, however, allow himself to pause. Hardihood was the natural characteristic of his mind, and under the expansion and modification which his feelings had lately undergone, it had been augmented rather than diminished. He drew his sword, undid the buskin from his foot, bowed three times with deliberation towards the fountain, and as often towards the tree, and repeated the same rhyme as formerly. Thrice to the holy break, thrice to the well, I bid thee awake, white maid of Avenel. Noon gleams on the lake, noon glows on the fell. Wake thee, O wake, white maid of Avenel. His eye was on the holly bush as he spoke the last line, and it was not without an involuntary shuddering that he saw the air betwixt his eye and that object become more dim and condense, as it were, into the faint appearance of a form through which, however, so thin and transparent was the first appearance of the phantom, he could discern the outline of the bush as through a veil of fine crepe. But gradually it darkened into a more substantial appearance, and the white lady stood before him with displeasure on her brow. She spoke, and her speech was still song, or, or rather measured chant, but as if now more familiar it flowed occasionally in modulated blank verse and at other times in the lyrical measure which she had used at their former meeting. This is the day when the fairy kind sits weeping alone for their hopeless lot, and the wood maiden sighs to the sighing wind, and the mermaiden weeps in her crystal grot, for this is the day that a deed was wrought in which we have neither part nor share, for the children of clay was salvation bought, but not for the forms of sea or air. And ever the mortal is most forlorn, who meeteth our race on the Friday morn. Spirit, said Halbert Glendinning, boldly, it is bootless to threaten one who holds his life at no rate. Thine anger can but slay, nor do I think thy power extendeth, or thy will stretcheth so far. The terrors which your race produce upon others are vain against me. My heart is hardened against fear, as by a sense of despair. If I am, as thy words infer, of a race more peculiarly the care of heaven than thine, it is mine to call, it must be thine to answer. I am the nobler being. As he spoke, the figure looked upon him with a fierce and ireful countenance, which, without losing the similitude of that which it usually exhibited, had a wilder and more exaggerated cast of features. The eyes seemed to contract and become more fiery and slight convulsions passed over the face, as if it was about to be transformed into something hideous. The whole appearance resembled those faces which the imagination summons up when it is disturbed by laudanum, but which do not remain under the visionary's command, and, beautiful in their first appearance, become wild and grotesque ere we can arrest them. But when Halbert had concluded his bold speech, the white lady stood before him with the same pale, fixed, and melancholy aspect which she usually bore. He had expected the agitation which she exhibited would conclude in some frightful metamorphosis. Folding her arms on her bosom, the phantom replied, Daring youth, for thee it is well here calling me in the haunted dell, that thy heart has not quailed, nor thy courage failed, and that thou couldst brook the angry look of her of Avenel. 
Did one limb shiver, or an eyelid quiver, thou wert lost for ever, though I am formed from the ether blue, and my blood's of the unfallen dew. And thou art framed of mud and dust, tis thine to speak, reply I must. I demand of thee, then, said the youth, by what charm it is that I am thus altered in mind and in wishes, that I think no longer of deer or dog, of bow or bolt, that my soul spurns the bounds of this obscure glen, that my blood boils at an insult from one by whose stirrup I would some days since have run for a whole summer's morn, contented and honoured by the notice of a single word? Why do I now seek to mate me with princes and knights and nobles? Am I the same who but yesterday as it were slumbered in contented obscurity, but who am to-day awakened to glory and ambition? Speak, tell me, if thou canst, the meaning of this change. Am I spellbound? Or have I till now been under the influence of a spell, that I feel as another being, yet am conscious of remaining the same? Speak and tell me, is it to thy influence that the change is owing?" The white lady replied, A mightier wizard far than I wields o'er the universe his power. Him owns the eagle in the sky, the turtle in the bower. Chanceful in shape, yet mightiest still, he wields the heart of a man at will from ill to good, from good to ill, in cot and castle tower. Speak not thus darkly, said the youth, colouring so deeply, that face, neck, and hands were in a sanguine glow. Make me sensible of thy purpose. The spirit answered, Ask thy heart, whose secret cell is filled with Mary Avenel. Ask thy pride, why scornful look in Mary's view it will not brook. Ask it, why thou seekest to rise among the mighty and the wise, why thou spurnest thy lowly lot, why thy pastimes are forgot, why thou wouldst in bloody strife mend thy luck or lose thy life. Ask thy heart, and it shall tell, sighing from its secret cell, tis for Mary Avenel. Tell me then, said Halbert, his cheek still deeply crimsoned, thou who hast said to me that which I dared not say to myself, by what means shall I urge my passion, by what means make it known? The white lady replied, Do not ask me. On doubts like these thou canst not task me. We only see the passing show of human passion's ebb and flow, and view the pageant's idle glance as mortals eye the northern dance, when thousand streamers flashing bright career it o'er the brow of night, and gazers mark their changeful gleams, but feel no influence from their beams. Yet thine own fate, replied Halbert, unless men greatly err, is linked with that of mortals? The phantom answered, By ties mysterious linked, our fated race holds strange connection with the sons of men. The star that rose upon the house of Avenel, when Norman Ulrich first assumed the name, that star, when culminating in its orbit, shot from its sphere a drop of diamond dew, and this bright font received it, and a spirit rose from the fountain, and her date of life hath coexistence with the house of Avenel, and with the star that rules it. Speak yet more plainly, answered young Glendinning. Of this I can understand nothing. Say what hath forged thy weirded footnote, weirded, fated, end footnote. Link of destiny with the house of Avenel. Say especially what fate now overhangs that house. The white lady replied, Look on my girdle, on this thread of gold. "'Tis fine as web of lightest gossamer. "'And, but there is a spell on it, "'would not bind, light as they are, "'the folds of my thin robe. "'But when t'was donned, "'it was a massive chain, "'such as might bind the champion of the Jews, "'even when his looks were longest. "'It hath dwindled, "'hath minished in its substance and its strength, "'as sunk the greatness of the house of Avenel. "'When this frail thread gives way, I to the elements resign the principles of life they lent me. Ask me no more of this. The stars forbid it. Then canst thou read the stars, answered the youth, and mayest tell me the fate of my passion, if thou canst not aid it? The white lady again replied, Dim burns the once bright star of Avenel, dim as the beacon when the morn is nigh, and the o'erwearied warder leaves the lighthouse. There is an influence sorrowful and fearful that dogs its downward course. Disastrous passion, fierce hate and rivalry are in the aspect that lowers upon its fortunes. 
and rivalry repeated glendinning it is then as i feared but shall that english silkworm presume to beard me in my father's house and in the presence of mary avenel give me to meet him spirit give me to do away with the vain distinction of rank on which he refuses me the combat place us on equal terms and gleam the stars with what aspect they will the sword of my father shall control their influences she answered as promptly as before complain not of me child of clay if to thy harm i yield the way we who soar thy sphere above know not aught of hate or love as will or wisdom rules thy mood my gifts to evil turn or good give me to redeem my honour said halbert glendinning give me to retort on my proud rival the insults he has thrown on me and let the rest fare as it will if i cannot revenge my wrong i shall sleep quiet and know naught of my disgrace the phantom failed not to reply when piercy shafton boasteth high let this token meet his eye the sun is westering from the dell thy wish is granted fare thee well as the white lady spoke or chanted these last words she undid from her locks a silver bodkin around which they were twisted and gave it to halbert glendinning then shaking her dishevelled hair till it fell like a veil around her the outlines of her form gradually became as diffuse as her flowing tresses her countenance grew pale as the moon in her first quarter her features became indistinguishable and she melted into the air habit inures us to wonders but the youth did not find himself alone by the fountain without experiencing though in a much less degree the revulsion of spirits which he had felt upon the phantom's former disappearance a doubt strongly pressed upon his mind whether it were safe to avail himself of the gifts of a spirit which did not even pretend to belong to the class of angels and might for aught he knew have a much worse lineage than that which she was pleased to avow i will speak of it he said to edward who is clerkly learned and will tell me what i should do and yet no edward is scrupulous and wary I will prove the effect of her gift on Sir Piercy Shafton, if he again braves me, and by the issue I will be myself a sufficient judge whether there is danger in resorting to her counsel. Home, then, home, and we shall soon learn whether that home shall longer hold me, for not again will I brook insult with my father's sword by my side, and marry for the spectator of my disgrace. End of chapter 17 Chapter eighteen of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eighteen I give thee eighteen pence a day, and my bow shalt thou bear, and over all the north country I make thee the chief rider, and I thirteen pence a day, quoth the queen, by God and by my fay, come fetch thy payment when thou wilt, no man shall say thee nay. William of Cloudsley the manners of the age did not permit the inhabitants of glendearg to partake of the collation which was placed in the spence of that ancient tower before the lord abbot and his attendants and sir piercie shafton dame glendinning was excluded both by inferiority of rank and by sex for though it was a rule often neglected the superior of st mary's was debarred from taking his meals in female society to mary avenel the latter and to edward glendinning the former incapacity attached but it pleased his lordship to require their presence in the apartment and to say sundry kind words to them upon the ready and hospitable reception which they had afforded him the smoking haunch now stood upon the table a napkin white as snow was with due reverence tucked under the chin of the abbot by the refectioner and naught was wanting to commence the repast save the presence of sir piercie shafton who at length appeared glittering like the sun in a carnation velvet doublet slashed and puffed out with cloth of silver his hat of the newest block surrounded by a hat-band of goldsmith's work while around his neck he wore a collar of gold set with rubies and topazes so rich that it vindicated his anxiety for the safety of his baggage from being founded upon his love of mere finery this gorgeous collar or chain resembling those worn by the knights of the highest orders of chivalry fell down on his breast and terminated in a medallion we waited for sir piercie shafton said the abbot hastily assuming his place in the great chair which the kitchener advanced to the table with ready hand i pray your pardon reverend father and my good lord 
replied that pink of courtesy. I did but wait to cast my riding slough, and to transmew myself into some civil form meter for this worshipful company. I cannot but praise your gallantry, sir knight, said the abbot, and your prudence also for choosing the fitting time to appear thus adorned. Certes, had that goodly chain been visible in some part of your late progress, there was risk that the lawful owner might have parted company therewith. This chain, said your reverence, answered Sir Piercy, surely it is but a toy, a trifle, a slight thing which shows but poorly with this doublet. Mary, when I wear that of the murray-coloured double-piled Genoa velvet, puffed out with cypress, the gems being relieved and set off by the darker and more grave ground of the stuff, show like stars giving a lustre through dark clouds. I nothing doubt it, said the abbot, but I pray you to sit down at the board. But Sir Piercy had now got into his element, and was not easily interrupted. I own, he continued, that slight as the toy is, it might perchance have had some captivation for Julian, Santa Maria, said he, interrupting himself. What was I about to say, and my fair and beauteous protection, or shall I rather term her my discretion, here in presence? Indiscreet hath it been in your affability, O most lovely discretion, to suffer a stray word to have broke out of the penfold of his mouth, that might overleap the fence of civility, and trespass on the manner of decorum. Mary, said the abbot, somewhat impatiently, the greatest discretion that I can see in the matter is to eat our victuals being hot. Father Eustace, say the benedicite, and cut up the haunch. The sub-prior readily obeyed the first part of the abbot's injunction, but paused upon the second. It is Friday, most reverend, he said in Latin, desirous that the hint should escape, if possible, the ears of the stranger. We are travellers, said the abbot in reply and via toribus licitum est, you know the canon, a traveller must eat what food his hard fate sets before him. I grant you all a dispensation to eat flesh this day, conditionally that you, brethren, say the confitior at curfew time, that the knight give alms to his ability, and that all and each of you fast from flesh on such day within the next month that shall seem most convenient. Wherefore, fall to, and eat your food with cheerful countenances, and you, Father Refectioner, da mixtus. While the abbot was thus stating the conditions on which his indulgence was granted, he had already half finished a slice of the noble haunch, and now washed it down with a flagon of Rhenish, modestly tempered with water. Well is it said, he observed, as he required from the Refectioner another slice, that virtue is its own reward. For though this is but humble fare, and hastily prepared, and eaten in a poor chamber, I do not remember me of having had such an appetite since I was a simple brother in the Abbey of Dundrennan, and was wont to labour in the garden from morning until noons, when our abbot struck the cymbalum. Then would I enter keen with hunger, parched with thirst, da mihi vinum queso et mirum sit, and partake with appetite of whatever was set before us, according to our rule feast or fast day. Caritas or penitentia was the same to me. I had no stomach complaints then, which now craved both the aid of wine and choice cookery, to render my food acceptable to my palate and easy of digestion. It may be, holy father, said the sub-prior, an occasional ride to the extremity of St. Mary's patrimony may have the same happy effect on your health as the air of the garden at Dundrennan. Perchance with our patroness's blessings such progresses may advantage us, said the abbot, having an especial eye that our venison is carefully killed by some woodsman that is master of his craft. If the lord abbot will permit me, said the kitchener, I think the best way to assure his lordship on that important point would be to retain as a yeoman pricker, or deputy ranger, the eldest son of this good woman, Dame Glendinning, who is here to wait upon us. I should know by mine office what belongs to killing of game, and I can safely pronounce that never saw I, or any other, coquinarius, a bolt so justly shot. It has cloven the very heart of the buck. "'What speak you to us of one good shot, father?' said Sir Piercy. "'I would advise you that such no more maketh a shooter than doth one swallow make a summer. I have seen this springald of whom you speak.' and if his hand can send forth his shafts as boldly as his tongue doth utter presumptuous speeches, I will own him as good an archer as Robin Hood. Mary, said the abbot, and it is fitting we know the truth of this matter from the dame herself, 
for ill-advised were we to give way to any rashness in this matter, whereby the bounties which heaven and our patroness provide might be unskilfully mangled, and rendered unfit for worthy men's use. Stand forth, therefore, Dame Glendinning, and tell to us, as thy liege lord and spiritual superior, using plainness and truth, without either fear or favour, as being a matter wherein we are deeply interested, doth this son of thine use his bow as well as the father Kitchener avers to us. So please your noble fatherhood, answered Dame Glendinning, with a deep curtsey, I should know somewhat of archery to my cost, seeing my husband, God assoilsy him, was slain in the field of Pinky with an arrow-shot, while he was fighting under Kirk's banner, as became a liege vassal of the Halidome. He was a valiant man, please your reverence, and an honest, and shifted for his living at a time, as border men will sometimes do. I wot not sin that he did. And yet, though I have paid for mass after mass to the matter of a forty shilling, besides a quarter of wheat and four furlocks of rye, I can have no assurance yet that he has been delivered from purgatory. Dame, said the Lord Abbot, this shall be looked into heedfully, and since thy husband fell, as thou sayest, in the Kirk's quarrel, and under her banner, rely upon it that we will have him out of purgatory forthwith, that is, always provided he be there. But it is not of thy husband whom we now devise to speak, but of thy son, not of a shot Scotsman, but of a shot deer. Wherefore, I say, answer me to the point, is thy son a practised archer, aye or no? Alack, my reverend lord, replied the widow, and my croft would be better tilled if I could answer your reverence that he is not. Practised archer, merry holy sir, I would he would practise something else, crossbow and longbow, handgun and hackbutt, falconet and saker, he can shoot with them all, and if it would please this right honourable gentleman, our guest, to hold out his hat at the distance of a hundred yards, our halbert shall send shaft, bolt, or bullet through it, so that right honourable gentleman swerve not, but hold out steady, and I will forfeit a quarter of barley if he touch but a knot of his ribbons. I have seen our old Martin do as much, and so is our right reverend the sub-prior, if he be pleased to remember it. I am not like to forget it, dame, said Father Eustace, for I knew not which most to admire, the composure of the young marksman, or the steadiness of the old mark. Yet I presume not to advise Sir Piercy Shafton to subject his valuable beaver, and yet more valuable person, to such a risk, unless it should be his own special pleasure. Be assured it is not, said Sir Piercy Shafton, somewhat hastily. Be well assured, Holy Father, that it is not. I dispute not the lad's qualities, for which your reverence vouches. But bows are but wood, strings are but flax, or the silkworm excrement at best. Archers are but men, fingers may slip, eyes may dazzle, the blindest may hit the butt, the best marker may shoot a bow's length beside, therefore will we try no perilous experiments. Be that as you will, Sir Percy, said the abbot. Meantime, we will name this youth bow-bearer in the forest granted to us by good King David, that the chase might recreate our wearied spirits, the flesh of the deer improve our poor commons, and the hides cover the books of our library, thus tending at once to the sustenance of body and soul. "'Kneel down, woman, kneel down,' said the refectioner and the kitchener, with one voice to Dame Glendinning, and kiss his lordship's hand, for the grace which he has granted to thy son. They then, as if they had been chanting the service and the responses, set off in a sort of duetto, enumerating the advantages of the situation. A green gown and a pair of leathern galligaskins every Pentecost, said the kitchener. Four marks by the year at Candlemas, answered the refectioner. A hogshead of ale at Martelmas, of the double strike, and single ale at pleasure, as he shall agree with the cellarer. Who is a reasonable man, said the abbot, and will encourage an active servant of the convent. A mess of broth and a dole of mutton or beef at the kitchener's, on each high holiday, resumed the kitchener. The gang of two cows and a palfrey on Our Lady's meadow," answered his brother officer. "'An ox-hide to make buskins of yearly because of the brambles,' echoed the kitchener. "'And various other perquisites. Quae nunc prescibere longum,' said the abbot, summing with his own lordly voice the advantages attached to the office of conventional bow-bearer. Dame Glendinning was all this while on her knees, her head mechanically turning from the one church officer to the other 
which, as they stood one on each side of her, had much the appearance of a figure moved by clockwork, and so soon as they were silent, most devotedly did she kiss the munificent hand of the abbot. Conscious, however, of Halbert's intractability in some points, she could not help qualifying her grateful and reiterated thanks for the abbot's bountiful proffer, with a hope that Halbert would see his wisdom, and accept of it. How, said the abbot, bending his brows, accept of it? Woman, is thy son in his right wits? Elspeth, stunned by the tone in which this question was asked, was altogether unable to reply to it. Indeed, any answer she might have made could hardly have been heard, as it pleased the two office-bearers of the abbot's table again to recommence their alternate dialogue. Refuse, said the kitchener. Refuse, answered the refectioner, echoing the other's word in a tone of still louder astonishment. Refuse four marks by the year, said the one. Ale and beer, broth and mutton, cow's grass and palfreys, shouted the kitchener. "'Gown and galagaskins,' responded the refectioner. "'A moment's patience, my brethren,' answered the sub-prior, "'and let us not be thus astonished before cause is afforded of our amazement. This good dame best knoweth the temper and spirit of her son. This much I can say, that it lieth not towards letters or learning, of which I have in vain endeavoured to instil into him some tincture. Nevertheless, he is a youth of no common spirit, but much like those, in my weak judgment, whom God raises up among a people when he meaneth that their deliverance shall be wrought out with strength of hand and valour of heart. Such men we have seen marked with a waywardness, and even an obstinacy of character, which hath appeared intractability and stupidity to those among whom they walked and were conversant, until the very opportunity hath arrived in which it was the will of Providence that they should be the fitting instrument of great things. "'Now in good time hast thou spoken, Father Eustace,' said the abbot, "'and we will see this swanky before we decide upon the means of employing him. How say you, Sir Piercy Shafton, is it not the court fashion to suit the man to the office, and not the office to the man?' "'So please your reverence and lordship,' answered the Northumbrian knight, I do partly, that is, in some sort, subscribe to what your wisdom hath delivered. Nevertheless, under reverence of the sub-prior, we do not look for gallant leaders and national deliverers in the hovels of the mean common people. Credit me, that if there be some flashes of martial spirit about this young person, which I am not called upon to dispute, though I have seldom seen that presumption and arrogance were made good upon the upshot by deed and action yet still these will prove insufficient to distinguish him, save in his own limited and lowly sphere, even as the glow-worm, which makes a goodly show among the grass of the field, would be of little avail if deposited in a beacon-grate. Now in good time, said the sub-prior, and here comes the young huntsman to speak for himself, for, being placed opposite to the window, he could observe Halbert as he ascended the little mound on which the tower was situated. "'Summon him to our presence,' said the Lord Abbot, and with an obedient start the two attendant monks went off with emulous alertness. Dame Glendinning sprung away at the same moment, partly to gain an instant to recommend obedience to her son, partly to prevail with him to change his apparel before coming in presence of the Abbot. But the Kitchener and Refectioner, both speaking at once, had already seized each an arm, and were leading Halbert in triumph into the apartment, so that she could only ejaculate, his will be done, but an he had but had on him his Sunday's hose. Limited and humble as this desire was, the fates did not grant it, for Halbert Glendinning was hurried into the presence of the Lord Abbot, and his party, without a word of explanation, and without a moment's time being allowed to assume his holiday hose, which in the language of the time implied both breeches and stockings. Yet, Though thus suddenly presented amid the centre of all eyes, there was something in Halbert's appearance which commanded a certain degree of respect from the company into which he was so unceremoniously intruded, and the greater part of whom were disposed to consider him with hauteur, if not with absolute contempt. But his appearance and reception we must devote to another chapter. End of chapter 18 Chapter Nineteen, Part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen, Part A. 
Now choose thee, gallant, betwixt wealth and honour. There lies the pelf, in some to bear thee through the dance of youth and the turmoil of manhood. Yet leave enough for age's chimney-corner, but an thou grasp to it, farewell ambition, farewell each hope of bettering thy condition, and raising thy low rank above the churls that till the earth for bread. Old Play it is necessary to dwell for some brief space on the appearance and demeanour of young Glendinning, ere we proceed to describe his interview with the abbot of St. Mary's, at this momentous crisis of his life. Halbert was now about nineteen years old, tall and active rather than strong, yet of that hardy conformation of limb and sinew which promises great strength when the growth shall be complete, and the system confirmed. He was perfectly well made and like most men who have that advantage, possessed a grace and natural ease of manner and carriage, which prevented his height from being the distinguished part of his external appearance. It was not until you had compared his stature with that of those amongst or near to whom he stood, that you became sensible that the young Glendinning was upwards of six feet high. In the combination of unusual height with perfect symmetry, ease, and grace of carriage, the young heir of Glendirg, notwithstanding his rustic birth and education, had greatly the advantage even of Sir Piercy Shafton himself, whose stature was lower, and his limbs, though there was no particular point to object to, were on the whole less exactly proportioned. On the other hand, Sir Piercy's very handsome countenance afforded him as decided an advantage over the Scotsman as regularity of features and brilliance of complexion could give over traits which were rather strongly marked than beautiful and upon whose complexion the skyey influences to which he was constantly exposed had blended the red and white into the purely nut-brown hue which coloured alike cheeks neck and forehead and blushed only in a darker glow upon the former halbert's eyes supplied a marked and distinguished part of his physiognomy they were large and of a hazel colour and sparkled in moments of animation with such uncommon brilliancy that it seemed as if they actually emitted light Nature had closely curled the locks of dark brown hair, which relieved and set off the features, such as we have described them, displaying a bold and animated disposition, much more than might have been expected from his situation, or from his previous manners, which hitherto had seemed bashful, homely, and awkward. Halbert's dress was certainly not of that description which sets off to the best advantage a presence of itself prepossessing. His jerkin and hose were of coarse rustic cloth, and his cap of the same. A belt round his waist served at once to sustain the broadsword which we have already mentioned, and to hold five or six arrows and bird-bolts, which were stuck into it on the right side, along with a large knife hilted with buckhorn, or as it was then called, a dudgeon-dagger. To complete his dress, we must notice his loose buskins of deer's hide, formed so as to draw up on the leg as high as the knee, or at pleasure to be thrust down lower than the calves. These were generally used at the period by such as either had their principal occupation, or their chief pleasure, in sylvan sports, as they served to protect the legs against the rough and tangled thickets into which the pursuit of game frequently led them. And these trifling particulars complete his external appearance. It is not easy to do justice to the manner in which young Glendinning's soul spoke through his eyes when ushered so suddenly into the company of those whom his earliest education had taught him to treat with awe and reverence. The degree of embarrassment which his demeanour evinced had nothing in it either meanly servile or utterly disconcerted. It was no more than became a generous and ingenuous youth of a bold spirit, but totally inexperienced, who should for the first time be called upon to think and act for himself in such society, and under such disadvantageous circumstances. There was not in his carriage a grain either of forwardness or of timidity, which a friend could have wished away. He kneeled and kissed the abbot's hand, then rose and, retiring two paces, bowed respectfully to the circle around, smiling gently as he received an encouraging nod from the sub-prior, to whom alone he was personally known, and blushing as he encountered the anxious look of Mary Avenel, who beheld with painful interest the sort of ordeal to which her foster-brother was about to be subjected. 
Recovering from the transient flurry of spirits into which the encounter of her glance had thrown him, he stood composedly awaiting till the abbot should express his pleasure. The ingenuous expression of countenance, noble form, and graceful attitude of the young man failed not to prepossess in his favour the churchmen in whose presence he stood. The abbot looked round, and exchanged a gracious and approving glance with his counsellor Father Eustace although probably the appointment of a ranger or bow-bearer was one in which he might have been disposed to proceed without the sub-prior's advice were it but to show his own free agency but the good mien of the young man now in nomination was such that he rather hastened to exchange congratulation on meeting with so proper a subject of promotion than to indulge any other feeling father eustace enjoyed the pleasure which a well-constituted mind derives from seeing a benefit light on a deserving object for as he had not seen halbert since circumstances had made so material a change in his manner and feelings he scarce doubted that the proffered appointment would notwithstanding his mother's uncertainty suit the disposition of a youth who had appeared devoted to woodland sports and a foe alike to sedentary or settled occupation of any kind the refectioner and kitchener were so well pleased with halbert's prepossessing appearance that they seemed to think that the salary emoluments and perquisites the dole the grazing the gown and the galligaskins could scarce be better bestowed than on the active and graceful figure before them sir piercie shafton whether from being more deeply engaged in his own cogitations or that the subject was unworthy of his notice did not seem to partake of the general feeling of approbation excited by the young man's presence he sate with his eyes half shut and his arms folded appearing to be wrapped in contemplations of a nature deeper than those arising out of the scene before him but notwithstanding his seeming abstraction and absence of mind there was a flutter of vanity in sir piercie's very handsome countenance an occasional change of posture from one striking attitude or what he conceived to be such to another and an occasional stolen glance at the female part of the company to spy how far he succeeded in riveting their attention which gave a marked advantage in comparison to the less regular and more harsh features of halbert glendinning with their composed manly and deliberate expression of mental fortitude of the females belonging to the family of glendirg the miller's daughter alone had her mind sufficiently at leisure to admire from time to time the graceful attitudes of sir piercie shafton for both Mary Avenel and Dame Glendinning were waiting in anxiety and apprehension the answer which Halbert was to return to the abbot's proposal, and fearfully anticipating the consequences of his probable refusal. The conduct of his brother Edward, for a lad constitutionally shy, respectful, and even timid, was at once affectionate and noble. This younger son of Dame Elspeth had stood unnoticed in a corner after the abbot at the request of the sub-prior had honoured him with some passing notice and asked him a few commonplace questions about his progress in donatus and in the promptuarium parvalorum without waiting for the answers from his corner he now glided round to his brother's side and keeping a little behind him slid his right hand into the huntsman's left and by a gentle pressure which halbert instantly and ardently returned expressed at once his interest in his situation and his resolution to share his fate. The group was thus arranged, when, after the pause of two or three minutes, which he employed in slowly sipping his cup of wine, in order that he might enter on his proposal with due and deliberate dignity, the abbot at length expressed himself thus. My son, we, your lawful superior, and the abbot, under God's favour of the community of St. Mary's, have heard of your manifold good gifts, <clears throat> especially touching woodcraft, and the huntsman-like fashion in which you strike your game, truly and as a yeoman should, not abusing heaven's good benefits by spoiling the flesh, as is too often seen in careless rangers. <clears throat> he made here a pause, but observing that Glendinning only replied to his compliment by a bow, he proceeded, My son, we commend your modesty. Nevertheless, we will that thou shouldst speak freely to us touching that which we have premeditated for thine advancement, meaning to confer on thee the office of bow-bearer and ranger, 
as well over the chases and forests wherein our house hath privilege by the gifts of pious kings and nobles whose souls now enjoy the fruits of their bounties to the church as to those which belong to us in exclusive right of property and perpetuity thy knee my son that we may with our own hand and without loss of time induct thee into office kneel down said the kitchener on the one side and kneel down said the refectioner on the other but halbert glendinning remained standing were it to show gratitude and good will for your reverend lordship's noble offer i could not he said kneel low enough or remain long enough kneeling but i may not kneel to take investure of your noble gift my lord abbot being a man determined to seek my fortune otherwise how is that sir said the abbot knitting his brows do i hear you speak aright and do you a born vassal of the halidome at the moment when i am destining to you such a noble expression of my good will propose exchanging my service for that of any other my lord said halbert glendinning it grieves me to think you hold me capable of undervaluing your gracious offer or of exchanging your service for another but your noble proffer doth but hasten the execution of a determination which i have long since formed ay my son said the abbot is it indeed so right early have you learnt to form resolutions without consulting those on whom you naturally depend but what may it be this sagacious resolution if i may so far pray you to yield up to my brother and mother answered halbert mine interest in the fief of glendearg lately possessed by my father simon glendinning and having prayed your lordship to be the same kind and generous master to them that your predecessors the venerable abbots of st mary's have been to my fathers in times past for myself i am determined to seek my fortune where i may best find it dame glendinning here ventured emboldened by maternal anxiety to break silence with an exclamation of oh my son edward clinging to his brother's side half spoke half whispered a similar ejaculation of brother brother the sub-prior took up the matter in a tone of grave reprehension which as he conceived the interest he had always taken in the family at glendearg required at his hand wilful young man he said what folly can urge thee to push back the hand that is stretched out to aid thee what visionary aim hast thou before thee that can compensate for the decent and sufficient independence which thou art now rejecting with scorn four marks by the year duly and truly said the kitchener cow's grass doublet and galligaskins responded the refectioner peace my brethren said the sub-prior and may it please your lordship venerable father upon my petition to allow this headstrong youth a day for consideration and it shall be my part so to indoctrinate him as to convince him what is due on this occasion to your lordship and to his family and to himself your kindness reverend father said the youth craves my dearest thanks it is the continuance of a long train of benevolence towards me for which i give you my gratitude for i have nothing else to offer it is my mishap not your fault that your intentions have been frustrated but my present resolution is fixed and unalterable i cannot accept the generous offer of the lord abbot my fate calls me elsewhere to scenes where i shall end it or mend it end of chapter 19 part a chapter 19 part b of the monastery by walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 part b by our lady said the abbot i think the youth be mad indeed or that you sir piercy judged of him most truly when you prophesied that he would prove unfit for the promotion we designed him it may be you knew something of this wayward humour before by the mass not i answered sir piercy shafton with his usual indifference but i judged of him by his birth and breeding for seldom doth a good hawk come out of a kite's egg thou art thyself a kite and kestrel to boot replied halbert glendinning without a moment's hesitation this in our presence and to a man of worship said the abbot the blood rushing to his face yes my lord answered the youth even in your presence i return to this gay man's face the causeless dishonour which he has flung on my name 
My brave father, who fell in the cause of his country, demands that justice at the hands of his son. Unmannered boy, said the abbot. Nay, my good lord, said the knight, praying pardon for the coarse interruption, let me entreat you not to be wroth with this rustical. Credit me, the north wind shall as soon puff one of your rocks from its bases, as aught which I hold so slight and inconsiderate as the churlish speech of an untaught churl shall move the spleen of Piercy Shafton. Proud as you are, Sir Knight, said Halbert, in your imagined superiority, be not too confident that you cannot be moved. Faith, by nothing that thou canst urge, said Sir Piercy. Knowest thou then this token? said young Glendinning, offering to him the silver bodkin he had received from the white lady. Never was such an instant change, from the most contemptuous serenity to the most furious state of passion, as that which Sir Piercy Shafton exhibited. It was the difference between a cannon lying quiet in its embrasure, and the same gun when touched by the linstock. He started up, every limb quivering with rage, and his features so inflamed and agitated by passion that he more resembled a demoniac than a man under the regulation of reason. He clenched both his fists, and thrusting them forward offered them furiously at the face of Glendinning, who was even himself startled at the frantic state of excitation which his action had occasioned. The next moment he withdrew them, struck his open palm against his own forehead, and rushed out of the room in a state of indescribable agitation. The whole matter had been so sudden that no person present had time to interfere. When Sir Piercy Shafton had left the apartment there was a moment's pause of astonishment, and then a general demand that Halbert Glendinning should instantly explain by what means he had produced such a violent change in the deportment of the English cavalier. I did not to him, answered Albert Glendinning, but what you all saw. Am I to answer for his fantastic freaks of humour? Boy, said the abbot in his most authoritative manner, these subterfuges shall not avail thee. This is not a man to be driven from his temperament without some sufficient cause. That cause was given by thee, and must have been known to thee. I command thee, as thou wilt save thyself from worst measure, to explain to me by what means thou hast moved our friend thus. We choose not that our vassals shall drive our guests mad in our very presence, and we remain ignorant of the means whereby that purpose is effected. So may it please your reverence. I did but show him this token, said Halbert Glendinning, delivering it at the same time to the abbot, who looked at it with much attention, and then, shaking his head, gravely delivered it to the sub-prior without speaking a word. Father Eustace looked at the mysterious token with some attention and then addressing Halbert in a stern and severe voice, said, Young man, if thou wouldst not have us suspect thee of some strange double-dealing in this matter, let us instantly know whence thou hadst this token, and how it possesses an influence on Sir Piercy Shafton. It would have been extremely difficult for Halbert, thus hard-pressed, to have either evaded or answered so puzzling a question. To have avowed the truth might in those times have occasioned his being burnt at a stake, although in ours his confession would have only gained for him the credit of a liar beyond all rational credibility. He was fortunately relieved by the return of Sir Piercy Shafton himself, whose ear caught as he entered the sound of the sub-prior's question. Without waiting until Halbert Glendinning replied, he came forward, whispering to him as he passed, "'Be secret!' thou shalt have the satisfaction thou hast dared to seek for." When he returned to his place there were still marks of discomposure on his brow, but becoming apparently collected and calm, he looked around him and apologized for the indecorum of which he had been guilty, which he ascribed to sudden and severe indisposition. All were silent, and looked at each other with some surprise. The Lord Abbot gave orders for all to retire from the apartment save himself, Sir Piercy Shafton, and the sub-prior. And have an eye, he added, on that bold youth, that he escape not, for if he hath practised by charm or otherwise on the health of our worshipful guest, I swear by the alb and mitre which I wear that his punishment shall be most exemplary. My lord and venerable father, said Halbert, bowing respectfully, fear not but that I will abide my doom. I think you will best learn from the worshipful knight himself what is the cause of his distemperature, and how slight my share in it has been. 
"'Be assured,' said the knight, without looking up, however, while he spoke, "'I will satisfy the Lord Abbot.' With these words the company retired, and with them young Glendinning. When the abbot, the sub-prior, and the English knight were left alone, Father Eustace, contrary to his custom, could not help speaking the first. "'Expound unto us, noble sir,' he said, "'by what mysterious means the production of this simple toy could so far move your spirit and overcome your patience, after you had shown yourself proof to all the provocation offered by this self-sufficient and singular youth?' The knight took the silver bodkin from the good father's hand, looked at it with great composure, and having examined it all over, returned it to the sub-prior, saying at the same time, "'In truth, venerable father, I cannot but marvel that the wisdom implied alike in your silver hairs and your eminent rank should, like a babbling hound, excuse the similitude, open thus loudly on a false scent. I were indeed more slight to be moved than the leaves of the aspen tree which wag at the least breath of heaven, could I be touched by such a trifle as this, which in no way concerns me more than if the same quantity of silver were stricken into so many groats. Truth is, that from my youth upward I have been subjected to such a malady as you saw me visited with even now, a cruel and searching pain, which goeth through nerve and bone, even as a good brand in the hands of a brave soldier shears through limb and sinew but it passes away speedily, as you yourselves may judge. "'Still,' said the sub-prior, "'this will not account for the youth offering to you this piece of silver as a token by which you were to understand something, and, as we must needs conjecture, something disagreeable.' "'Your reverence is to conjecture what you will,' said Sir Piercy, "'but I cannot pretend to lay your judgment on the right scent when I see it at fault. I hope I am not liable to be called upon to account for the foolish actions of a malapert boy. Assuredly, said the sub-prior, we shall prosecute no inquiry which is disagreeable to our guest. Nevertheless, said he, looking to his superior, this chance may, in some sort, alter the plan your lordship had formed for your worshipful guest's residence for a brief term in this tower, as a place alike of secrecy and security, both of which, in the terms which we now stand on with England, are circumstances to be desired. "'In truth,' said the abbot, "'and the doubt is well thought on, were it as well removed. "'For I scarce know in the Halidome so fitting a place of refuge. "'Yet see I not how to recommend it to our worshipful guest, "'considering the unrestrained petulance of this headstrong youth.' "'Tush, reverend sirs, what would you make of me?' said Sir Piercy Shafton. "'I protest by mine honour I would abide in this house were I to choose. "'What?' I take no exceptions at the youth for showing a flash of spirit, though the spark may light on mine own head. I honour the lad for it. I protest I will abide here, and he shall aid me in striking down a deer. I must needs be friends with him, and he be such a shot. And we will speedily send down to my lord abbot a buck of the first head, killed so artificially as shall satisfy even the reverend Kitchener. This was said with such apparent ease and good humour, that the abbot made no farther observation on what had passed, but proceeded to acquaint his guest with the details of furniture, hangings, provisions, and so forth, which he proposed to send up to the tower of Glendearg for his accommodation. This discourse, seasoned with a cup or two of wine, served to prolong the time until the reverend abbot ordered his cavalcade to prepare for their return to the monastery. As we have, he said, in the course of this our toilsome journey, lost our meridian, footnote, the hour of repose at noon, which in the Middle Ages was employed in slumber, and which the monastic rules of nocturnal vigils rendered necessary. End footnote. Indulgence shall be given to those of our attendants who shall, from very weariness, be unable to attend the duty at prime, footnote. Prime was the midnight service of the monks. End footnote. And this by way of misericord or indulgentia. Footnote. Misericord. According to the learned work of Fosbrook on British monachism, meant not only an indulgence or exoneration from particular duties, but also a particular apartment in a convent, where the monks assembled to enjoy such indulgences or allowances as were granted beyond the rule. End footnote. Having benevolently intimated a boon to his faithful followers, which he probably judged would be far from unacceptable, the good abbot, seeing all ready for his journey, 
bestowed his blessing on the assembled household, gave his hand to be kissed by Dame Glendinning, himself kissed the cheek of Mary Avenel and even of the miller's maiden, when they approached to render him the same homage, commanded Halbert to rule his temper, and to be aiding and obedient in all things to the English knight, admonished Edward to be disipulus impiger atque strenuous, then took a courteous farewell of Sir Piercy Shafton, advising him to lie close, for fear of the English borderers, who might be employed to kidnap him, and having discharged these various offices of courtesy, moved forth to the courtyard, followed by the whole establishment. Here, with a heavy sigh approaching to a groan, the venerable father heaved himself upon his palfrey, whose dark purple housings swept the ground, and, greatly comforted that the discretion of the animal's pace would be no longer disturbed by the gambados of Sir Piercy and his prancing war-horse, he set forth at a sober and steady trot upon his return to the monastery. When the sub-prior had mounted to accompany his principal, his eye sought out Halbert, who, partly hidden by a projection of the outward wall of the court, stood apart from, and gazing upon the departing cavalcade, and the group which assembled around them. Unsatisfied with the explanation he had received concerning the mysterious transaction of the silver bodkin, yet interesting himself in the youth, of whose character he had formed a favourable idea, the worthy monk resolved to take an early opportunity of investigating that matter. In the meanwhile he looked upon Halbert with a serious and warning aspect, and held up his finger to him as he signed farewell, then joined the rest of the churchmen, and followed his superior down the valley. End of chapter 19 Part B Chapter Twenty, Part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty, Part A. I hope you'll give me cause to think you noble, and do me right with your sword, sir, as becomes one gentleman of honour to another. All this is fair, sir. Let us make no days on it. I'll lead your way. Love's Pilgrimage. The look and sign of warning which the sub-prior gave to Halbert Glendinning as they parted went to his heart, for although he had profited much less than Edward by the good man's instructions, he had a sincere reverence for his person, and even the short time he had for deliberation tended to show him he was embarked in a perilous adventure. The nature of the provocation which he had given to Sir Piercy Shafton he could not even conjecture, but he saw that it was of a mortal quality, and he was now to abide the consequences that he might not force these consequences forward by any premature renewal of their quarrel, he resolved to walk apart for an hour, and consider on what terms he was to meet this haughty foreigner. The time seemed propitious for his doing so, without having the appearance of wilfully shunning the stranger, as all the members of the little household were dispersing either to perform such tasks as had been interrupted by the arrival of the dignitaries, or to put in order what had been deranged by their visit. Leaving the tower, therefore, and descending, unobserved, as he thought, the knoll on which it stood, Halbert gained the little piece of level ground which extended betwixt the descent of the hill and the first sweep made by the brook after washing the foot of the eminence on which the tower was situated, where a few straggling birch and oak trees served to secure him from observation. But scarcely had he reached the spot when he was surprised to feel a smart tap upon the shoulder, and, turning around, he perceived he had been closely followed by Sir Piercy Shafton, when, whether from our state of animal spirits, want of confidence in the justice of our cause, or any other motive, our own courage happens to be in a wavering condition, nothing tends so much altogether to disconcert us as a great appearance of promptitude on the part of our antagonist. Halbert Glendinning, both morally and constitutionally intrepid, was nevertheless somewhat troubled at seeing the stranger whose resentment he had provoked, appear at once before him, and with an aspect which boded hostility. But though his heart might beat somewhat thicker, he was too high-spirited to exhibit any external signs of emotion. "'What is your pleasure, Sir Piercy?' he said to the English knight, enduring without apparent discomposure all the terrors which his antagonist had summoned into his aspect. "'What is my pleasure?' answered Sir Piercy. A goodly question after the part you have acted towards me. Young man, 
I know not what infatuation has led thee to place thyself in direct and insolent opposition to one who is a guest of thy liege lord the abbot, and who, even from the courtesy due to thy mother's roof, had a right to remain there without meeting insult. Neither do I ask, or care, by what means thou hast become possessed, of the fatal secret by which thou hast dared to offer me open shame. But I must now tell thee, that the possession of it has cost thee thy life." "'Not, I trust, if my hand and sword can defend it,' replied Halbert, boldly. "'True,' said the Englishman. "'I mean not to deprive thee of thy fair chance of self-defence. I am only sorry to think that, young and country-bred as thou art, it can but little avail thee. But thou must be well aware, that in this quarrel I shall use no terms of quarter." "'Rely on it, proud man,' answered the youth, "'that I shall ask none. And although thou speakest as if I lay already at thy feet, trust me, that as I am determined never to ask thy mercy, so I am not fearful of needing it." "'Thou wilt, then,' said the knight, "'do nothing to avert the certain fate which thou hast provoked with such wantonness?' "'And how were that to be purchased?' replied Halbert Glendinning, more with the wish of obtaining some farther insight into the terms on which he stood with this stranger, than to make him the submission which he might require. "'Explain to me instantly,' said Sir Piercy, "'without equivocation or delay, by what means thou wert enabled to wound my honour so deeply? And shouldst thou point out to me by so doing an enemy more worthy of my resentment, I will permit thine own obscure insignificance to draw a veil over thine insolence.' "'This is too high a flight,' said Glendinning fiercely, "'for thine own presumption to soar without being checked. Thou hast come to my father's house, as well as I can guess, a fugitive and an exile, and thy first greeting to its inhabitants has been that of contempt and injury. By what means I have been able to retort that contempt? Let thine own conscience tell thee. Enough for me that I stand on the privilege of a free Scotchman, and will brook no insult unreturned, and no injury unrequited." "'It is well, then,' said Sir Piercy Shafton. We will dispute this matter to-morrow morning with our swords. Let the time be daybreak, and do thou assign the place. We will go forth as if to strike a deer." "'Content,' replied Halbert Glendinning. "'I will guide thee to a spot where an hundred men might fight and fall without any chance of interruption.' "'It is well,' answered Sir Piercy Shafton. "'Here then we part. Many will say that in thus indulging the right of a gentleman to the son of a clod-breaking peasant, I derogate from my sphere, even as the blessed son would derogate should he condescend to compare and match his golden beams with the twinkle of a pale, blinking, expiring, gross-fed taper. But no consideration of rank shall prevent my avenging the insult thou hast offered me. We bear a smooth face, observe me, Sir Villaggio, before the worshipful inmates of yonder cabin, and to-morrow we try conclusions with our swords." So saying, he turned away towards the tower. It may not be unworthy of notice that in the last speech only had Sir Piercy used some of those flowers of rhetoric which characterized the usual style of his conversation. Apparently a sense of wounded honour, and the deep desire of vindicating his injured feelings, had proved too strong for the fantastic affectation of his acquired habits. Indeed, such is usually the influence of energy of mind, when called forth and exerted, that Sir Piercy Shafton had never appeared in the eyes of his youthful antagonist half so much deserving of esteem and respect as in this brief dialogue, by which they exchanged mutual defiance. As he followed him slowly to the tower, he could not help thinking to himself that, had the English knight always displayed this superior tone of bearing and feeling, he would not probably have felt so earnestly disposed to take offence at his hand. Mortal offence, however, had been exchanged, and the matter was to be put to mortal arbitrament. The family met at the evening meal, when Sir Piercy Shafton extended the benignity of his countenance and the graces of his conversation far more generally over the party than he had hitherto condescended to do. The greater part of his attention was, of course, still engrossed by his divine inimitable discretion, as he chose to term Mary Avenel. But nevertheless there were interjectional flourishes to the maid of the mill under the title of comely damsel, and to the dame under that of worthy matron. Nay, lest he should fail to excite their admiration by the graces of his rhetoric, he generously and without solicitation added those of his voice, and after regretting bitterly the absence of his veal de gamba, he regaled them with a song, which, said he, the inimitable Astrophel 
whom mortals call Philip Sidney, composed in the nonage of his muse, to show the world what they are to expect from his riper years, and which will one day see the light in that not to be paralleled perfection of human wit, which he has addressed to his sister, the matchless Parthenope, whom men call Countess of Pembroke. A work, he continued, whereof his friendship hath permitted me, though unworthy, to be an occasional partaker, and whereof I may well say, that the deep afflictive tale which awakeneth our sorrows is so relieved with brilliant similitudes, dulcet descriptions, pleasant poems, and engaging interludes, that they seem as the stars of the firmament beautifying the dusky robe of night. And though I wot well how much the lovely and quaint language will suffer by my widowed voice, widowed in that it is no longer matched by my beloved Veal da Gamba, I will essay to give you a taste of the ravishing sweetness of the poesy of the unto-be imitated Astrophel. So saying, he sung without mercy or remorse about five hundred verses, of which the two first and the four last may suffice for a specimen. What tongue can her perfections tell, on whose each part all pens may dwell, of whose high praise, arid praiseful bliss, goodness the pen? Heaven paper is. The ink immortal fame doth send, as I began, so I must end. As Sir Piercy Shafton always sung with his eyes half shut, it was not until, agreeably to the promise of poetry, he had fairly made an end, that looking round he discovered that the greater part of his audience had, in the meanwhile, yielded to the charms of repose. Mary Avenel, indeed, from a natural sense of politeness, had contrived to keep awake through all the perplexities of the divine Astrophel but Mysie was transported in dreams back to the dusty atmosphere of her father's mill. Edward himself, who had given his attention for some time, had at length fallen fast asleep, and the good dame's nose, could its tones have been put in regulation, might have supplied the base of the lamented Veal de Gamba. Halbert, however, who had no temptation to give way to the charms of slumber, remained awake with his eyes fixed on the songster. Not that he was better entertained with the words, or more ravished with the execution, than the rest of the company, but rather because he admired, or perhaps envied, the composure which could thus spend the evening in interminable madrigals, when the next morning was to be devoted to deadly combat. Yet it struck his natural acuteness of observation, that the eye of the gallant cavalier did now and then, furtively as it were, seek a glance of his countenance, as if to discover how he was taking the exhibition of his antagonist's composure and serenity of mind. He shall read nothing in my countenance, thought Halbert, proudly, that can make him think my indifference less than his own. And taking from the shelf a bag full of miscellaneous matters collected for the purpose, he began with great industry to dress hooks, and had finished half a dozen of flies, we are enabled, for the benefit of those who admire the antiquities of the gentle art of angling, to state that they were brown hackles, by the time that Sir Piercy had arrived at the conclusion of his long-winded strophes of the divine Astrophel, so that he also testified a magnanimous contempt of that which to-morrow should bring forth. As it now waxed late, the family of Glendearg separated for the evening, Sir Piercy first saying to the dame that her son Albert, Halbert, said Elspeth with emphasis, Halbert, after his good sire, Halbert Brydone, well, then, I have prayed your son, Halbert, that we may strive to-morrow with the sun's earliness to wake a stag from his lair, that I may see whether he be as prompt at that sport as fame bespeaks him. Alas, sir, answered Dame Elspeth, he is but too prompt, and you talk of promptitude at anything that has steel at one end of it, and mischief at the other. But he is at your honourable disposal, and I trust you will teach him how obedience is due to our venerable father and lord the abbot and prevail with him to take the bow-bearer's place in fee, for, as the two worthy monks said, it will be a great help to a widow-woman. "'Trust me, good dame,' replied Sir Piercy, "'it is my purpose to so indoctrinate him touching his conduct and bearing towards his betters, that he shall not lightly depart from the reverence due to them. We meet, then, beneath the birch-trees in the plain,' he said, looking to Halbert, "'so soon as the eye of day hath opened its lids.' Halbert answered with a sign of acquiescence, and the knight proceeded, and now having wished to my fairest discretion those pleasant dreams which wave their pinions around the couch of sleeping beauty, and to this comely damsel the bounties of Morpheus, and to all others the common good night, I will crave you leave to depart to my place of rest, though I may say with the poet, 
Ah, rest! No rest but change of place and posture. Ah, sleep! No sleep but worn-out nature's swooning. Ah, bed! No bed but cushion filled with stones. Rest, sleep, nor bed, await not on an exile. End of chapter 20, part A Chapter 20, Part B of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20, Part B. With a delicate obeisance, he left the room, evading Dame Glendinning, who hastened to assure him he would find his accommodations for repose much more agreeable than they had been the night before, there having been store of warm coverlets and a soft feather bed sent up from the abbey but the good knight probably thought that the grace and effect of his exit would be diminished if he were recalled from his heroics to discuss such sublunary and domestic topics, and therefore hastened away without waiting to hear her out. "'A pleasant gentleman,' said Dame Glendinny, "'but I will warrant him an humorous footnote, humorous, full of whims, thus Shakespeare, humorous as winter. The vulgar word humorsome comes nearest to the meaning.' End footnote and sings a sweet song, though it is somewhat of the longest. While I make mine a vow, he is goodly company. I wonder when he will go away." Having thus expressed her respect for her guest, not without intimation that she was heartily tired of his company, the good dame gave the signal for the family to disperse, and laid her injunctions on Halbert to attend Sir Piercy Shafton at daybreak, as he required. When stretched on his pallet by his brother's side, Halbert had no small cause to envy the sound sleep which instantly settled on the eyes of Edward, but refused him any share of its influence. He saw now too well what the spirit had darkly indicated, that, in granting the boon which he had asked so unadvisedly, she had contributed more to his harm than his good. He was now sensible, too late, of the various dangers and inconveniences with which his dearest friends were threatened alike by his discomfiture or his success in the approaching duel. If he fell, he might say personally good-night all, but it was not the less certain that he should leave a dreadful legacy of distress and embarrassment to his mother and family, an anticipation which by no means tended to render the front of death, in itself a grisly object, more agreeable to his imagination. The vengeance of the abbot, his conscience told him, was sure to descend on his mother and brother or could only be averted by the generosity of the victor. And Mary Avenel, he should have shown himself, if he succumbed in the present combat, as inefficient in protecting her, as he had been unnecessarily active in bringing disaster, on her and on the house in which she had been protected from infancy. And to this view of the case were to be added all those embittered and anxious feelings, with which the bravest men, even in a better or less doubtful quarrel, regard the issue of a dubious conflict the first time when it has been their fate to engage in an affair of that nature. But however disconsolate the prospect seemed in the event of his being conquered, Halbert could expect from victory little more than the safety of his own life, and the gratification of his wounded pride. To his friends, to his mother and brother, especially to Mary Avenel, the consequences of his triumph would be more certain destruction than the contingency of his defeat and death. If the English knight survived, he might in courtesy extend his protection to them. But if he fell, nothing was likely to screen them from the vindictive measures which the abbot and convent would surely adopt against the violation of the peace of the Halidome, and the slaughter of a protected guest by one of their own vassals, within whose house they had lodged him for shelter. These thoughts, in which neither view of the case augured aught short of ruin to his family, and that ruin entirely brought on by his own rashness were thorns in Halbert Glendinning's pillow, and deprived his soul of peace and his eyes of slumber. There appeared to be no middle course, saving one which was marked by degradation, and which, even if he stooped to it, was by no means free of danger. He might indeed confess to the English knight the strange circumstances which led to his presenting him with that token which the white lady, in her displeasure as it now seemed, had given him, that he might offer it to Sir Piercy Shafton but to this avowal his pride could not stoop, and reason, who was wonderfully ready to be of counsel with pride on such occasions, offered many arguments to show it would be useless as well as mean, so far, to degrade himself. If I tell a tale so wonderful, thought he, shall I not either be stigmatized as a liar, 
or punished as a wizard? Were Sir Piercy Shafton generous, noble, and benevolent, as the champions of whom we hear in romance, I might indeed gain his ear, and without demeaning myself escape from the situation in which I am placed, but as he is, or at least seems to be, self-conceited, arrogant, vain, and presumptuous, I should but humble myself in vain, and I will not humble myself," he said, starting out of bed, grasping his broad sword and brandishing it in the light of the moon, which streamed through the deep niche that served them as a window. When, to his extreme surprise and terror, an airy form stood in the moonlight, but intercepted not the reflection on the floor. Dimly as it was expressed, the sound of the voice soon made him sensible he saw the white lady. At no time had her presence seemed so terrific to him. For when he had invoked her it was with the expectation of the apparition, and the determination to abide the issue. But now she had come uncalled, and her presence impressed him with a sense of approaching misfortune, and with the hideous apprehension that he had associated himself with a demon, over whose motions he had no control, and of whose powers and quality he had no certain knowledge. He remained, therefore, in mere terror, gazing on the apparition which chanted or recited in cadence the following lines. He whose heart for vengeance sued must not shrink from shedding blood the knot that thou hast tied with word thou must loose by edge of sword. Said Halbert Glendinning, I have bought thy advice too dearly already. Be gone in the name of God. The spirit laughed, and the cold unnatural sound of her laughter had something in it more fearful than the usually melancholy tones of her voice. She then replied, "'You have summoned me once, you have summoned me twice, and without e'er a summons I come to you thrice. Unasked for, unsued for, you came to my glen. Unsued and unasked, I am with you again.' Halbert Glendinning gave way for a moment to terror, and called on his brother, "'Edward! Waken! Waken! For our lady's sake!' Edward awaked accordingly, and asked what he wanted. "'Look out,' said Halbert. "'Look up! Seest thou no one in the room?' No, upon my good word, said Edward, looking out. What, seest thou nothing in the moonshine upon the floor there? No, nothing, answered Edward, save thyself resting on thy naked sword. I tell thee, Halbert, thou shouldst trust more to thy spiritual arms, and less to those of steel and iron. For this many a night hast thou started, and moaned, and cried out of fighting, and of spectres, and of goblins. Thy sleep hath not refreshed thee, thy waking hath been a dream. Credit me, dear Halbert say the pater, and the credo. Resign thyself to the protection of God, and thou wilt sleep sound and wake in comfort. It may be, said Halbert slowly, and having his eyes still bent on the female form, which to him seemed distinctly visible, it may be. But tell me, dear Edward, seest thou no one in the chamber floor but me? No one, answered Edward, raising himself on his elbow. Dear brother, lay aside thy weapon, say thy prayers, and lay thee down to rest." While he thus spoke, the spirit smiled at Halbert as if in scorn. Her wan cheek faded in the wan moonlight even before the smile had passed away, and Halbert himself no longer beheld the vision to which he had so anxiously solicited his brother's attention. "'May God preserve my wits,' he said, as laying aside his weapon he again threw himself on his bed. "'Amen, my dearest brother,' answered Edward but we must not provoke that heaven in our wantonness which we invoke in our misery. Be not angry with me, my dear brother. I know not why you have totally of late estranged yourself from me. It is true I am neither so athletic in body, nor so alert in courage, as you have been from your infancy. Yet till lately you have not absolutely cast off my society. Believe me, I have wept in secret, though I forbore to intrude myself on your privacy. The time has been, when you held me not so cheap, and when, if I could not follow the game so closely, or mark it so truly as you, I could fill up our intervals of pastime with pleasant tales of the olden times, which I had read or heard, and which excited even your attention as we sate and ate our provision by some pleasant spring. But now I have, though I know not why, lost thy regard and affection. Nay, toss not thy arms about thee thus wildly, said the younger brother. From thy strange dreams I fear some touch of fever hath affected thy blood. Let me draw closer around thee thy mantle. Forbear, said Halbert, your care is needless, your complaints are without reason, your fears on my account are in vain. Nay, but hear me, brother, said Edward, and now even your waking dreams are of beings which belong not to this world, 
or to our race. Our good father Eustace says that, howbeit we may not do well to receive all idle tales of goblins and spectres, yet there is warrant from Holy Scripture to believe that the fiends haunt waste and solitary places, and that those who frequent such wildernesses alone are the prey or the sport of these wandering demons. And therefore I pray thee, brother, let me go with you when you go next up the glen, where, as you well know, there be places of evil reputation. Thou carest not for my escort, but, Halbert, such dangers are more safely encountered by the wise in judgment than by the bold in bosom. And though I have small cause to boast of my own wisdom, yet I have that which ariseth from the written knowledge of elder times. There was a moment during this discourse, when Halbert had well nigh come to the resolution of disburdening his own breast, by entrusting Edward with all that weighed upon it. But when his brother reminded him that this was the morning of a high holiday, and that, setting aside all other business or pleasure, he ought to go to the monastery and shrive himself before Father Eustace, who would that day occupy the confessional, pride stepped in and confirmed his wavering resolution. I will not avow, he thought, a tale so extraordinary, that I may be considered as an impostor or something worse. I will not fly from this Englishman, whose arm and sword may be no better than my own. My fathers have faced his betters, were he as much distinguished in battle as he is by his quaint discourse. Pride, which has been said to save man, and woman too, from falling, has yet a stronger influence on the mind when it embraces the cause of passion, and seldom fails to render it victorious over conscience and reason. Halbert, once determined, though not to the better course, at length slept soundly, and was only awakened by the dawn of day. End of chapter 20 Part B Chapter 21 of The Monastery by Walter Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 Indifferent but indifferent, pshaw, he doth it not like one who is his craft's master. Nevertheless, I have seen a clown confer a bloody coxcomb on one who was a master of defence. Old Play With the first grey peep of dawn, Halbert Glendinning arose and hastened to dress himself, girded on his weapon, and took a crossbow in his hand, as if his usual sport had been his sole object. He groped his way down the dark and winding staircase, and undid, with as little noise as possible, the fastenings of the inner door and of the exterior iron grate. At length he stood free in the courtyard, and looking up to the tower saw a signal made with a handkerchief from the window. Nothing doubting that it was his antagonist, he paused, expecting him. But it was Mary Avenel, who glided like a spirit from under the low and rugged portal. Halbert was much surprised, and felt he knew not why, like one caught in the act of a meditated trespass. The presence of Mary Avenel had till that moment never given him pain. She spoke, too, in a tone where sorrow seemed to mingle with reproach, while she asked him with emphasis what he was about to do. He showed his crossbow, and was about to express the pretext he had meditated, when Mary interrupted him. Not so, Halbert. That evasion were unworthy of one whose word has hitherto been truth. You meditate not the destruction of the deer. Your hand and your heart are aimed at other game. You seek to do battle with this stranger. "'And wherefore should I quarrel with our guest?' answered Halbert, blushing deeply. "'There are indeed many reasons why you should not,' replied the maiden, "'nor is there one of avail wherefore you should. Yet, nevertheless, such a quarrel you are now searching after.' "'Why should you suppose so, Mary?' said Halbert, endeavouring to hide his conscious purpose. "'He is my mother's guest. He is protected by the abbot and the community who are our masters. He is of high degree also, and wherefore should you think that I can or dare resent a hasty word which he has perchance thrown out against me more from the wantonness of his wit than the purpose of his heart?" "'Alas!' answered the maiden, "'the very asking that question puts your resolution beyond a doubt. Since your childhood you were ever daring, seeking danger rather than avoiding it, delighting in whatever had the air of adventure and of courage and it is not from fear that you will now blench from your purpose. Oh, let it be from pity, from pity, Halbert, to your aged mother, whom your death or victory will alike deprive of the comfort and stay of her age. 
"'She has my brother, Edward,' said Halbert, turning suddenly from her. "'She has indeed,' said Mary Avenel, "'the calm, the noble-minded, the considerate Edward, who has thy courage, Halbert, without thy fiery rashness, thy generous spirit with more of reason to guide it. He would not have heard his mother, would not have heard his adopted sister beseech him in vain not to ruin himself and tear up their future hopes of happiness and protection. Halbert's heart swelled as he replied to this reproach. Well, what avails it speaking? You have him that is better than me, wiser, more considerate, braver for aught I know. You are provided with a protector, and need care no more for me. Again he turned to depart, but Mary Avenel laid her hand on his arm so gently that he scarce felt her hold, yet felt that it was impossible for him to strike it off. There he stood, one foot advanced to leave the courtyard, but so little determined on departure that he resembled a traveller arrested by the spell of a magician, and unable either to quit the attitude of motion or to proceed on his course. Mary Avenel availed herself of his state of suspense. "'Hear me,' she said, "'hear me, Halbert. I am an orphan, and even heaven hears the orphan. I have been the companion of your infancy, and, if you will not hear me for an instant, from whom may Mary Avenel claim so poor a boon?' "'I hear you,' said Halbert Glendinning, "'but be brief, dear Mary. You mistake the nature of my business. It is but a morning of summer sport which we propose.' "'Say not thus,' said the maiden, interrupting him, "'say not thus to me. Others thou mayest deceive, but me thou canst not. There has been in me from the earliest youth which fraud flies from, and which imposture cannot deceive. For what fate has given me such a power I know not. But bred an ignorant maiden, in this sequestered valley, mine eyes can too often see what man would most willingly hide. I can judge of the dark purpose, though it is hid under the smiling brow, and a glance of the eye says more to me than oaths and protestations do to others. Then, said Halbert, if thou canst so read the human heart, say, dear Mary, what dost thou see in mine? Tell me that. Say that what thou seest, what thou readest in this bosom, does not offend thee. Say but that, and thou shalt be the guide of my actions, and mould me now and henceforward to honour or to dishonour at thy own free will. Mary Avenel became first red, and then deadly pale, as Halbert Glendinning spoke. But when turning round at the close of his address he took her hand, she gently withdrew it, and replied, I cannot read the heart, Halbert, and I would not of my will know aught of yours, save what beseems us both. I only can judge of signs, words, and actions of little outward import, more truly than those around me, as my eyes, thou knowest, have seen objects not presented to those of others. "'Let them gaze, then, on one whom they shall never see more,' said Halbert, once more turning from her, and rushing out of the courtyard, without again turning back. Mary Avenel gave a faint scream, and clasped both her hands firmly on her forehead and eyes. She had been a minute in this attitude when she was thus greeted by a voice from behind. "'Generously done, my most clement discretion, to hide those brilliant eyes from the far inferior beams, which even now begin to gild the eastern horizon. Certes, peril there were that Phoebus outshone in splendour might in very shamefacedness turn back his ear, and rather leave the world in darkness than incur the disgrace of such an encounter. Credit me, lovely discretion. But as Sir Piercy Shafton, the reader will readily set down these flowers of eloquence to the proper owner, attempted to take Mary Avenel's hand in order to proceed in his speech, she shook him abruptly off, and regarding him with an eye which evinced terror and agitation, rushed past him into the tower. The knight stood looking after her with a countenance in which contempt was strongly mingled with mortification. "'By my knighthood,' he ejaculated, "'I have thrown away upon this rude, rustic fidel a speech which the proudest beauty at the court of Felicia, so let me call the Elysium from which I am banished, might have termed the very matins of Cupid. Hard and inexorable was the fate that sent thee thither, Piercy Shafton, to waste thy wit upon country wenches and thy valour upon hobnailed clowns. But that insult, that affront, had it been offered to me by the lowest plebeian, he must have died for it by my hand, in respect the enormity of the offence both countervail the inequality of him by whom it is given. I trust I shall find this clownish roisterer not less willing to deal in blows than in taunts. While he held this conversation with himself, Sir Piercy Shafton was hastening to the little tuft of birch-trees, 
which had been assigned as the place of meeting. He greeted his antagonist with a courtly salutation, followed by this commentary. I pray you to observe that I doff my hat to you, though so much my inferior in rank, without derogation on my part, inasmuch as my having so far honoured you in receiving and admitting your defiance, doth in the judgment of the best marshalists, in some sort and for the time, raise you to a level with me, an honour which you may and ought to account cheaply purchased, even with the loss of your life, if such should chance to be the issue of this duello. For which condescension, said Halbert, I have to thank the token which I presented to you. The knight changed colour, and grinded his teeth with rage. Draw your weapon, said he to Glendinning. Not in this spot, answered the youth. We should be liable to interruption. Follow me, and I will bring you to a place where we shall encounter no such risk." He proceeded to walk up the glen, resolving that their place of combat should be in the entrance of the Corinantian, both because the spot, lying under the reputation of being haunted, was very little frequented, and also because he regarded it as a place which to him might be termed fated, and which he therefore resolved should witness his death or victory. They walked up the glen for some time in silence, like honourable enemies who did not wish to contend with words, and who had nothing friendly to exchange with each other. Silence, however, was always an irksome state with Sir Piercy, and, moreover, his anger was usually a hasty and short-lived passion. As therefore he went forth, in his own idea, in all love and honour towards his antagonist, he saw not any cause for submitting longer to the painful restraint of positive silence. He began by complimenting Halbert on the alert activity with which he surmounted the obstacles and impediments of the way. "'Trust me,' said he, worthy rustic, "'we have not a lighter or a firmer step in our court-like revels, and if duly set forth by a silk hose, and trained into that stately exercise, your leg would make an indifferent good show in a pavin or a galliard. And I doubt nothing,' he added, "'that you have availed yourself of some opportunity to improve yourself in the art of fence which is more akin than dancing to our present purpose. "'I know nothing more of fencing,' said Halbert, "'than hath been taught me by an old shepherd of ours, called Martin, and at whiles a lesson from Christie of the Clinthill. For the rest I must trust to good sword, strong arm, and sound heart.' "'Marry, and I am glad of it, young audacity. I will call you my audacity, and you will call me your condescension, while we are on these terms of unnatural equality.' I am glad of your ignorance with all my heart, for we marshalists proportion the punishments which we inflict upon our opposites to the length and hazard of the efforts wherewith they oppose themselves to us. And I see not why you, being but a tyro, may not be held sufficiently punished for your utricredence and orgulous presumption by the loss of an ear, an eye, or even a finger, accompanied by some flesh-wound of depth and severity suited to your error, whereas had you been able to stand more effectually on your defence, I see not how less than your life could have atoned sufficiently for your presumption." "'Now by God and our lady,' said Halbert, unable any longer to restrain himself, thou art thyself over-presumptuous, who speakest thus daringly of the issue of a combat which is not yet even begun. Are you a god that you already dispose of my life and limbs, or are you a judge in the justice heir? telling at your ease and without risk how the head and quarters of a condemned criminal are to be disposed of. Not so, O thou, whom I have well permitted to call thyself my audacity. I, thy condescension, am neither a god to judge the issue of the combat before it is fought, nor a judge to dispose at my ease and in safety of the limbs and head of a condemned criminal. But I am an indifferent good master of fence, being the first pupil of the first master of the first school of fence, that our royal England affords, the said master being no other than the truly noble and all unutterably skilful Vincentio Saviola, from whom I learned the firm step, quick eye, and nimble hand, of which qualities thou, O oh my most rustical audacity, art full like to reap the fruits so soon as we shall find a piece of ground fitting for such experiments. They had now reached the gorge of the ravine, where Halbert had at first intended to stop, but when he observed the narrowness of the level ground, he began to consider that it was only by superior agility that he could expect to make up his deficiency in the science, as it was called, of defence. He found no spot which afforded sufficient room to traverse for this purpose, until he gained the well-known fountain, by whose margin and in front of the huge rock from which it sprung, 
was an amphitheatre of level turf, of small space indeed, compared with the great height of the cliffs with which it was surrounded on every point save that from which the rivulet issued forth, yet large enough for their present purpose. When they had reached this spot of ground, fitted well by its gloom and sequestered situation to be a scene of mortal strife, both were surprised to observe that a grave was dug close by the foot of the rock with great neatness and regularity, the green turf being laid down upon the one side, and the earth thrown out in a heap upon the other. A mattock and shovel lay by the verge of the grave. Sir Piercy Shafton bent his eye with unusual seriousness upon Halbert Glendinning, as he asked him sternly, does this bode treason, young man? And have you purpose to set upon me here, as in an ambuscata or place of vantage? Not on my part, by heaven, answered the youth. I told no one of our purpose, nor would I for the throne of Scotland take odds against a single arm. I believe thou wouldst not, mine audacity, said the knight, resuming the affected manner which was become a second nature to him. Nevertheless, this foss is certainly well shaped and might be the masterpiece of nature's last bedmaker, I would say the sexton. Wherefore let us be thankful to chance or some unknown friend, who hath thus provided for one of us the decencies of sepulture, and let us proceed to determine which shall have the advantage of enjoying this place of undisturbed slumber. So saying, he stripped off his doublet and cloak, which he folded up with great care, and deposited upon a large stone, while Halbert Glendinning, not without some emotion followed his example. Their vicinity to the favourite haunt of the white lady led him to form conjectures concerning the incident of the grave. It must have been her work, he thought. The spirit foresaw and has provided for the fatal event of the combat. I must return from this place a homicide, or I must remain here for ever. The bridge seemed now broken down behind him, and the chance of coming off honourably without killing or being killed the hope of which issue has cheered the sinking heart of many a duellist, seemed now altogether to be removed. Yet the very desperation of his situation gave him, on an instant's reflection, both firmness and courage, and presented to him one sole alternative—conquest, namely, or death. "'As we are here,' said Sir Piercy Shafton, unaccompanied by any patrons or seconds, it were well you should pass your hands over my sides, as I shall over yours. Not that I suspect you to use any quaint device of privy armour, but in order to comply with the ancient and laudable custom practised on all such occasions." While complying with his antagonist's humour, Halbert Glendinning went through this ceremony. Sir Piercy Shafton did not fail to solicit his attention to the quality and fineness of his wrought and embroidered shirt. "'In this very shirt,' said he, "'O oh, mine audacity, I say in this very garment in which I am now to combat a Scottish rustic, like thyself, it was my envied lot to lead the winning party at that wondrous match at Ballon, made betwixt the divine Astrophel, our matchless Sidney, and the right honourable my very good lord of Oxford. All the beauties of Felicia, by which name I distinguish our beloved England, stood in the gallery, waving their kerchiefs at each turn of the game, and cheering the winners by their plaudits, after which noble sport we were refreshed by a suitable banquet whereat it pleased the noble Urania, being the unmatched Countess of Pembroke, to accommodate me with her fan for the cooling of my somewhat too much inflamed visage, to requite which courtesy I said, casting my features into a smiling yet melancholy fashion, O divinest Urania, which not like the zephyr cooleth, but like the hot breath of the Sirocco, heateth yet more that which is already inflamed. Whereupon, looking upon me somewhat scornfully, Yet not so but what the experienced courtier might perceive a certain cast of approbative affection. Here the knight was interrupted by Halbert, who had waited with courteous patience for some little time, till he found that far from drawing to a close, Sir Piercy seemed rather inclined to wax prolix in his reminiscences. "'Sir Knight,' said the youth, "'if this matter be not very much to the purpose, we will, if you object not, proceed to that which we have in hand.' You should have abidden in England had you desired to waste time in words, for here we spend it in blows." "'I crave your pardon, most rusticated audacity,' answered Sir Piercy. Truly I become oblivious of everything beside, when the recollections of the divine court of Felicia press upon my wakened memory, even as a saint is dazzled when he bethinks him of the beatific vision. Ah, Felicitas Feliciana! Delicate nurse of the fair! 
chosen abode of the wise, the birthplace and cradle of nobility, the temple of courtesy, the fane of sprightly chivalry, ah, heavenly court, or rather courtly heaven, cheered with dances, lulled asleep with harmony, wakened with sprightly sports and tourneys, decored with silks and tissues, glittering with diamonds and jewels, standing on end with double-piled velvets, satins, and satinettas. "'The token, Sir Knight, the token!' exclaimed Halbert Glendinning, who, impatient of Sir Piercy's interminable oratory, reminded him of the ground of their quarrel as the best way to compel him to the purpose of their meeting. And he judged right, for Sir Piercy Shafton no sooner heard him speak than he exclaimed, "'Thy death-hour has struck. Betake thee to thy sword. Vaya! Both swords were unsheathed, and the combatants commenced their engagement. Halbert became immediately aware that, as he had expected, he was far inferior to his adversary in the use of his weapon. Sir Piercy Shafton had taken no more than his own share of real merit, when he termed himself an absolutely good fencer, and Glendinning soon found that he should have great difficulty in escaping with life and honour from such a master of the sword. The English knight was master of all the mystery of the stoccata, imbrocata, punto reverso, incartata, and so forth, which the Italian masters of defence had lately introduced into general practice. But Glendinning on his part was no novice in the principles of the art, according to the old Scottish fashion, and possessed the first of all qualities, a steady and collected mind. At first, being desirous to try the skill and become acquainted with the play of his enemy, he stood on his defence, keeping his foot, hand, eye, and body in perfect unison, and holding his sword short, and with the point towards his antagonist's face, so that Sir Percy, in order to assail him, was obliged to make actual passes, and could not avail himself of his skill in making feints. While on the other hand Halbert was prompt to parry these attacks, either by shifting his ground or with the sword. The consequence was that, after two or three sharp attempts on the part of Sir Piercy, which were evaded or disconcerted by the address of his opponent, he began to assume the defensive in his turn, fearful of giving some advantage by being repeatedly the assailant. But Halbert was too cautious to press on a swordsman whose dexterity had already more than once placed him within a hair's breadth of death, which he had only escaped by uncommon watchfulness and agility. When each had made a feint or two, there was a pause in the conflict, both as if by one assent dropping their sword's point, and looking on each other for a moment without speaking. At length Halbert Glendinning, who felt perhaps more uneasy on account of his family than he had done before he had displayed his own courage, and proved the strength of his antagonist, could not help saying, "'Is the subject of our quarrel, Sir Knight, so mortal, that one of our two bodies must needs fill up that grave? Or may we, with honour, having proved ourselves against each other, sheathe our swords and depart friends?' "'Valiant and most rustical audacity,' said the Southron Knight. To no man on earth could you have put a question in the code of honour, who is more capable of rendering you a reason. Let us pause for the space of one venue, until I give you my opinion on this dependence. Footnote. Dependence. A phrase among the brethren of the sword for an existing quarrel. End footnote. For certain it is, that brave men should not run upon their fate like brute and furious wild beasts, but should slay each other deliberately, decently, and with reason. Therefore, if we coolly examine the state of our dependence, we may the better apprehend whether the sisters three have doomed one of us to expiate the same with his blood. Dost thou understand me?" "'I have heard Father Eustace,' said Halbert, after a moment's recollection, speak of the three furies, with their thread and their shears." "'Enough, enough,' interrupted Sir Piercy Shafton, crimsoning with a new fit of rage. "'The thread of thy life is spun and with these words he attacked with the utmost ferocity the Scottish youth, who had but just time to throw himself into a posture of defence. But the rash fury of the assailant, as frequently happens, disappointed its own purpose, for as he made a desperate thrust, Halbert Glendinning avoided it, and ere the knight could recover his weapon, requited him, to use his own language, with a resolute staccata, which passed through his body, and Sir Piercy Shafton fell to the ground. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 
Yes, life hath left him. Every busy thought, each fiery passion, every strong affection, all sense of outward ill and inward sorrow, are fled at once from the pale trunk before me. And I have given that which spoke and moved, thought, acted, suffered as a living man, to be a ghastly form of bloody clay, soon the foul food for reptiles. Old Play I believe few successful duelists, if the word successful can be applied to a superiority so fatal, have beheld their dead antagonist stretched on the earth at their feet without wishing they could redeem with their own blood that which it has been their fate to spill. Least of all could such indifference be the lot of so young a man as Halbert Glendinning, who, unused to the sight of human blood, was not only struck with sorrow, but with terror, when he beheld Sir Piercy Shafton lie stretched on the green sword before him, vomiting gore as if impelled by the strokes of a pump. He threw his bloody sword on the ground, and hastened to kneel and support him, vainly striving, at the same time, to stanch his wound, which seemed rather to bleed inwardly than externally. The unfortunate knight spoke at intervals, when the syncope would permit him, and his words, so far as intelligible, partook of his affected and conceited, yet not ungenerous, character. Most rustical youth! he said, thy fortune hath prevailed over knightly skill, and audacity hath overcome condescension, even as the kite hath sometimes hawked at and struck down the falcon gentle. Fly and save thyself, take my purse, it is in the nether pocket of my carnation-coloured hose, and is worth a clown's acceptance. See that my mails with my vestments be sent to the monastery of St. Mary's. Here his voice grew weak, and his mind and recollection seemed to waver. I bestow the cut velvet jerkin with close breeches conforming for, oh, the good of my soul. Be of good comfort, sir, said Halbert, half distracted with his agony of pity and remorse. I trust you shall yet do well. Oh, for a leech! Were there twenty physicians, O most generous audacity? and that were a grave spectacle, I might not survive. My life is ebbing fast. Commend me to the rustical nymph whom I called my discretion. O Clara Diana, true empress of this bleeding heart, which now bleedeth in sad earnest, place me on the ground at my length, most rustical victor, born to quench the pride of the burning light of the most felicitous court of Feliciana. O saints and angels, knights and ladies, masks and theatres, quaint devices, chain-work and broidery, love, honour, and beauty. While muttering these last words, which slid from him, as it were, unawares, while doubtless he was calling to mind the glories of the English court, the gallant Sir Piercy Shafton stretched out his limbs, groaned deeply, shut his eyes, and became motionless. The victor tore his hair for very sorrow, as he looked on the pale countenance of his victim, Life, he thought, had not utterly fled, but without better aid than his own he saw not how it could be preserved. Why, he exclaimed in vain penitence, why did I provoke him to an issue so fatal? Would to God I had submitted to the worst insult man could receive from man, rather than be the bloody instrument of this bloody deed, and doubly cursed be this evil boding spot, which haunted as I knew it to be by a witch or a devil, I yet chose for the place of combat. In any other place save this there had been help to be gotten by speed of foot, or by uplifting of voice. But here there is no one to be found by search, no one to hear my shouts save the evil spirit who has counselled this mischief. It is not her hour. I will essay the spell howsoever, and if she can give me aid she shall do it, or know of what a madman is capable even against those of another world. He spurned his bloody shoe from his foot, and repeated the spell with which the reader is well acquainted. But there was neither voice, apparition, nor signal of answer. The youth, in the impatience of his despair, and with the rash hardihood which formed the basis of his character, shouted aloud, Witch! Sorceress! Fiend! Art thou deaf to my cries of help, and so ready to appear and answer those of vengeance? Arise and speak to me, or I will choke up thy fountain 
tear down thy holly bush and leave thy haunt as waste and bare as thy fatal assistance has made me waste of comfort and bare of counsel this furious and raving invocation was suddenly interrupted by a distant sound resembling a hollow from the gorge of the ravine now may saint mary be praised said the youth hastily fastening his sandal i hear the voice of some living man who may give me counsel and help in this fearful extremity having donned his sandal halbert glendinning hallooing at intervals in answer to the sound which he had heard ran with the speed of a hunted buck down the rugged defile as if paradise had been before him hell and all her furies behind and his eternal happiness or misery had depended upon the speed which he exerted in a space incredibly short for any one but a scottish mountaineer having his nerves strung by the deepest and most passionate interest the youth reached the entrance of the ravine through which the rill that flows down corinanchian discharges itself and unites with the brook that waters the little valley of glendearg here he paused and looked around him upwards and downwards through the glen without perceiving a human form his heart sank within him but the windings of the glen intercepted his prospect and the person whose voice he had heard might therefore be at no great distance though not obvious to his sight the branches of an oak tree which shot straight out from the face of a tall cliff proffered to his bold spirit steady head and active limbs the means of ascending it as a place of outlook although the enterprise was what most men would have shrunk from but by one bound from the earth the active youth caught hold of the lower branch and swung himself up into the tree and in a minute more gained the top of the cliff from which he could easily descry a human figure descending the valley it was not that of a shepherd or of a hunter and scarcely any others used to traverse this deserted solitude especially coming from the north since the reader may remember that the brook took its rise from an extensive and dangerous morass which lay in that direction but halbert glendinning did not pause to consider who the traveller might be or what might be the purpose of his journey to know that he saw a human being and might receive in the extremity of his distress the countenance and advice of a fellow-creature was enough for him at the moment he threw himself from the pinnacle of the cliff once more into the arms of the projecting oak tree whose boughs waved in middle air anchored by the roots in a huge rift or chasm of the rock catching at the branch which was nearest to him he dropped himself from that height upon the ground and such was the athletic springiness of his youthful sinews that he pitched there as lightly and with as little injury as the falcon stooping from her wheel to resume his race at full speed up the glen was the work of an instant and as he turned angle after angle of the indented banks of the valley without meeting that which he sought he became half afraid that the form which he had seen at such a distance had already melted into thin air and was either a deception of his own imagination or of the elementary spirits by which the valley was supposed to be haunted but to his inexpressible joy as he turned round the base of a huge and distinguished crag he saw straight before him and very near to him a person whose dress as he viewed it hastily resembled that of a pilgrim he was a man of advanced life and wearing a long beard having on his head a large slouched hat without either band or brooch his dress was a tunic of black serge which like those commonly called hussar cloaks had an upper part which covered the arms and fell down on the lower a small scrip and bottle which hung at his back with a stout staff in his hand completed his equipage his step was feeble like that of one exhausted by a toilsome journey save ye good father said the youth god and our lady have sent you to my assistance and in what my son can so frail a creature as i am be of service to you said the old man not a little surprised at being thus accosted by so handsome a youth his features discomposed by anxiety his face flushed with exertion his hands and much of his dress stained with blood a man bleeds to death in the valley here hard by come with me come with me you are aged you have experience you have at least your senses and mine have well nigh left me a man and bleeding to death and here in this desolate spot said the stranger stay not to question it father said the youth but come instantly to his rescue follow me follow me without an instant's delay nay but my son said the old man 
We do not lightly follow the guides who present themselves thus suddenly in the bosom of a howling wilderness. Ere I follow thee, thou must expound to me thy name, thy purpose, and thy cause. There is no time to expound anything, said Halbert. I tell thee, a man's life is at stake, and thou must come to aid him, or I will carry thee thither by force. Nay, thou shalt not need, said the traveller. If it indeed be as thou sayest, I will follow thee of free will. The rather that I am not wholly unskilled in leechcraft, and have in my scrip that which may do thy friend a surface. Yet walk more slowly, I pray thee, for I am already well nigh forspent with travel. With the indignant impatience of the fiery steed when compelled by his rider to keep pace with some slow drudge upon the highway, Halbert accompanied the wayfarer, burning with anxiety which he endeavoured to subdue, that he might not alarm his companion, who was obviously afraid to trust him. When they reached the place where they were to turn off the wider glen into the quarry, the traveller made a doubtful pause, as if unwilling to leave the broader path. "'Young man,' he said, "'if thou meanest aught but good to these grey hairs, thou wilt gain little by thy cruelty. I have no earthly treasure to tempt either robber or murderer.' "'And I,' said the youth, "'am neither, and yet, God of heaven, I may be a murderer, unless your aid comes in time to this wounded wretch.' Is it even so, said the traveller, and do human passions disturb the breast of nature even in her deepest solitude? Yet why should I marvel that where darkness abides the works of darkness should abound? By its fruits is the tree known. Lead on, unhappy youth, I follow thee. And with better will to the journey than he had evinced hitherto, the stranger exerted himself to the uttermost and seemed to forget his own fatigue in his efforts to keep pace with his impatient guide. What was the surprise of Halbert Glendinning, when upon arriving at the fatal spot he saw no appearance of the body of Sir Piercy Shafton? The traces of the fray were otherwise sufficiently visible. The knight's cloak had indeed vanished as well as his body, but his doublet remained where he had laid it down, and the turf on which he had been stretched was stained with blood in many a dark crimson spot. As he gazed around him, in terror and astonishment, Halbert's eyes fell upon the place of sepulture, which had so lately appeared to gape for a victim. It was no longer open, and it seemed that earth had received the expected tenant, for the usual narrow hillock was piled over what had lately been an open grave, and the green sod was adjusted over all with the accuracy of an experienced sexton. Halbert stood aghast. The idea rushed on his mind irresistibly, that the earth heap before him enclosed what had lately been a living, moving, and sentient fellow-creature, whom on little provocation his fell act had reduced to a clod of the valley, as senseless and as cold as the turf under which he rested. The hand that scooped the grave had completed its work, and whose hand could it be save that of the mysterious being of doubtful quality whom his rashness had invoked? and whom he had suffered to intermingle in his destinies. As he stood with clasped hands and uplifted eyes, bitterly ruing his rashness, he was roused by the voice of the stranger whose suspicions of his guide had again been awakened by finding the scene so different from what Halbert had led him to expect. "'Young man,' he said, "'hast thou baited thy tongue with falsehood to cut perhaps only a few days from the life of one whom nature will soon call home?' without guilt on thy part to hasten his journey?" "'By the blessed heaven, by our dear lady,' ejaculated Halbert. "'Swear not at all,' said the stranger, interrupting him. "'Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by the creatures whom he hath made, for they are but earth and clay, as we are. Let thy yea be yea, and thy nay nay. Tell me in a word why and for what purpose thou hast feigned a tale to lead a bewildered traveller yet farther astray. "'As I am a Christian man,' said Glendinning, "'I left him here bleeding to death, and now I know where spy him, and much I doubt that the tomb that thou seest has closed on his mortal remains.' "'And who is he for whose fate thou art so anxious?' said the stranger. "'Or how is it possible that this wounded man could have been either removed from, or interred in, a place so solitary?' His name, said Halbert, after a moment's pause, is Piercy Shafton. There on that very spot I left him bleeding, and what power has conveyed him hence 
I know no more than thou dost. Piercy Shafton, said the stranger. Sir Piercy Shafton of Wilverton, a kinsman, as it is said, of the great Piercy of Northumberland? If thou hast slain him, to return to the territories of the proud abbot is to give thy neck to the gallows. He is well known, that Piercy Shafton, the meddling tool of wiser plotters, a hare-brained trafficker in treason, a champion of the Pope, employed as a forlorn hope by those more politic heads, who have more will to work mischief than valour to encounter danger. Come with me, youth, and save thyself from the evil consequences of this deed. Guide me to the castle of Avenel, and thy reward shall be protection and safety." Again Halbert paused, and summoned his mind to a hasty counsel. The vengeance with which the abbot was likely to visit the slaughter of Shafton, his friend, and in some measure his guest, was likely to be severe. Yet in the various contingencies which he had considered previous to their duel, he had unaccountably omitted to reflect what was to be his line of conduct in case of Sir Piercy falling by his hand. If he returned to Glendearg, he was sure to draw on his whole family, including Mary Avenel, the resentment of the abbot and community, whereas it was possible that flight might make him be regarded as the sole author of the deed and might avert the indignation of the monks from the rest of the inhabitants of his paternal tower. Halbert recollected also the favour expressed for the household, and especially for Edward, by the sub-prior, and he conceived that he could, by communicating his own guilt to that worthy ecclesiastic, when at a distance from Glendearg, secure his powerful interposition in favour of his family. These thoughts rapidly passed through his mind, and he determined on flight. The stranger's company and his promised protection came in aid of that resolution, but he was unable to reconcile the invitation which the old man gave him to accompany him for safety to the castle of Avenel, with the connections of Julian, the present usurper of that inheritance. "'Good father,' he said, "'I fear that you mistake the man with whom you wish me to harbour. Avenel guided Piercy Shafton into Scotland, and his henchman, Christie of the Clinthill, brought the southern hither. Of that, said the old man, I am well aware. Yet if thou wilt trust to me, as I have shown no reluctance to confide in thee, thou shalt find with Julian Avenel welcome, or at least safety. Father, replied Halbert, though I can ill reconcile what thou sayest with what Julian Avenel hath done, yet caring little about the safety of a creature so lost as myself, and as thy words seem those of truth and honesty, and finally as thou didst render thyself frankly up to my conduct, I will return the confidence thou hast shown, and accompany thee to the castle of Avenel by a road which thou thyself couldst never have discovered. He led the way, and the old man followed for some time in silence. End of chapter 22 Chapter Twenty Three of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Three. Tis when the wound is stiffening with the cold, the warrior first feels pain. Tis when the heat and fiery fever of his soul is past, the sinner feels remorse. Old Play. The feelings of compunction with which Halbert Glendinning was visited upon this painful occasion were deeper than belonged to an age and country in which human life was held so cheap. They fell far short, certainly, of those which might have afflicted a mind regulated by better religious precepts, and more strictly trained under social laws. But still they were deep and severely felt, and divided in Halbert's heart even the regret with which he parted from Mary Avenel and the tower of his father's. The old traveller walked silently by his side for some time, and then addressed him. "'My son, it has been said that sorrow must speak or die. Why art thou so much cast down? Tell me thy unhappy tale, and it may be that my grey head may devise counsel and aid for your young life.' "'Alas,' said Halbert Glendinning, "'can you wonder why I am cast down? I am at this instant a fugitive from my father's house from my mother, and from my friends, and I bear on my head the blood of a man who injured me but in idle words, which I have thus bloodily requited. 
My heart now tells me I have done evil. It were harder than these rocks if it could bear unmoved the thought that I have sent this man to a long account, unhouseled and unshrieved. Pause there, my son, said the traveller, that thou hast defaced God's image in thy neighbour's person, that thou hast sent dust to dust in idle wrath or idler pride, is indeed a sin of the deepest dye, that thou hast cut short the space which heaven might have allowed him for repentance, makes it yet more deadly, but for all this there is balm in Gilead. I understand you not, father, said Halbert, struck by the solemn tone which was assumed by his companion. The old man proceeded. Thou hast slain thine enemy. It was a cruel deed. Thou hast cut him off, perchance, in his sins. It is a fearful aggravation. Do yet by my counsel, and in lieu of him, whom thou hast perchance consigned to the kingdom of Satan, let thine efforts wrest another subject from the reign of the evil one. I understand you, father, said Halbert. Thou wouldst have me atone for my rashness by doing service to the soul of my adversary. But how may this be? I have no money to purchase masses, and gladly would I go barefoot to the Holy Land to free his spirit from purgatory, only that— My son, said the old man, interrupting him, the sinner for whose redemption I entreat you to labor, is not the dead but the living. It is not for the soul of thine enemy I would exhort thee to pray. That has already had its final doom from a judge as merciful as he is just. Nor wert thou to coin that rock into ducats and obtain a mass for each one, would it avail the departed spirit. Where the tree hath fallen, it must lie. But the sapling, which hath in it yet the vigour and juice of life, may be bended to the point to which it ought to incline. "'Art thou a priest, father?' said the young man. "'Or by what commission dost thou talk of such high matters?' "'By that of my almighty master,' said the traveller, "'under whose banner I am an enlisted soldier.' Halbert's acquaintance with religious matters was no deeper than could be derived from the Archbishop of St. Andrew's Catechism, and the pamphlet called the Twapenny Faith both which were industriously circulated and recommended by the monks of St. Mary's. Yet, however indifferent and superficial a theologian, he began to suspect that he was now in company with one of the gospelers, or heretics, before whose influence the ancient system of religion now tottered to the very foundation. Bred up, as may well be presumed, in a holy horror against these formidable sectaries, the youth's first feelings were those of a loyal and devoted church vassal. Old man, he said, wert thou able to make good with thy hand the words that thy tongue hath spoken against our holy mother church, we should have tried upon this moor which of our creeds hath the better champion. Nay, said the stranger, if thou art a true soldier of Rome, thou wilt not pause from thy purpose because thou hast the odds of years and of strength on thy side. Hearken to me, my son. I have showed thee how to make peace with heaven and thou hast rejected my proffer. I will now show thee how thou shalt make thy reconciliation with the powers of this world. Take this grey head from the frail body which supports it, and carry it to the chair of proud Abbot Boniface, and when thou tellest him thou hast slain Piercy Shafton, and his ire rises at the deed, lay the head of Henry Warden at his foot, and thou shalt have praise instead of censure. Halbert Glendinning stepped back in surprise. What? Are you that Henry Warden so famous among the heretics that even Knox's name is scarce more frequently in their mouths? Art thou he, and darest thou to approach the Halidome of St. Mary's? I am Henry Warden of a surety, said the old man, far unworthy to be named in the same breath with Knox, but yet willing to venture on whatever dangers my master's service may call me to. Hearken to me, then, said Halbert. To slay thee I have no heart. To make thee prisoner were equally to bring thy blood on my head. To leave thee in this while without a guide were little better. I will conduct thee, as I promised, in safety to the castle of Avenel. But breathe not, while we are on the journey, a word against the doctrines of the Holy Church of which I am an unworthy, but though an ignorant, a zealous member. When thou art there arrived, beware of thyself. There is a high price upon thy head 
and Julian Avenel loves the glance of gold bonnet pieces. Footnote: A gold coin of James V, the most beautiful of the Scottish series, so called because the effigy of the sovereignty is represented wearing a bonnet. End footnote. Yet thou sayest not, answered the Protestant preacher, for such he was, that for lucre he would sell the blood of his guest? Not if thou comest an invited stranger, relying on his faith, said the youth. Even as Julian may be, he dare not break the rights of hospitality. For, loose as we on these marches may be in all other ties, these are respected amongst us even to idolatry and his nearest relations would think it incumbent on them to spill his blood themselves, to efface the disgrace such treason would bring upon their name and lineage. But if thou goest self-invited, and without assurance of safety, I promise thee thy risk is great. I am in God's hand, answered the preacher. It is on his errand that I traverse these wilds amongst dangers of every kind. While I am useful for my master's service, they shall not prevail against me, and when, like the barren fig-tree, I can no longer produce fruit, what imports it, when or by whom the axe is laid to the root? Your courage and devotion, said Glendinning, are worthy of a better cause. That, said Warden, cannot be. Mine is the very best. They continued their journey in silence. Halbert Glendinning tracing with the utmost accuracy the mazes of the dangerous and intricate morasses and hills which divided the Halidome from the barony of Avenel. From time to time he was obliged to stop, in order to assist his companion to cross the black intervals of quaking bog, called in the Scottish dialect hags, by which the firmer parts of the morass were intersected. "'Courage, old man,' said Halbert, as he saw his companion almost exhausted with fatigue. "'We shall soon be upon hard ground. And yet, soft as this moss is, I have seen the merry falconers go through it as light as deer when the quarry was upon the flight.' "'True, my son,' answered the warden, "'for so I will still call you, though you term me no longer father. And even so doth headlong youth pursue its pleasures without regard to the mire and peril of the paths through which they are hurried. I have already told thee, answered Halbert Glendinning sternly, that I will hear nothing from thee that savours of doctrine. Nay, but my son, answered the warden, thy spiritual father himself would surely not dispute the truth of what I have now spoken for your edification. Glendinning stoutly replied, I know not how that may be. But I wot well it is the fashion of your brotherhood to bait your hook with fair discourse, and to hold yourselves up as angels of light, that you may the better extend the kingdom of darkness. May God, replied the preacher, pardon those who have thus reported of his servants. I will not offend thee, my son, by being instant out of season. Thou speakest but as thou art taught. Yet sure I trust that so goodly a youth will be still rescued, like a brand from the burning. While he thus spoke, the verge of the morass was attained, and their path lay on the declivity. Greensward it was, and viewed from a distance checkered with its narrow and verdant line the dark brown heath which it traversed, though the distinction was not so easily traced when they were walking on it. Footnote. This sort of path, visible when looked at from a distance, but not to be seen when you are upon it, is called on the border by the significant name of a blind road. End footnote. The old man pursued his journey with comparative ease, and unwilling again to awaken the jealous zeal of his young companion for the Roman faith, he discoursed on other matters. The tone of his conversation was still grave, moral, and instructive. He had travelled much, and knew both the language and the manners of other countries. Concerning which Halbert Glendinning, already anticipating the possibility of being obliged to leave Scotland for the deed he had done, was naturally and anxiously desirous of information. By degrees he was more attracted by the charms of the stranger's conversation than repelled by the dread of his dangerous character as a heretic, and Halbert had called him father more than once ere the turrets of Evanel Castle came in view. The situation of this ancient fortress was remarkable. It occupied a small, rocky islet in a mountain lake, or tarn, as such a piece of water is called in Westmoreland 
The lake might be about a mile in circumference, surrounded by hills of considerable height, which, except where old trees and brushwood occupied the ravines that divided them from each other, were bare and heathy. The surprise of the spectator was chiefly excited by finding a piece of water situated in that high and mountainous region, and the landscape around had features which might rather be termed wild than either romantic or sublime. Yet the scene was not without its charms. Under the burning sun of summer the clear azure of the deep, unruffled lake refreshed the eye, and impressed the mind with a pleasing feeling of deep solitude. In winter, when the snow lay on the mountains around, these dazzling masses appeared to ascend far beyond their wonted and natural height, while the lake, which stretched beneath and filled their bosom with all its frozen waves, lay like the surface of a darkened and broken mirror around the black and rocky islet, and the walls of the grey castle with which it was crowned. As the castle occupied, either with its principal buildings or with its flanking and outward walls, every projecting point of rock which served as its site, it seemed as completely surrounded by water as the nest of a wild swan, save where a narrow causeway extended betwixt the islet and the shore. But the fortress was larger in appearance than in reality, and of the buildings which it actually contained, many had become ruinous and uninhabitable. In the times of the grandeur of the Avenel family, these had been occupied by a considerable garrison of followers and retainers, but they were now in a great measure deserted, and Julian Avenel would probably have fixed his habitation in a residence better suited to his diminished fortunes, had it not been for the great security which the situation of the old castle afforded to a man of his precarious and perilous mode of life. Indeed, in this respect, the spot could scarce have been more happily chosen for it could be rendered almost completely inaccessible at the pleasure of the inhabitant. The distance betwixt the nearest shore and the islet was not indeed above an hundred yards, but then the causeway which connected them was extremely narrow, and completely divided by two cuts, one in the midway between the islet and shore, and another close under the outward gate of the castle. These formed a formidable and almost insurmountable interruption to any hostile approach. Each was defended by a drawbridge, one of which, being that nearest to the castle, was regularly raised at all times during the day, and both were lifted at night. Footnote. It is in vain to search near Melrose for any such castle as is here described. The lakes at the head of the Yarrow, and those at the rise of the water of Ale, present no object of the kind. But in Bethholm Lock, a romantic sheet of water in the dry march, as it is called, there are the remains of a fortress called Lockside Tower, which, like the supposed castle of Avenel, is built upon an island and connected with the land by a causeway. It is much smaller than the castle of Avenel as described, consisting only of a single tower. End footnote. The situation of Julian Avenel, engaged in a variety of feuds, and a party to almost every dark and mysterious transaction which was on foot in that wild and military frontier, required all these precautions for his security. His own ambiguous and doubtful course of policy had increased these dangers, for as he made professions to both parties in the state, and occasionally united more actively with either the one or the other, as chanced best to serve his immediate purpose, he could not be said to have either firm allies and protectors, or determined enemies. His life was a life of expedience and of peril and while in pursuit of his interest he made all the doubles which he thought necessary to attain his object, he often overran his prey, and missed that which he might have gained by observing a straighter course. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 Part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. CHAPTER Twenty Four, PART A I'll walk on tiptoe, arm my eye with caution, my heart with courage, and my hand with weapon, like him who ventures on a lion's den. Old Play When issuing from the gorge of a pass which terminated upon the lake, the travellers came in sight of the ancient castle of Avenel. The old man looked with earnest attention upon the scene before him. The castle was, as we have said, in many places ruinous, 
as was evident, even at this distance, by the broken, rugged, and irregular outline of the walls and of the towers. In others it seemed more entire, and a pillar of dark smoke which ascended from the chimneys of the donjon, and spread its long dusky pennon through the clear ether, indicated that it was inhabited. But no cornfields or enclosed pasture grounds on the side of the lake showed that provident attention to comfort and subsistence which usually appeared near the houses of the greater, and even of the lesser, barons. There were no cottages with their patches of infield, and their crofts and gardens surrounded by rows of massive sycamores, no church with its simple tower in the valley, no herds of sheep among the hills, no cattle on the lower ground, nothing which intimated the occasional prosecution of the arts of peace and of industry. It was plain that the inhabitants, whether few or numerous, must be considered as the garrison of the castle, living within its defended precincts, and subsisting by means which were other than peaceful. Probably it was with this conviction that the old man, gazing on the castle, muttered to himself, Lapis, offensionis et petra scandali, and then turning to Halbert Glendinning, he added, we may say of yonder fort as king james did of another fastness in this province that he who built it was a thief in his heart footnote it was of lockwood the hereditary fortress of the johnstones of onandale a strong castle situated in the centre of a quaking bog that james the sixth made this remark End footnote. But it was not so, answered Glendinning. Yonder castle was built by the old lords of Avenel, men as much beloved in peace as they were respected in war. They were the bulwark of the frontiers against foreigners, and the protectors of the natives from domestic oppression. The present usurper of their inheritance no more resembles them than the night-prowling owl resembles a falcon, because she builds on the same rock. This Julian Avenel, then, holds no high place in the love and regard of his neighbors said warden so little answered halbert that besides the jackmen and riders with whom he has associated himself and of whom he has many at his disposal i know a few who voluntarily associate with him he has been more than once outlawed both by england and scotland his lands declared forfeited and his head set at a price but in these unquiet times a man so daring as Julian Avenel has ever found some friends willing to protect him against the penalties of the law, on condition of his secret services. "'You describe a dangerous man,' replied Warden. "'You may have experience of that,' replied the youth, if you deal not the more warily, though it may be that he also has forsaken the community of the Church, and gone astray in the path of heresy what your blindness terms the path of heresy answered the reformer is indeed the straight and narrow way wherein he who walks turns not aside whether for worldly wealth or for worldly passions would to god this man were moved by no other and no worse spirit than that which prompts my poor endeavours to extend the kingdom of heaven this baron of avenel is personally unknown to me he is not of our congregation or of our council yet I bear to him charges touching my safety from those whom he must fear if he does not respect them, and upon that assurance I will venture upon his hold. I am now sufficiently refreshed by these few minutes of repose. Take then this advice for your safety, said Halbert, and believe that it is founded upon the usage of this country and its inhabitants. If you can better shift for yourself, go not to the castle of Avenel. If you do risk going thither, obtain from him, if possible, his safe conduct, and beware that he swears it by the black rood. And lastly, observe whether he eats with you at the board, or pledges you in the cup, for if he gives you not these signs of welcome, his thoughts are evil towards you. Alas, said the preacher, I have no better earthly refuge for the present than these frowning towers, but I go thither trusting to aid which is not of this earth. But thou, good youth, needest thou trust thyself in this dangerous den i answered halbert am in no danger i am well known to christie of the clinthill the henchman of this julian avenel and what is a yet better protection i have nothing either to provoke malice or to attempt plunder the tramp of a steed which clattered along the shingly banks of the loch was now heard behind them 
and when they looked back a rider was visible, his steel cap and the point of his long lance glancing in the setting sun as he rode rapidly towards them. Halbert Glendinning soon recognized Christie of the Clinthill, and made his companion aware that the henchman of Julian Avenel was approaching. "'Ha, youngling!' said Christie to Halbert, as he came up to them. "'Thou hast made good my word at last, and come to take service with my noble master, hast thou not? Thou shalt find a good friend and a true, and ere St. Barnaby come round again, thou shalt know every pass betwixt Milburn Plain and Netherby, as if thou hadst been born with a jack on thy back and a lance in thy hand. What old Carl hast thou with thee? He is not of the brotherhood of St. Mary's, at least he has not the buist, footnote, buist, the brand or mark set upon sheep or cattle by their owners, End footnote. of these black cattle. He is a wayfaring man, said Halbert, who has concerns with Julian of Avenel. For myself I intend to go to Edinburgh to see the court and the queen and when I return hither we will talk of your proffer. Meantime, as thou hast often invited me to the castle, I crave hospitality there to-night for myself and my companion. "'For thyself and welcome, young comrade,' replied Christie. "'But we harbour no pilgrims, nor aught that looks like a pilgrim.' "'So please you,' said Warden, "'I have letters of commendation to thy master from a sure friend.' whom he will right willingly oblige in higher matters than in affording me a brief protection. And I am no pilgrim, but renounce the same, with all its superstitious observances." He offered his letters to the horseman, who shook his head. "'These,' he said, "'are matters for my master, and it will be well if he can read them himself. For me, sword and lance are my book and psalter, and have been since I was twelve years old. But I will guide you to the castle and the Baron of Avenel will himself judge of your errand." By this time the party had reached the causeway, along which Christie advanced at a trot, intimating his presence to the warders within the castle by a shrill and peculiar whistle. At this signal the farther drawbridge was lowered. The horsemen passed it, and disappeared under the gloomy portal which was beyond it. Glendinning and his companion, advancing more leisurely along the rugged causeway, stood at length under the same gateway over which frowned in dark red freestone the ancient armorial bearings of the house of Avenel, which represented a female figure, shrouded and muffled, which occupied the whole field. The cause of their assuming so singular a device was uncertain, but the figure was generally supposed to represent the mysterious being called the White Lady of Avenel. Footnote. There is an ancient English family, I believe, which bears, or did bear, a ghost or spirit passant sable in a field argent. This seems to have been a device of a punning or canting herald. End footnote. The sight of this mouldering shield awakened in the mind of Halbert the strange circumstances which had connected his fate with that of Mary Avenel, and with the doings of the spiritual being who was attached to her house and whom he saw here, represented in stone, as he had before seen her effigy upon the seal-ring of Walter Avenel, which, with other trinkets formerly mentioned, had been saved from pillage, and brought to Glendearg, when Mary's mother was driven from her habitation. "'You sigh, my son,' said the old man, observing the impression made on his youthful companion's countenance, but mistaking the cause. "'If you fear to enter, we may yet return.' "'That can ye not,' said Christie of the Clinthill, who emerged at that instant from the side-door under the archway. "'Look yonder, and choose whether you will return skimming the water like a wild duck, or winging the air like a plover.' They looked, and saw that the drawbridge which they had just crossed was again raised, and now interposed its planks betwixt the setting sun and the portal of the castle, deepening the gloom of the arch under which they stood. Christie laughed and bid them follow him, saying by way of encouragement in Halbert's ear, "'Answer boldly and readily to whatever the Baron asks you. Never stop to pick your words, and, above all, show no fear of him. The devil is not so black as he is painted.' As he spoke thus, he introduced them into the large stone hall, at the upper end of which blazed a huge fire of wood. The long oaken table, which, as usual, occupied the midst of the apartment, was covered with rude preparations for the evening meal of the baron and his chief domestics, five or six of whom, strong, athletic, savage-looking men, paced up and down the lower end of the hall, 
which rang to the jarring clang of their long swords that clashed as they moved, and to the heavy tramp of their high-heeled jack-boots. Iron jacks, or coats of buff, formed the principal part of their dress, and steel bonnets, or large slouched hats with Spanish plumes drooping backwards, were their head attire. The Baron of Avenel was one of those tall, muscular, martial figures which are the favorite subjects of Salvatore Rosa. He wore a cloak which had been once gaily trimmed, but which, by long wear and frequent exposure to the weather, was now faded in its colors. Thrown negligently about his tall person, it partly hid and partly showed a short doublet of buff, under which was in some places visible that light shirt of mail which was called a secret, because worn instead of more ostensible armor to protect against private assassination. A leathern belt sustained a large and heavy sword on one side, and on the other that gay poniard which had once called Sir Piercy Shafton Master, of which the hatchments and gildings were already much defaced, either by rough usage or neglect. Notwithstanding the rudeness of his apparel, Julian Avenel's manner and countenance had far more elevation than those of the attendants who surrounded him. He might be fifty or upwards, for his dark hair was mingled with grey, but age had neither tamed the fire of his eye nor the enterprise of his disposition. His countenance had been handsome, for beauty was an attribute of the family, but the lines were roughened by fatigue and exposure to the weather, and rendered coarse by the habitual indulgence of violent passions. He seemed in deep and moody reflection, and was pacing at a distance from his dependents along the upper end of the hall, sometimes stopping from time to time to caress and feed a goshawk, which sat upon his wrist, with its jesses, in other words the leathern straps fixed to its legs, wrapped around his hand. The bird, which seemed not insensible to its master's attention, answered his caresses by ruffling forward its feathers and pecking playfully at his finger. At such intervals the baron smiled, but instantly resumed the darksome air of sullen meditation. He did not even deign to look upon an object, which few could have passed and repassed so often without bestowing on it a transient glance. This was a woman of exceeding beauty, rather gaily than richly attired who sat on a low seat close by the huge hall chimney. The gold chains round her neck and arms, the gay gown of green which swept the floor, the silver embroidered girdle with its bunch of keys depending in housewifely pride by a silver chain, the yellow silken couvrechef, scottis, kerch, which was disposed around her head, and partly concealed her dark profusion of hair, above all the circumstances so delicately touched in the old ballad that the girdle was too short, the gown of green all too straight, for the wearer's present shape, would have intimated the baron's lady. But then the lowly seat, the expression of deep melancholy, which was changed into a timid smile whenever she saw the least chance of catching the eye of Julian Avenel, the subdued look of grief, and the starting tear for which that constrained smile was again exchanged, when she saw herself entirely disregarded, these were not the attributes of a wife, or they were those of a dejected and afflicted female who had yielded her love on less than legitimate terms. Julian Avenel, as we have said, continued to pace the hall without paying any of that mute attention which is rendered to almost every female either by affection or courtesy. He seemed totally unconscious of her presence, or of that of his attendants, and was only roused from his own dark reflections by the notice he paid to the falcon, to which, however, the lady seemed to attend, as if studying to find either an opportunity of speaking to the baron, or of finding something enigmatical in the expressions which he used to the bird. All this the strangers had time enough to remark, for no sooner had they entered the apartment than their usher, Christie of the Clinthill, after exchanging a significant glance with the menials or troopers at the lower end of the apartment, signed to Halbert Glendinning, and to his companion to stand still near the door, while he himself, advancing nearer the table, placed himself in such a situation as to catch the baron's observation when he should be disposed to look around, but without presuming to intrude himself on his master's notice. Indeed, the look of this man, naturally bold, hardy, and audacious, seemed totally changed when he was in presence of his master, and resembled the dejected and cowering manner of a quarrelsome dog when rebuked by his owner, 
or when he finds himself obliged to deprecate the violence of a superior adversary of his own species. In spite of the novelty of his own situation, and every painful feeling connected with it, Halbert felt his curiosity interested in the female, who sate by the chimney unnoticed and unregarded. He marked with what keen and trembling solicitude she watched the broken words of Julian, and how her glance stole towards him, ready to be averted upon the slightest chance of his perceiving himself to be watched. Meantime he went on with his dalliance with his feathered favourite, now giving, now withholding, the morsel with which he was about to feed the bird, and so exciting its appetite and gratifying it by turns. "'What, more yet, thou foul kite, thou wouldst never have done, give thee part thou wilt have all. Ay, prune thy feathers, and prink thyself gay, much thou wilt make of it now. Dost think I know thee not? Dost think I see not? that all that ruffling and pluming of wing and feathers is not for thy master, but to try what thou canst make of him, thou greedy gled? Well, there, take it then, and rejoice thyself. Little boon goes far with thee, and with all thy sex, and so it should." He ceased to look on the bird, and again traversed the apartment, then taking another small piece of raw meat from the trencher, on which it was placed ready cut for his use. He began once again to tempt and tease the bird by offering and withdrawing it, until he awakened its wild and bold disposition. What, struggling, fluttering, aiming at me with beak and single? Footnote. In the kindly language of hawking, as Lady Juliana Berners terms it, hawks' talons are called their singles. End footnote. Sola, sola, wouldst mount, wouldst fly? The jesses are round thy clutches, fool. Thou canst neither stir nor soar but by my will. Beware thou come to reclaim, wench, else I will wring thy head off one of these days. Well have it then, and well fare thou with it. So ho, Jenkin. One of the attendants stepped forward. Take the foul gled hence to the mew, or stay, leave her, but look well to her casting and to her bathing. We will see her fly to-morrow. How now, Christie, so soon returned? End of chapter 24, part A. Chapter 24, part B of The Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24, part B. Christie advanced to his master, and gave an account of himself and his journey in the way in which a police officer holds communication with his magistrate, that is, as much by signs as by words. "'Noble sir,' said the worthy satellite, "'the laird of—he named no place, but pointed with his finger in a southwestern direction—may not ride with you the day he purposed, because the Lord Warden has threatened that he will—' Here another blank, intelligibly enough made up by the speaker touching his own neck with his left forefinger, and leaning his head a little to one side. "'Cowardly caitiff,' said Julian, "'by heaven, the whole world turns sheer naught.' It is not worth a brave man's living in. Ye may ride a day and night, and never see a feather wave, or hear a horse prance. The spirit of our fathers is dead amongst us. The very brutes are degenerated. The cattle we bring at our life's risk are mere carrion. Our hawks are riflers. Footnote. So called when they only caught their prey by the feathers. End footnote. Our hounds are turnspits and trindle-tails. Our men are women, and our women are— he looked at the female for the first time, and stopped short in the midst of what he was about to say, though there was something so contemptuous in the glance that the blank might have been thus filled up. "'Our women are such as she is.' He said it not, however, and as if desirous of attracting his attention, at all risks, and in whatever manner, she rose and came forward to him, but with a timorousness ill-disguised by affected gaiety. "'Our women, Julian, what would you say of the women?' "'Nothing,' answered Julian Avenel, "'at least nothing but that they are kind-hearted wenches like thyself, Kate.' The female coloured deeply, and returned to her seat. "'And what strangers hast thou brought with thee, Christie, that stand yonder like two stone statues?' said the baron. "'The taller,' answered Christie, "'is, so please you, a young fellow called Halbert Glendinning, the eldest son of the old widow at Glendirk. "'What brings him here?' said the baron. "'Hath he any message for Mary Avenel?' "'Not as I think,' said Christie. "'The youth is roving the country. 
He was always a wild slip, for I have known him since he was the height of my sword. What qualities hath he? said the baron. All manner of qualities, answered his follower. He can strike a buck, track a deer, fly a hawk, hello to a hound. He shoots in the long and crossbow to a hair's breadth, wields a lance or sword like myself nearly, backs a horse manfully and fairly. I wot not what more a man need to do to make him a gallant companion. And who, said the baron, is the old miser? Footnote. Miser used in the sense in which it often occurs in Spencer, and which is indeed its literal import wretched old man. End footnote. Who stands beside him? Some cast of a priest, as I fancy. He says he is charged with letters to you. Bid them come forward, said the baron, and no sooner had they approached him more nearly than, struck by the fine form and strength displayed by Halbert Glendinning, he addressed him thus. I am told, young swanky, that you are roaming the world to seek your fortune. If you will serve Julian Avenel, you may find it without going farther. So please you, answered Glendinning, something has chanced to me that makes it better I should leave this land, and I am bound for Edinburgh. What? Thou hast stricken some of the king's deer, I warrant, or lightened the meadows of St. Mary's of some of their beeves, or thou hast taken a moonlight leap over the border. No, sir, said Halbert, my case is entirely different. Then I warrant thee, said the baron, thou hast stabbed some brother churl in a fray about a wench. Thou art a likely lad to wrangle in such a cause. Ineffably disgusted at his tone and manner, Halbert Glendinning remained silent, while the thought darted across his mind what would Julian Avenel have said, had he known the quarrel of which he spoke so lightly, had arisen on account of his own brother's daughter. But be thy cause of flight what it will, said Julian, in continuation, dost thou think the law or its emissaries can follow thee into this island, or arrest thee under the standard of Avenel? Look at the depth of the lake, the strength of the walls, the length of the causeway. Look at my men, and think if they are likely to see a comrade injured, or if I, their master, am a man to desert a faithful follower, in good or evil. I tell thee it shall be an eternal day of truce betwixt thee and justice, as they call it, from the instant thou hast put my colours into thy cap. Thou shalt ride by the warden's nose, as thou wouldst pass an old market-woman, and ne'er a cur which follows him shall dare to bay at thee. I thank you for your offers, noble sir, replied Halbert, but I must answer in brief that I cannot profit by them. My fortunes lead me elsewhere." "'Thou art a self-willed fool for thy pains,' said Julian, turning from him, and signing Christie to approach, he whispered in his ear, "'There is promise in that young fellow's looks, Christie, and we want men of limbs and sinews so compacted. Those thou hast brought to me of late are the mere refuse of mankind, wretches scarce worth the arrow that ends them. This youngster is limbed like St. George.' Ply him with wine and wassail. Let the wenches weave their meshes about him like spiders. Thou understandest? Christie gave a sagacious nod of intelligence, and fell back to a respectful distance from his master. And thou, old man, said the baron, turning to the elder traveller, hast thou been roaming the world after fortune, too? It seems not she has fallen into thy way. So please you, replied Warden, I were perhaps more to be pitied than I am now, had I indeed met with that fortune which, like others, I have sought in my greener days. "'Nay, understand me, friend,' said the baron. "'If thou art satisfied with thy buckram gown and long staff, I also am well content thou shouldst be as poor and contemptible as is good for the health of thy body and soul. All I care to know of thee is the cause which hath brought thee to my castle, where few crows of thy kind care to settle. Thou art, I warrant thee, some ejected monk of a suppressed convent paying in his old days the price of the luxurious idleness in which he spent his youth. Aye, or it may be some pilgrim with a budget of lies from St. James of Compostella, or Our Lady of Loretto. Or thou mayest be some pardoner with his budget of relics from Rome, forgiving sins at a penny a dozen, and one to the tale. Aye, I guess why I find thee in this boy's company, and doubtless thou wouldst have such a strapping lad as he to carry thy wallet, and relieve thy lazy shoulders but by the mass I will cross thy cunning. I make my vow to sun and moon, I will not see a proper lad so misled as to run the country with an old knave like Simmy and his brother. Footnote. Two questionary, or begging friars, whose accoutrements and roguery make the subject of an old Scottish satirical poem. 
End footnote. "'Away with thee,' he added, rising in wrath, and speaking so fast as to give no opportunity of answer, being probably determined to terrify the elder guest into an abrupt flight. "'Away with thee, with thy clouted coat, scrip, and scallop-shell, or, by the name of Avenel, I will have them loose the hounds on thee.' Warden waited with the greatest patience until Julian Avenel, astonished that the threats and violence of his language made no impression on him, paused in a sort of wonder, and said in a less imperious tone, why the fiend dost thou not answer me? When you have done speaking, said Warden, in the same composed manner, it will be full time to reply. Say on, man, in the devil's name, but take heed, beg not here, were it but for the rinds of cheese, the refuse of the rats, or a morsel that my dogs would turn from, neither a grain of meal nor the nineteenth part of a grey groat will I give to any feigned limmer of thy coat. "'It may be,' answered Warden, "'that you would have less quarrel with my coat if you knew what it covers. I am neither a friar nor a mendicant, and would be right glad to hear thy testimony against these foul deceivers of God's church, and usurpers of his rights over the Christian flock, were it given in Christian charity.' "'And who or what art thou, then,' said Avenel, "'that thou comest to this border-land, and art neither monk, nor soldier, nor broken man?' "'I am an humble teacher of the holy word,' answered Warden. "'This letter from a most noble person will speak why I am here at this present time.' He delivered the letter to the baron, who regarded the seal with some surprise, and then looked on the letter itself, which seemed to excite still more. He then fixed his eyes on the stranger, and said in a menacing tone, "'I think thou darest not betray me or deceive me?' "'I am not the man to attempt either,' was the concise reply." Julian Avenel carried the letter to the window, where he perused, or at least attempted to peruse it more than once, often looking from the paper and gazing on the stranger who had delivered it, as if he meant to read the purport of the missive in the face of the messenger. Julian at length called to the female, "'Catherine, bestir thee, and fetch me presently that letter which I bade thee keep ready at hand in my casket, having no sure lockfast place of my own.' Catherine went with the readiness of one willing to be employed and as she walked the situation which requires a wider gown and a longer girdle, and in which woman claims from man a double portion of the most anxious care, was still more visible than before. She soon returned with the paper, and was rewarded with a cold, I thank thee, wench, thou art a careful secretary. This second paper he also perused and reperused more than once, and still, as he read it, bent from time to time a wary and observant eye upon Henry Warden. This examination and re-examination, though both the man and the place were dangerous, the preacher endured with the most composed and steady countenance, seeming under the eagle, or rather the vulture eye of the baron, as unmoved as under the gaze of an ordinary and peaceful peasant. At length Julian Avenel folded both papers, and having put them into the pocket of his cloak, cleared his brow, and coming forward addressed his female companion. Catherine, said he, I have done this good man injustice, when I mistook him for one of the drones of Rome. He is a preacher, Catherine, a preacher of the, the new doctrine of the lords of the congregation." "'The doctrine of the blessed scriptures,' said the preacher, purified from the devices of men." "'Sayest thou?' said Julian Avenel. "'Well, thou mayest call it what thou lists. But to me it is recommended, because it flings off all those sottish dreams about saints and angels and devils, and unhorses lazy monks that have ridden us so long, and spurgalled us so hard. No more masses and corpse gifts, no more tithes and offerings to make men poor, no more prayers or psalms to make men cowards, no more christenings and penances and confessions and marriages." "'So please you,' said Henry Warden. It is against the corruptions, not against the fundamental doctrines of the Church, which we desire to renovate and not to abolish. "'Prithee, peace, man,' said the Baron. "'We of the laity care not what you set up, so you pull merrily down what stands in our way. Specially it suits well with us of the Southland fells, for it is our profession to turn the world upside down, and we live ever the blithest life when the downer side is uppermost.' Warden would have replied, but the baron allowed him not time, striking the table with the hilt of his dagger, and crying out, Ha! 
You loitering knaves, bring our supper-meal quickly. See you not this holy man is exhausted for lack of food? Heard ye ever of priest or preacher that devoured not his five meals a day? The attendants bustled to and fro, and speedily brought in several large smoking platters filled with huge pieces of beef, boiled and roasted, but without any variety whatsoever, without vegetables, and almost without bread, though there was at the upper end a few oat-cakes in a basket. Julian Avenel made a sort of apology to Warden. "'You have been commended to our care, Sir Preacher, since that is your style, by a person whom we highly honour. "'I am assured.' said Warden, that the most noble lord. Prithee, peace, man, said Avenel. What need of naming names, so we understand each other? I meant but to speak in reference to your safety and comfort, of which he desires us to be chary. Now for your safety, look at my walls and water. But touching your comfort, we have no corn of our own, and the meal girnels of the south are less easily transported than their beeves, seeing they have no legs to walk upon. But what, though, a stoop of wine thou shalt have, and of the best. Thou shalt sit betwixt Catherine and me at the board end, and Christie, do thou look to the young Springled, and call to the cellarer for a flagon of the best. The baron took his wonted place at the upper end of the board. His Catherine sate down and courteously pointed to a seat betwixt them for their reverend guest. But notwithstanding the influence both of hunger and fatigue, Henry Warden retained his standing posture. End of chapter 24 Part B Chapter twenty five Part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five Part A When lovely woman stoops to folly and finds too late that men betray. Julian Avenel saw with surprise the demeanour of the reverend stranger. Beshrew me, he said, these new fashioned religioners have fast days, I warrant me. The old ones used to confer these blessings chiefly on the laity. We acknowledge no such rule, said the preacher. We hold that our faith consists not in using or abstaining from special meats on special days, and in fasting we rend our hearts and not our garments. The better, the better for yourselves and the worse for Tom Taylor, said the baron. But come, sit down. Or, if thou needs must, e'en give us a cast of thy office, mutter thy charm. Sir Baron, said the preacher, I am in a strange land, where neither mine office nor my doctrine are known, and where it would seem both are greatly misunderstood. It is my duty so to bear me, that in my person, however unworthy, my master's dignity may be respected, and that sin may not take confidence from relaxation of the bonds of discipline. Hola, halt there, said the baron. Thou wert sent hither for thy safety, but not, I think, to preach to me or control me. What is it thou wouldst have, sir preacher? Remember thou speakest to one somewhat short of patience, who loves a short health and a long draught. In a word, then, said Henry Warden, that lady— How, said the baron, starting, what of her? What hast thou to say of that dame? Is she thy house, dame? said the preacher, after a moment's pause, in which he seemed to seek for the best mode of expressing what he had to say, Is she, in brief, thy wife? The unfortunate young woman pressed both her hands on her face, as if to hide it, but the deep blush which crimsoned her brow and neck showed that her cheeks were also glowing, and the bursting tears which found their way betwixt her slender fingers bore witness to her sorrow, as well as to her shame. "'Now by my father's ashes,' said the baron, rising and spurning from him his footstool with such violence that it hit the wall on the opposite side of the apartment. Then instantly constraining himself, he muttered, "'What need to run myself into trouble for a fool's word?' Then resuming his seat, he answered coldly and scornfully, "'No, sir priest or sir preacher, Catherine is not my wife. Cease thy whimpering, thou foolish wench. She is not my wife.' But she is handfasted with me, and that makes her as honest a woman. Handfasted? repeated Warden. Knowest thou not that right, holy man? said Avenel in the same tone of derision. Then I will tell thee. We border men are more wary than your inland clowns of Fife and Lothian. No jump in the dark for us, no clenching the fetters around our wrists till we know how they will wear with us. We take our wives like our horses upon trial. When we are handfasted, 
as we term it, we are man and wife for a year and day. That space gone by, each may choose another mate, or, at their pleasure, may call the priest to marry them for life, and this we call ham-fasting. Footnote. This custom of hand-fasting actually prevailed in the upland days. It arose partly from the want of priests. While the convents subsisted, monks were detached on regular circuits through the wilder districts to marry those who had lived in this species of connection. A practice of the same kind existed in the Isle of Portland. End footnote. Then, said the preacher, I tell thee, noble baron, in brotherly love to thy soul, it is a custom licentious, gross, and corrupted, and it persisted in dangerous, yea, damnable. It binds thee to the frailer being while she is the object of desire. It relieves thee when she is most the subject of pity. It gives all to brutal sense, and nothing to generous and gentle affection. I say to thee that he who can meditate the breach of such an engagement abandoning the deluded woman and the helpless offspring is worse than the birds of prey for of them the males remain with their mates until the nestlings can take wing above all i say it is contrary to the pure christian doctrine which assigns woman to man as the partner of his labour the soother of his evil his helpmate in peril his friend in affliction not as the toy of his looser hours or as a flower which once cropped he may throw aside at pleasure. "'Now by the saints a most virtuous homily,' said the baron, quaintly conceived and curiously pronounced, and to a well-chosen congregation. Hark ye, Sir Gospeller, draw ye to have a fool in hand? Know I not that your sect rose by bluff Henry Tudor merely because ye aided him to change his Kate? And wherefore should I not use the same Christian liberty with mine? Tush, man! Bless the good food, and meddle not with what concerns thee not. Thou hast no gull in Julian Avenel. He hath gulled and cheated himself, said the preacher, should he even incline to do that poor sharer of his domestic cares the imperfect justice that remains to him. Can he now raise her to the rank of a pure and uncontaminated matron? Can he deprive his child of the misery of owing birth to a mother who has erred? He can indeed give them both the rank, the state of married wife, and of lawful son. But in public opinion their names will be smirched and sullied with a stain which his tardy efforts cannot entirely efface. Yet render it to them, Baron of Avenel, render to them this late and imperfect justice. Bid me bind you together for ever, and celebrate the day of your bridal, not with feasting or wassail, but with sorrow for past sin and the resolution to commence a better life. Happy, then, will have the chance been that has drawn me to this castle, though I come driven by calamity, and unknowing where my course is bound, like a leaf travelling in the north wind. The plain and even coarse features of the zealous speaker were warmed at once and ennobled by the dignity of his enthusiasm and the wild baron, lawless as he was, and accustomed to spurn at the control whether of religious or moral law, felt for the first time perhaps in his life that he was under subjection to a mind superior to his own. He sat mute and suspended in his deliberations, hesitating betwixt anger and shame, yet borne down by the weight of the just rebuke thus boldly fulminated against him. The unfortunate young woman, conceiving hopes from her tyrant's silence and apparent indecision, forgot both her fear and shame in her timid expectation that Avenel would relent, and fixing upon him her anxious and beseeching eyes, gradually drew near and nearer to his seat, till at length, laying a trembling hand on his cloak, she ventured to utter, O oh, noble Julian, listen to the good man! The speech and the motion were ill-timed, and wrought on that proud and wayward spirit the reverse of her wishes. The fierce baron started up in a fury, exclaiming, What? Thou foolish callot! Thou art confederate with this strolling vagabond, whom thou hast seen beard me in my own hall. Hence with thee, and think that I am proof to both male and female hypocrisy. The poor girl started back, astounded at his voice of thunder and looks of fury and turning pale as death endeavoured to obey his orders, and tottered towards the door. Her limbs failed in the attempt, and she fell on the stone floor in a manner which her situation might have rendered fatal. 
The blood gushed from her face. Halbert Glendinning brooked not a sight so brutal, but uttering a deep imprecation, started from his seat and laid his hand on his sword, under the strong impulse of passing it through the body of the cruel and hard-hearted ruffian. But Christie of the Clinthill, guessing his intention, threw his arms around him, and prevented him from stirring to execute his purpose. The impulse to such an act of violence was indeed but momentary, as it instantly appeared that Avenel himself, shocked at the effects of his violence, was lifting up and endeavouring to soothe in his own way the terrified Catherine. "'Peace,' he said, "'prithee, peace, thou silly minion. Why, Kate, though I listen not to this tramping preacher, I said not what might happen, and thou dost bear me a stout boy. There, there, dry thy tears, call thy women. Soho, where be these queens? Christy, Rowley, Hutchin, drag them hither by the hair of the head. A half-dozen of startled and wild-looking females rushed into the room, and bore out her who might be either termed their mistress or their companion. She showed little sign of life except by groaning faintly and keeping her hand on her side. No sooner had this luckless female been conveyed from the apartment than the baron, advancing to the table, filled and drank a deep goblet of wine, then, putting an obvious restraint on his passions, turned to the preacher, who stood horror-struck at the scene he had witnessed, and said, "'You have borne too hard on us, sir preacher. But coming with the commendations which you have brought me, I doubt not but your meaning was good. But we are a wilder folk than you inland men of Fife and Lothian. Be advised, therefore, by me. Spur not an unbroken horse. Put not your plowshare too deep into new land. Preach to us spiritual liberty, and we will hearken to you. But we will give no way to spiritual bondage. Sit, therefore, down, and pledge me in old sack, and we will talk over these matters. It is from spiritual bondage, said the preacher, in the same tone of admonitory reproof, that I came to deliver you. It is from a bondage more fearful than that of the heaviest earthly gyves. It is from your own evil passions. Sit down, said Avenel fiercely. Sit down while the play is good, else by my father's crest and my mother's honour. Now, whispered Christie of Clinthill to Halbert, if he refused to sit down, I would not give a grey groat for his head. Lord Baron, said Warden, thou hast placed me in extremity. But if the question be whether I am to hide the light which I am commanded to show forth, or to lose the light of this world, my choice is made. I say to thee, like the holy Baptist to Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have this woman. And I say it, though bonds and death be the consequence, counting my life as nothing in comparison of the ministry to which I am called. Julian Avenel, enraged at the firmness of this reply, flung from his right hand the cup in which he was about to drink to his guest, and from the other cast off the hawk, which flew wildly through the apartment. His first motion was to lay hand upon his dagger, but changing his resolution he exclaimed, "'To the dungeon with this insolent stroller! I will hear no man speak a word for him. Look to the falcon, Christie, thou fool, and she escape I will dispatch you after her every man. Away with that hypocritical dreamer!' Drag him hence if he resist. He was obeyed in both points. Christie of the Clint Hill arrested the hawk's flight by putting his foot on her jesses, and so holding her fast, while Henry Warden was led off without having shown the slightest symptoms of terror by two of the baron's satellites. Julian Avenel walked the apartment for a short time in sullen silence, and dispatching one of his attendants with a whispered message, which probably related to the health of the unfortunate Catherine, he said aloud, "'These rash and meddling priests, by heaven, they make us worse than we would be without them.'" Footnote. If it were necessary to name a prototype for this brutal, licentious, and cruel border-chief, in an age which showed but too many such, the Laird of Black Ormiston might be selected for that purpose. He was a friend and confidant of Bothwell, and an agent in Henry Darnley's murder. At his last stage he was, like other great offenders, a seeming penitent, and, as his confession bears, diverse gentlemen and servants being in the chamber, he said, For God's sake sit down and pray for me, for I have been a great sinner otherwise, that is, besides his share in Darnley's death, for the which God is this day punishing me. For of all men on the earth I have been one of the proudest and most high-minded and most unclean of my body. 
but specially I have shed the innocent blood of one Michael Hunter with my own hands, the last, therefore, because the said Michael, having me lying on my back, having a fork in his hand, might have slain me if he had pleased, and did it not, which of all things grieves me most in conscience. Also in a rage I hanged a poor man for a horse, with many other wicked deeds, for whilk I ask my God mercy. It is not marvel that I have been wicked, considering the wicked company that ever I have been in, but specially within the seven years by past, in which I never saw two good men or one good deed but all kind of wickedness, and yet God would not suffer me to be lost. See the whole confession in the State Trials. End of chapter 25, part A Chapter 25, part B of The Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25, part B Another worthy of the boarders, called Geordi Bourne, of somewhat subordinate rank, was a similar picture of profligacy. He had fallen into the hands of Sir Robert Carey, then warden of the English East Marches, who gives the following account of his prisoner's confession. When all things were quiet, and the watch set at night after supper, about ten of the clock, I took one of my men's liveries and put it about me, and took two other of my servants with me in their liveries. And we three, as the warden's men, came to the provost marshal's, where Bourne was, and were led into his chamber. We sate down by him, and told him that we were desirous to see him, because we heard he was stout and valiant and true to his friend, and that we were sorry our master could not be moved to save his life. He voluntarily of himself said that he had lived long enough to do so many villainies as he had done and withal told us that he had lain with above forty men's wives, what in England, what in Scotland, and that he had killed seven Englishmen with his own hands, cruelly murdering them, and that he had spent his whole time in whoring, drinking, stealing, and taking deep revenge for slight offences. He seemed to be very penitent, and much desired a minister for the comfort of his soul. We promised him to let our master know his desire, who we knew would promptly grant it. We took leave of him, and presently I took order that Mr. Selby, a very honest preacher, should go to him, and not stir from him, till his execution the next morning. For after I had heard his own confession, I was resolved no conditions should save his life, and so took order that at the gate's opening the next morning he should be carried to execution, which accordingly was performed. Memoirs of Sir Robert Carey, Earl of Monmouth the answer which he presently received seemed somewhat to pacify his angry mood, and he took his place at the board, commanding his retinue to the like. All sat down in silence and began the repast. During the meal Christie in vain attempted to engage his youthful companion in carousal, or at least in conversation. Halbert Glendinning pleaded fatigue, and expressed himself unwilling to take any liquor stronger than the heather ale, which was at that time frequently used at meals. Thus every effort at joviality died away, until the baron, striking his hand against the table, as if impatient of the long unbroken silence, cried out aloud, "'What ho, my masters, are ye border riders, and sit as mute over your meal as a mess of monks and friars? Some one sing, if no one list to speak. Much eaten without either mirth or music is ill of digestion. Lewis,' he added, speaking to one of the youngest of his followers, Thou art ready enough to sing when no one bids thee." The young man looked first at his master, then up to the arched roof of the hall, then drank off the horn of ale, or wine, which stood beside him, and with a rough yet not unmelodious voice sung the following ditty to the ancient air of blue bonnets over the border. March, march, Attrick and Teviotdale, why the dale dinia march forward in order? March, march, Exdale and Lidsdale. All the blue bonnets are bound for the border. Many a banner spread, flutters above your head. Many a crest that is famous in story. Mount and make ready, then, sons of the mountain glen. Fight for the queen and the old Scottish glory. Come from the hills where the hersels are grazing. Come from the glen of the buck and the roe. 
Come to the crag where the beacon is blazing. Come with the buckler, the lance, and the bow. Trumpets are sounding. War steeds are bounding. Stand to your arms, then, and march in good order. England shall many a day tell of the bloody fray when the blue bonnets came over the border. The song, rude as it was, had in it that warlike character which at any other time would have roused Halbert's spirit. But at present the charm of minstrelsy had no effect upon him. He made it his request to Christie to suffer him to retire to rest, a request with which that worthy person, seeing no chance of making a favourable impression on his intended proselyte in his present humour, was at length pleased to comply. But no sergeant kite, who ever practised the profession of recruiting, was more attentive that his object should not escape him than was Christie of the Clinthill. He indeed conducted Halbert Glendinning to a small apartment overlooking the lake, which was accommodated with a truckle-bed. But before quitting him, Christie took special care to give a look to the bars which crossed the outside of the window, and when he left the apartment he failed not to give the key a double turn, circumstances which convinced young Glendinning that there was no intention of suffering him to depart from the castle of Avenel at his own time and pleasure. He judged it, however, most prudent to let these alarming symptoms pass without observation. No sooner did he find himself in undisturbed solitude than he ran rapidly over the events of the day in his recollection, and to his surprise found that his own precarious fate, and even the death of Piercy Shafton, made less impression on him than the singularly bold and determined conduct of his companion, Henry Warden. Providence, which suits its instruments to the end they are to achieve, had awakened in the cause of reformation in Scotland a body of preachers of more energy than refinement, bold in spirit and strong in faith, contemners of whatever stood betwixt them and their principal object, and seeking the advancement of the great cause in which they labored by the roughest road, provided it were the shortest. The soft breeze may wave the willow, but it requires the voice of the tempest to agitate the boughs of the oak and accordingly to milder hearers, and in a less rude age their manners would have been ill-adapted, but they were singularly successful in their mission to the rude people to whom it was addressed. Owing to these reasons, Halbert Glendinning, who had resisted and repelled the arguments of the preacher, was forcibly struck by the firmness of his demeanour in the dispute with Julian Avenel. It might be discourteous, and most certainly it was incautious, to choose such a place and such an audience for upbraiding with his transgressions a baron whom both manners and situation placed in full possession of independent power. But the conduct of the preacher was uncompromising, firm, manly, and obviously grounded upon the deepest conviction which duty and principle could afford. And Glendinning, who had viewed the conduct of Avenel with the deepest abhorrence, was proportionally interested in the brave old man, who had ventured life rather than withhold the censure due to guilt. This pitch of virtue seemed to him to be in religion what was demanded by chivalry of her votaries in war, an absolute surrender of all selfish feelings, and a combination of every energy proper to the human mind to discharge the task which duty demanded. Halbert was at the period when youth was most open to generous emotions and knows best how to appreciate them in others, and he felt, although he hardly knew why, that, whether Catholic or heretic, the safety of this man deeply interested him. Curiosity mingled with the feeling, and led him to wonder what the nature of those doctrines could be, which stole their votary so completely from himself, and devoted him to chains or to death as their sworn champion. He had indeed been told of saints and martyrs of former days who had braved for their religious faith the extremity of death and torture, but their spirit of enthusiastic devotion had long slept in the ease and indolent habits of their successors, and their adventures, like those of knights errant, were rather read for amusement than for edification. A new impulse had been necessary to rekindle the energies of religious zeal and that impulse was now operating in favor of a purer religion, with one of whose steadiest votaries the youth had now met for the first time. The sense that he himself was a prisoner, under the power of this savage chieftain, by no means diminished Halbert's interest in the fate of his fellow-sufferer, while he determined at the same time so far to emulate his fortitude that neither threats nor suffering should compel him to enter into the service of such a master 
The possibility of escape next occurred to him, and though with little hope of effecting it in that way, Glendinning proceeded to examine more particularly the window of the apartment. The apartment was situated in the first story of the castle, and was not so far from the rock on which it was founded, but that an active and bold man might with little assistance descend to a shelf of rock which was immediately below the window, and from thence either leap or drop himself down into the lake which lay before his eye, clear and blue in the placid light of a full summer's moon. Were I once placed on that ledge, thought Glendinning, Julian Avenel and Christie had seen the last of me. The size of the window favoured such an attempt, but the stanchions or iron bars seemed to form an insurmountable obstacle. While Halbert Glendinning gazed from the window with that eagerness of hope which was prompted by the energy of his character and his determination not to yield to circumstances, his ear caught some sounds from below, and listening with more attention, he could distinguish the voice of the preacher engaged in his solitary devotions. To open a correspondence with him became immediately his object, and failing to do so by less marked sounds, he at length ventured to speak, and was answered from beneath. "'Is it thou, my son?' the voice of the prisoner now sounded more distinctly than when it was first heard, for Warden had approached the small aperture which, serving his prison for a window, opened just betwixt the wall and the rock, and admitted a scanty portion of light through a wall of immense thickness. This supere, being placed exactly under Halbert's window, the contiguity permitted the prisoners to converse in a low tone, when Halbert declared his intention to escape, and the possibility he saw of achieving his purpose, but for the iron stanchions of the window. "'Prove thy strength, my son, in the name of God,' said the preacher. Halbert obeyed him more in despair than hope, but to his great astonishment, and somewhat to his terror, the bar parted asunder near the bottom, and the longer part being easily bent outwards, and not secured with lead in the upper socket, dropped out into Halbert's hand. He immediately whispered, but as energetically as a whisper could be expressed, "'By heaven! The bar has given way in my hand!' "'Thank heaven, my son, instead of swearing by it,' answered the warden from his dungeon. With little effort, Halbert Glendinning forced himself through the opening thus wonderfully effected, and using his leathern sword-belt as a rope to assist him, let himself safely drop upon the shelf of rock upon which the preacher's window opened. But through this no passage could be effected, being scarce larger than a loophole for musketry, and apparently constructed for that purpose. "'Are there no means by which I can assist your escape, my father?' said Halbert. "'There are none, my son.' answered the preacher, but if thou wilt ensure my safety, that may be in thy power. I will labor earnestly for it, said the youth. Take then a letter which I will presently write, for I have the means of light and writing materials in my scrip. Hasten towards Edinburgh, and on the way thou wilt meet a body of horse marching southwards. Give this to their leader, and acquaint him of the state in which thou hast left me. It may hap that thy doing so will advantage thyself. In a minute or two the light of a taper gleamed through the shot-hole, and very shortly after the preacher, with the assistance of his staff, pushed a billet to Glendinning through the window. "'God bless thee, my son,' said the old man, "'and complete the marvellous work which he has begun.' "'Amen,' answered Halbert with solemnity, and proceeded on his enterprise. He hesitated a moment whether he should attempt to descend to the edge of the water but the steepness of the rock and the darkness of the night rendered the enterprise too dangerous. He clasped his hands above his head and boldly sprung from the precipice, shooting himself forward into the air as far as he could for fear of sunken rocks, and alighted on the lake, head foremost, with such force as sunk him for a minute below the surface. But strong, long-breathed, and accustomed to such exercise, Halbert even though encumbered with his sword, dived and rose like a sea-fowl, and swam across the lake in the northern direction. When he landed and looked back on the castle he could observe that the alarm had been given, for lights glanced from window to window, and he heard the drawbridge lowered, and the tread of horses' feet upon the causeway. But, little alarmed for the consequence of a pursuit during the darkness, he wrung the water from his dress, and plunging into the moors, directed his course to the northeast by the assistance of the polar star. 
End of chapter 25, part B. Chapter 26, part A of The Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26, part A. Why, what an intricate impeach is this! I think you all have drank of Circe's cup. If here you housed him, here he would have been. If he were mad, he would not plead so coldly. Comedy of Errors the course of our story, leaving for the present Halbert Glendinning to the guidance of his courage and his fortune, returns to the Tower of Glendearg, where matters in the meanwhile fell out, with which it is most fitting that the reader should be acquainted. The meal was prepared at noontide with all the care which Elspeth and Tibb, assisted by the various accommodations which had been supplied from the monastery, could bestow on it. Their dialogue ran on, as usual, in the intervals of their labour, partly as between mistress and servant, partly as maintained by gossips of nearly equal quality. "'Look to the minced meat, Tib," said Elspeth, "'and turn the brooch even, thou good-for-nothing simmy. Thy wits are harrying birds' nests, child. Weel, Tib, this is a fascious job, this Sir Piercy lying leaguer with us up here, and what kens for how lang?' "'A fascious job, indeed,' answered her faithful attendant and little good did the name ever bring to fair Scotland. Ye may have your hands fuller of them than they are yet. Many a sair heart have the Piercies given to Scots' wife and bairns, with their pricking on the borders. There was Hotspur and many more of that bloody kindred, have sate in our skirts since Malcolm's time, as Martin says. Martin should keep a well scrapped tongue in his head, said Elspeth, and not slander the kin of anybody that quarters at Glendearg. For by that Sir Piercy Shafton, is much respected with the holy fathers of the community, and they will make up to us only fashery that we may have with him, either by good word or good deed, I's warrant them. He is a considerate lord, the Lord Abbot. And weel he likes a saft seat to his hinder end, said Tib. I have seen a belted baron sit on a bare bench, and find nay fault. But an ye are pleased, mistress, I am pleased. Now in good time, here comes Mysie of the mill, and where are ye been, lass? For Osgain rang without you, said Elspeth. I just gate a blink up the burn, said Mysie, for the young lady has been down on her bed, and is no just that wheel, so I gate a glyph up the burn. To see the young lads come hame fray the sport, I will warrant you, said Elspeth. Ay, ay, Tib, that's the way the young folk guide us, Tibby, leave us to do the work, and out to the play themselves. "'Ne'er a bit of that, mistress,' said the maid of the mill, stripping her round pretty arms, and looking actively and good-humouredly round for some duty that she could discharge. "'But just—I thought you might like to ken if they were coming back, just to get the dinner forward.' "'And saw ye aught of them, then?' demanded Elspeth. "'Not the least tokening,' said Mysie, though I got to the head of a no, and though the English knight's beautiful white feather could have been seen all over the bushes in the shaw. The knight's white feather, said Dame Glendinning, ye are a silly hempy. My halbert's high head will be seen farther than his feather. Let it be as white as it like, I trow. Mysie made no answer, but began to knead dough for a wastel cake, with all dispatch, observing that Sir Piercy had partaken of that dainty, and commended it upon the preceding day, and presently, in order to place on the fire the girdle or iron plate on which these cakes were to be baked, she displaced a stew-pan in which one of Tibb's delicacies were submitted to the action of the kitchen fire. Tibb muttered betwixt her teeth, "'And it is the broth for my sick bairn that maun make room for the dainty Southron's wastel bread. It was a blithe time in White Wallace's day, or good King Robert's, when the pock puddings gat naething there but hard strakes and bloody crowns, but we will see how it will aw end.' Elspeth did not think it proper to notice these discontented expressions of Tibby, but they sunk into her mind, for she was apt to consider her as a sort of authority in matters of war and policy, with which her former experience as bower-woman at Avenel Castle made her better acquainted than were the peaceful inhabitants of Halidome. She only spoke, however, to express her surprise that the hunters did not return. "'And they come not back the sooner,' said Tib. "'They will fare the war for the meat will be roasted to a cinder, and there is poor Simmy that can turn the spit nay langer. The baron is melting like an icicle in warm water. 
Gang awa, bairn, and take a mouthful of the collar air, and I will turn the brooch till ye come back. Rin up to the bartizan at the tower head, callant, said Dame Glendinning. The air will be collarer there than ony gate else, and bring us word if our halbert and the gentlemen are coming down the glen. The boy lingered long enough to allow his substitute, Tib Tackett, heartily to tire of her own generosity, and of his cricket-stool by the side of a huge fire. He at length returned with the news that he had seen nobody. The matter was not so remarkable as far as Halbert Glendinning was concerned, for, patient alike of want and of fatigue, it was no uncommon circumstance for him to remain in the wilds till curfew time. But nobody had given Sir Piercy Shafton credit for being so keen a sportsman and the idea of an Englishman preferring the chase to his dinner was altogether inconsistent with their preconceptions of the national character. Amidst wondering and conjecturing, the usual dinner hour passed away, and the inmates of the tower, taking a hasty meal themselves, adjourned their more solemn preparations until the hunters return at night, since it seemed now certain that their sport had either carried them to a greater distance, or engaged them for a longer time than had been expected. About four hours after noon arrived not the expected sportsman, but an unlooked-for visitant, the sub-prior from the monastery. The scene of the preceding day had dwelt on the mind of Father Eustace, who was of that keen and penetrating cast of mind which loves not to leave unascertained whatever of mysterious is subjected to its inquiry. His kindness was interested in the family of Glendirg, which he had now known for a long time, and besides, the community was interested in the preservation of the peace betwixt Sir Piercy Shafton and his youthful host, since whatever might draw public attention on the former could not fail to be prejudicial to the monastery which was already threatened by the hand of power. He found the family assembled, all but Mary Avenel, and was informed that Halbert Glendinning had accompanied the stranger on a day's sport. So far was well. They had not returned. But when did youth and sport conceive themselves bound by set hours, and the circumstance excited no alarm in his mind? While he was conversing with Edward Glendinning, touching his progress in the studies he had pointed out to him, they were startled by a shriek from Mary Avenel's apartment, which drew the whole family thither in headlong haste. They found her in a swoon in the arms of old Martin, who was bitterly accusing himself of having killed her. So indeed it seemed, for her pale features and closed eyes argued rather a dead corpse than a living person. The whole family were instantly in tumult. Snatching her from Martin's arms with the eagerness of affectionate terror, Edward bore her to the casement, that she might receive the influence of the open air. The sub-prior, who like many of his profession, had some knowledge of medicine, hastened to prescribe the readiest remedies which occurred to him, and the terrified females contended with and impeded each other in their rival efforts to be useful. "'It has been ane of her weary gastes,' said Dame Glendinning. "'It's just a trembling on her spirits as her blessed mother used to have,' said Tib. "'It's some ill news has come over her,' said the miller's maiden, while burnt feathers, cold water, and all the usual means of restoring suspended animation were employed alternately and with little effect. At length a new assistant, who had joined the group unobserved, tendered his aid in the following terms. "'How is this, my most fair discretion? What cause hath moved the ruby current of life to rush back to the citadel of the heart, leaving pale those features in which it should have delighted to meander for ever? Let me approach her,' he said, with this sovereign essence distilled by the fair hands of the divine Urania, and powerful to recall fugitive life, even if it were trembling on the verge of departure. Thus speaking, Sir Piercy Shafton knelt down, and most gracefully presented to the nostrils of Mary Avenel a silver pouncet-box, exquisitely chaste, containing a sponge dipped in the essence which he recommended so highly. Yes, gentle reader, it was Sir Piercy Shafton himself, who thus unexpectedly proffered his good offices, his cheeks indeed very pale, and some part of his dress stained with blood, but not otherwise appearing different from what he was on the preceding evening. But no sooner had Mary Avenel opened her eyes, and fixed them on the figure of the officious courtier, than she screamed faintly, and exclaimed, "'Secure the murderer!' 
Those present stood aghast with astonishment, and none more so than the Euphuist, who found himself so suddenly and so strangely accused by the patient whom he was endeavouring to succour, and who repelled his attempts to yield her assistance, with all the energy of abhorrence. "'Take him away!' she exclaimed. "'Take away the murderer!' "'Now by my knighthood,' answered Sir Piercy, "'your lovely faculties, either of mind or body, are, O oh my most fair discretion, obnubilated by some strange hallucination. For either your eyes do not discern that it is Piercy Shafton, your most devoted affability, who now stands before you, or else your eyes, discerning truly, your mind hath most erroneously concluded, that he hath been guilty of some delict or violence to which his hand is a stranger. No murder, O oh most scornful discretion, hath been this day done, saving but that which your angry glances are now performing on your most devoted captive." He was here interrupted by the sub-prior, who had, in the meantime, been speaking with Martin apart, and had received from him an account of the circumstances which, suddenly communicated to Mary Avenel, had thrown her into this state. "'Sir Knight,' said the sub-prior, in a very solemn tone, yet with some hesitation, "'circumstances have been communicated to us of a nature so extraordinary that, reluctant as I am to exercise such authority over a guest of our venerable community, I am constrained to request from you an explanation of them. You left this tower early in the morning, accompanied by a youth, Halbert Glendinning, the eldest son of this good dame, and you return hither without him. Where, and at what hour, did you part company from him?" The English knight paused for a moment, and then replied, "'I marvel that your reverence employs so grave a tone to enforce so light a question. I parted with the villagio, whom you call Halbert Glendinning, some hour or twain after sunrise.'" End of chapter 26, part A Chapter 26, Part B of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26, Part B. And at what place, I pray you, said the monk, in a deep ravine, where a fountain rises at the base of a huge rock, an earth-born titan, which heaveth up its grey head, even as spare us farther description, said the sub-prior, we know the spot. But that youth hath not since been heard of, and it will fall on you to account for him." "'My bairn, my bairn!' exclaimed Dame Glendinning. "'Yes, holy father, make the villain account for my bairn. I swear, good woman, by bread and by water, which are the props of our life. Swear by wine and wastel bread, for these are the props of thy life, thou greedy Southron,' said Dame Glendinning a base belly-god to come here to eat the best and practice on our lives that give it to him. "'I tell thee, woman,' said Sir Piercy Shafton, "'I did but go with thy son to the hunting.' "'A black hunting it has been to him, poor bairn,' replied Tib, "'and say I said it wad prove since I first saw the false southron snout of thee. Little good comes of a Piercy's hunting from Chevy Chase till now.' Be silent, woman, said the sub-prior, and rail not upon the English knight. We do not yet know of anything beyond suspicion. We will have his heart's blood, said Dame Glendinning, and seconded by the faithful Tibby, she made such a sudden onslaught on the unlucky Euphuist, as must have terminated in something serious had not the monk, aided by Mysie Happer, interposed to protect him from their fury. Edward had left the apartment the instant the disturbance broke out and now entered, sword in hand, followed by Martin and Jasper, the one having a hunting spear in his hand, the other a crossbow. "'Keep the door,' he said to his two attendants. "'Shoot him or stab him without mercy, should he attempt to break forth. If he offers an escape, by heaven he shall die.' "'How now, Edward?' said the sub-prior. "'How is this that you so far forget yourself? Meditating violence to a guest, and in my presence, who represent your liege lord?' Edward stepped forward with his drawn sword in his hand. "'Pardon me, reverend father,' he said, "'but in this matter the voice of nature speaks louder and stronger than yours. I turn my sword's point against this proud man, and I demand of him the blood of my brother, the blood of my father's son, of the heir of our name. If he denies to give me a true account of him, he shall not deny me vengeance.' Embarrassed as he was, Sir Piercy Shafton showed no personal fear. "'Put up thy sword,' he said, young man 
Not in the same day does Piercy Shafton contend with two peasants. Hear him. He confesses the deed, Holy Father, said Edward. Be patient, my son, said the sub-prior, endeavouring to soothe the feelings which he could not otherwise control. Be patient. Thou wilt attain the ends of justice better through my means than thine own violence. And you, women, be silent. Tib, remove your mistress and marry Avenel. While Tib, with the assistance of the other females of the household, bore the poor mother and Mary Avenel into separate apartments, and while Edward, still keeping his sword in his hand, hastily traversed the room, as if to prevent the possibility of Sir Piercy Shafton's escape, the sub-prior insisted upon knowing from the perplexed knight the particulars which he knew respecting Halbert Glendinning. His situation became extremely embarrassing for what he might with safety have told of the issue of their combat was so revolting to his pride that he could not bring himself to enter into the detail, and of Halbert's actual fate he knew, as the reader is well aware, absolutely nothing. The father, in the meanwhile, pressed him with remonstrances, and prayed him to observe he would greatly prejudice himself by declining to give a full account of the transactions of the day. "'You cannot deny,' he said, "'that yesterday you seemed to take the most violent offence at this unfortunate youth, and that you suppressed your resentment so suddenly as to impress us all with surprise. Last night you proposed to him this day's hunting-party, and you set out together by break of day. You parted, you said, at the fountain near the rock, about an hour or twain after sunrise, and it appears that before you parted you had been at strife together.' "'I said not so,' replied the knight. "'Here is a coil indeed about the absence of a rustical boundsman, who I dare say hath gone off, if he be gone, to join the next rascally band of freebooters. Ye ask me, a knight of the Piercy's lineage, to account for such an insignificant fugitive, and I answer, let me know the price of his head, and I will pay it to your convent treasurer.' "'You admit, then, that you have slain my brother,' said Edward, interfering once more. I will presently show you at what price we Scots rate the lives of our friends. Peace, Edward, peace, I entreat, I command thee, said the sub-prior. And you, Sir Knight, think better of us than to suppose you may spend Scottish blood, and reckon for it as for wine spilt in a drunken revel. This youth was no bondsman, thou well knowest, that in thine own land thou hadst not dared to lift thy sword against the meanest subject of England, but her laws would have called thee to answer for the deed. Do not hope it will be otherwise here, for you will but deceive yourself. "'You drive me beyond my patience,' said the euphuist, even as the overdriven ox is urged into madness. What can I tell you of a young fellow whom I have not seen since the second hour after sunrise? But can you explain in what circumstances you parted with him?' said the monk. "'What are the circumstances in the devil's name which you desire should be explained? For although I protest against this constraint as alike unworthy and inhospitable, yet would I willingly end this fray, provided that by words it may be ended,' said the knight. "'If these end it not,' said Edward, "'blow shall, and that full speedily.' "'Peace, impatient boy,' said the sub-prior. "'And do you, Sir Piercy Shafton, acquaint me why the ground is bloody by the verge of the fountain in Corinan Shion? where, as you say yourself, you parted from Halbert Glendinning. Resolute not to avow his defeat, if possibly he could avoid it, the knight answered in a haughty tone that he supposed it was no unusual thing to find the turf bloody where hunters had slain a deer. "'And did you bury your game as well as kill it?' said the monk. "'We must know from you who is the tenant of that grave, that newly made grave, beside the very fountain whose margin is so deeply crimsoned with blood.' Thou seest thou canst not evade me. Therefore be ingenuous, and tell us the fate of this unhappy youth, whose body is doubtless lying under that bloody turf. If it be, said Sir Piercy, they must have buried him alive. For I swear to thee, reverend father, that this rustic juvenile parted from me in perfect health. Let the grave be searched, and if his body be found, then deal with me as ye list. It is not my sphere to determine thy fate, Sir Knight but that of the Lord Abbot, and the right reverend chapter. It is but my duty to collect such information as may best possess their wisdom with the matters which have chanced. Might I presume so far, reverend father, said the knight, I should wish to know the author and evidence of all these suspicions, so unfoundedly urged against me. It is soon told, said the sub-prior, nor do I wish to disguise it, if it can avail you in your defence. 
This maiden, Mary Avenel, apprehending that you nourished malice against her foster-brother, under a friendly brow, did advisedly send up the old man, Martin Tackett, to follow your footsteps and to prevent mischief, but it seems that your evil passions had outrun precaution, for when he came to the spot, guided by your footsteps upon the dew, he found but the bloody turf and the new-covered grave. And after long and vain search through the wilds after Halbert and yourself, he brought back the sorrowful news to her who had sent him. "'Saw he not my doublet, I pray you,' said Sir Piercy. "'For when I came to myself I found that I was wrapped in my cloak, but without my undergarment, as your reverence may observe.' So saying, he opened his cloak, forgetting, with his characteristical inconsistency, that he showed his shirt stained with blood. "'How cruel, man!' said the monk, when he observed this confirmation of his suspicions. Wilt thou deny the guilt even while thou bearest on thy person the blood thou hast shed? Wilt thou longer deny that thy rash hand has robbed a mother of a son, our community of a vassal, the Queen of Scotland of a liege subject? And what canst thou expect, but that, at the least, we deliver thee up to England, as undeserving our farther protection? By the saints, said the knight, now driven to extremity, if this blood be the witness against me, it is but rebel blood, since this morning at sunrise it flowed within my own veins. How were that possible, Sir Piercy Shafton, said the monk, since I see no wound from whence it can have flowed? That, said the knight, is the most mysterious part of the transaction. See here. So saying, he undid his shirt-collar, and, opening his bosom, showed the spot through which Halbert's sword had passed, but already cicatrized and bearing the appearance of a wound lately healed. "'This exhausts my patience, Sir Knight,' said the sub-prior, "'and is adding insult to violence and injury. Do you hold me for a child or an idiot, that you pretend to make me believe that the fresh blood with which your shirt is stained flowed from a wound which has been healed for weeks or months? Unhappy mocker! Thinkest thou thus to blind us? Too well do we know that it is the blood of your victim, wrestling with you in the desperate and mortal struggle, which has thus died your apparel. The knight, after a moment's recollection, said in reply, I will be open with you, my father. Bid these men stand out of earshot, and I will tell you all I know of this mysterious business. And muse not, good father, though it may pass thy wit to expound it, for I vouch to you it is too dark for mine own. The monk commanded Edward and the two men to withdraw, assuring the former that his conference with the prisoner should be brief and giving him permission to keep watch at the door of the apartment, without which allowance he might perhaps have had some difficulty in procuring his absence. Edward had no sooner left the chamber than he dispatched messengers to one or two families of the Halidome, with whose sons his brother and he sometimes associated, to tell them that Halbert Glendinning had been murdered by an Englishman, and to require them to repair to the Tower of Glendirg without delay. The duty of revenge in such cases was held so sacred that he had no reason to doubt they would instantly come with such assistance as would ensure the detention of the prisoner. He then locked the doors of the tower, both inner and outer, and also the gate of the courtyard. Having taken these precautions, he made a hasty visit to the females of the family, exhausting himself in efforts to console them, and in protestations that he would have vengeance for his murdered brother. End of chapter 26, part B. Chapter 27, part A of The Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27, part A. Now by Our Lady, Sheriff, tis hard reckoning that I, with every odds of birth and barony, should be detained here for the casual death of a wild forester whose utmost having is but the brazen buckle of the belt in which he sticks his hedge-knife. Old Play While Edward was making preparations for securing and punishing the supposed murderer of his brother, with an intense thirst for vengeance, which had not hitherto shown itself as part of his character, Sir Piercy Shafton made such communications as it pleased him to the sub-prior, who listened with great attention though the knight's narrative was none of the clearest, especially as his self-conceit led him to conceal or abridge the details which were necessary to render it intelligible. "'You are to know,' he said, Reverend Father, 
that this rustical juvenile, having chosen to offer me in the presence of your venerable superior, yourself, and other excellent and worthy persons, besides the damsel Mary Avenel, whom I term my discretion in all honour and kindness, a gross insult, rendered yet more intolerable by the time and place, my just resentment did so gain the mastery over my discretion, that I resolved to allow him the privileges of an equal, and to indulge him with the combat. But, Sir Knight, said the sub prior you still leave two matters very obscure. First, why the token he presented to you gave you so much offence, as I with others witnessed, and then again how the youth, whom you then met for the first or at least the second time, knew so much of your history as enabled him so greatly to move you. The knight coloured very deeply. For your first query, he said, most reverend father, we will, if you please, pretermit it as nothing essential to the matter in hand. And for the second, I protest to you that I know as little of his means of knowledge as you do, and that I am well nigh persuaded he deals with Sathanas, of which more anon. Well, sir, in the evening I failed not to veil my purpose with a pleasant brow, as is the custom amongst us martialists, who never display the bloody colours of defiance in our countenance until our hand is armed to fight under them. I amused the fair discretion with some canzonettes and other toys which could not but be ravishing to her inexperienced ears. I arose in the morning and met my antagonist, who, to say the truth, for an inexperienced fellagio, comported himself as stoutly as I could have desired. So, coming to the encounter, reverend sir, I did try his mettle with some half a dozen of downright passes, with any one of which I could have been through his body, only that I was loath to take so fatal an advantage but rather, mixing mercy with my just indignation, studied to inflict upon him some flesh-wound of no very fatal quality. But, sir, in the midst of my clemency, he, being instigated, I think, by the devil, did follow up his first offence with some insult of the same nature. Whereupon, being eager to punish him, I made an estramazon, and my foot slipping at the same time, not from any fault of fence on my part, or any advantage of skill on his, but the devil having, as I said, taken up the matter in hand, and the grass being slippery, ere I recovered my position I encountered his sword, which he had advanced, with my undefended person, so that, as I think, I was in some sort run through the body. My juvenile, being beyond measure appalled at his own unexpected and unmerited success in this strange encounter, takes the flight and leaves me there, and I fall into a dead swoon for the lack of the blood I had lost so foolishly and when I awake, as from a sound sleep, I find myself lying, and, like you, wrapped up in my cloak at the foot of one of the birch-trees which stand together in a clump near to this place. I feel my limbs and experience little pain, but much weakness. I put my hand to the wound. It was whole and skinned over as you now see it. I rise and come hither, and in these words you have my whole day's story. I can only reply to so strange a tale, answered the monk that it is scarce possible that Sir Piercy Shafton can expect me to credit it. Here is a quarrel, the cause of which you conceal, a wound received in the morning of which there is no recent appearance at sunset, a grave filled up in which no body is deposited, the vanquished found alive and well, the victor departed no man knows whither. These things, Sir Knight, hang not so well together that I should receive them as gospel. Reverend Father, answered Sir Piercy Shafton, I pray you in the first place to observe that if I offer peaceful and civil justification of that which I have already averred to be true, I do so only in devout deference to your dress and to your order, protesting that to any other opposite, saving a man of religion, a lady or my liege prince, I would not deign to support that which I had once attested, otherwise than with the point of my good sword. And so much being premised, I have to add that I can but gauge my honour as a gentleman, and my faith as a Catholic Christian that the things which I have described to you have happened to me as I have described them, and not otherwise. It is a deep assertion, Sir Knight, answered the sub-prior, yet, bethink you, it is only an assertion, and that no reason can be alleged why things should be believed which are so contrary to reason. Let me pray you to say whether the grave which has been seen at your place of combat was open or closed when your encounter took place. Reverend Father, said the knight, I will veil from you nothing, but show you each secret of my bosom, 
even as the pure fountain revealeth the smallest pebble which graces the sand at the bottom of its crystal mirror, and as, Speak in plain terms, for the love of heaven, said the monk. These holiday phrases belong not to solemn affairs. Was the grave open when the conflict began? It was, answered the knight, I acknowledge it, even as he that acknowledgeth. Nay, I pray you, fair son, forbear these similitudes, and observe me. On yesterday at even no grave was found in that place for old Martin chanced, contrary to his wont, to go thither in quest of a strayed sheep. At break of day, by your own confession, a grave was opened in that spot, and there a combat was fought. Only one of the combatants appears, and he is covered with blood, and to all appearance woundless. Here the knight made a gesture of impatience. Nay, fair son, hear me but one moment. The grave is closed and covered by the sod. What can we believe? but that it conceals the bloody corpse of the fallen duellist. "'By heaven it cannot,' said the knight, "'unless the juvenile hath slain himself and buried himself, in order to place me in the predicament of his murderer. The grave shall doubtless be explored, and that by to-morrow's dawn,' said the monk, "'I will see it done with mine own eyes.' "'But,' said the prisoner, "'I protest against all evidence which may arise from its contents.' and do insist beforehand that whatever may be found in that grave shall not prejudice me in my defence. I have been so haunted by diabolical deceptions in this matter, that what do I know but that the devil may assume the form of this rustical juvenile, in order to procure me farther vexation? I protest to you, Holy Father. It is my very thought that there is witchcraft in all that hath befallen me. Since I entered into this northern land, in which men say that sorceries do abound, I, who am held in awe and regard even by the prime gallants in the court of Feliciana, have been here bearded and taunted by a clod-treading clown. I, whom Vincencio Saviola termed his nimblest and most agile disciple, was, to speak briefly, foiled by a cowboy, who knew no more offence than is used at every country wake. I am run, as it seemed to me, through the body, with a very sufficient stoccata, and faint on the spot and yet when I recover I find myself without either whem or wound, and lacking nothing of my apparel, saving my murray-coloured doublet, slashed with satin, which I will pray may be inquired after, lest the devil who transported me should have dropped it in his passage among some of the trees or bushes, it being a choice and most fanciful piece of raiment, which I wore for the first time at the Queen's pageant in Southwark. Sir Knight, said the monk, you do again go astray from this matter. I inquire of you respecting that which concerns the life of another man, and it may be touches your own also, and you answer me with the tale of an old doublet. Old! exclaimed the knight. Now by the gods and saints, if there be a gallant at the British court more fancifully considerate, and more considerately fanciful, but quaintly curious, and more curiously quaint, in frequent changes of all rich articles of vesture, becoming one who may be accounted point de vis, a courtier, I will give you leave to term me a slave and a liar. The monk thought, but did not say, that he had already acquired right to doubt the veracity of the Euphuist, considering the marvellous tale which he had told. Yet his own strange adventure, and that of Father Philip, rushed on his mind, and forbade his coming to any conclusion. He contented himself, therefore, with observing that these were certainly strange incidents, and requested to know if Sir Piercy Shafton had any other reason for suspecting himself to be in a manner so particularly selected for the sport of sorcery and witchcraft. Sir Sub Prior, said the Euphuist, the most extraordinary circumstance remains behind, which alone, had I neither been bearded in dispute, nor foiled in combat, nor wounded and cured in the space of a few hours, would nevertheless of itself, and without any other corroborative, have compelled me to believe myself the subject of some malevolent fascination. Reverend Sir, it is not to your ears that men should tell tales of love and gallantry, nor is Sir Piercy Shafton one who, to any ears whatsoever, is wont to boast of his fair acceptance with the choice and prime beauties of the court, insomuch that a lady, none of the least resplendent constellations which revolve in that hemisphere of honour, pleasure, and beauty, but whose name I here preterm it, was wont to call me her taciturnity. Nevertheless, truth must be spoken, and I cannot but allow, as the general report of the court, 
allowed in camps, and echoed back by city and country, that in the alacrity of the accost, the tender delicacy of the regard, the facetiousness of the address, the adopting and pursuing of the fancy, the solemn close and the graceful fall-off, Piercy Shafton was accounted the only gallant of the time, and so well accepted among the choicer beauties of the age, that no silk-hosed reveller of the presence chamber, or plumed jouster of the tilt-yard, approached him by a bow's length in the lady's regard, being the mark at which every well-born and generous juvenile aimeth his shaft. Nevertheless, reverend sir, having found in this rude place something which by blood and birth might be termed a lady, and being desirous to keep my gallant humour in exercise, as well as to show my sworn devotion to the sex in general, I did shoot off some arrows of compliment at this Mary Avenel, terming her my discretion, with other quaint and well-imagined courtesies, rather bestowed out of my bounty than warranted by her merit, or perchance like unto the boyish fowler, who rather than not exercise his bird-piece will shoot at crows or magpies for lack of better game. "'Mary Avenel is much obliged by your notice,' answered the monk. "'But to what does all this detail of past and present gallantry conduct us?' "'Mary, to this conclusion,' answered the knight, "'that either this my discretion or I myself am little less than bewitched, for instead of receiving my accost with gratifying bow, answering my regard with a suppressed smile, accompanying my falling off or departure with a slight sigh, honours with which I protest to you the noblest dancers and proudest beauties in Feliciana have graced my poor services. She hath paid me as little and as cold regard as if I had been some hobnailed clown of these bleak mountains. Nay, this very day, while I was in the act of kneeling at her feet to render her the succours of this pungent quintessence, a purest spirit distilled by the fairest hands of the court of Feliciana, she pushed me from her with looks which savoured of repugnance and, as I think, thrust at me with her foot as if to spurn me from her presence. These things, reverend father, are strange, portentous, unnatural, and befall not in the current of mortal affairs, but are symptomatic of sorcery and fascination, so that having given to your reverence a perfect, simple, and plain account of all that I know concerning this matter, I leave it to your wisdom to solve what may be found soluble in the same. It being my purpose to-morrow, with the peep of dawn, to set forward towards Edinburgh. I grieve to be an interruption to your designs, Sir Knight, said the monk, but that purpose of thine may hardly be fulfilled. How, reverend father, said the knight, with an air of the utmost surprise, if what you say respects my departure, understand that it must be, for I have so resolved it. Sir Knight, reiterated the sub-prior, I must once more repeat, this cannot be until the abbot's pleasure be known in the matter. "'Reverend sir,' said the knight, drawing himself up with great dignity, "'I desire my hearty and thankful commendations to the abbot. But in this matter I have nothing to do with his reverend pleasure, designing only to consult my own.' "'Pardon me,' said the sub-prior. "'The Lord Abbot hath in this matter a voice potential.' Sir Piercy Shafton's colour began to rise. "'I marvel,' he said, "'to hear your reverence talk thus. What? Will you, for the imagined death of a rude, low-born frampler and wrangler, venture to impinge upon the liberty of the kinsmen of the house of Piercy? Sir Knight, returned the sub-prior civilly, your high lineage and your kindling anger will avail you nothing in this matter. You shall not come here to seek a shelter, and then spill our blood as if it were water. I tell you, said the knight, once more, as I have told you already, that there was no blood spilled but mine own. That remains to be proved, replied the sub-prior. We of the community of St. Mary's of Kennaquare use not to take fairy tales in exchange for the lives of our liege vassals. We of the house of Piercy, answered Shafton, brook neither threats nor restraint. I say I will travel to-morrow, happen what may. And I, answered the sub-prior in the same tone of determination, say that I will break your journey, come what may. "'Who shall gainsay me?' said the knight, "'if I make my way by force.' "'You will judge wisely to think ere you make such an attempt,' answered the monk, with composure. "'There are men enough in the Halidome to vindicate its rights over those who dare infringe them. "'My cousin of Northumberland will know how to revenge this usage to a beloved kinsman so near to his blood,' said the Englishman. 
the Lord Abbot will know how to protect the rights of his territory, both with the temporal and the spiritual sword, said the monk. Besides, consider, were we to send you to your kinsman at Alnwick or Workworth to-morrow, he dare do nothing but transmit you in fetters to the Queen of England. Bethink, Sir Knight, that you stand on slippery ground, and will act most wisely in reconciling yourself to be a prisoner in this place, until the abbot shall decide the matter. There are armed men enow to countervail all your efforts at escape. Let patience and resignation, therefore, arm you to a necessary submission." So saying, he clapped his hands, and called aloud. Edward entered, accompanied by two young men, who had already joined him, and were well armed. Edward, said the sub-prior, you will supply the English knight here, in this spence, with suitable food and accommodation for the night, treating him with as much kindness as if nothing had happened between you. But you will place a sufficient guard, and look carefully that he make not his escape. Should he attempt to break forth, resist him to the death, but in no other case harm a hair of his head, as you shall be answerable. Edward Glendinning replied, that I may obey your commands, reverend sir, I will not again offer myself to this person's presence. For shame it were to me to break the peace of the Halidome. But not less shame to leave my brother's death unavenged. End of chapter 27 Part A Chapter 27 Part B of The Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven, Part B. As he spoke, his lips grew livid, the blood forsook his cheek, and he was about to leave the apartment, when the sub prior recalled him and said in a solemn tone, Edward, I have known you from infancy. I have done what lay within my reach to be of use to you. I say nothing of what you owe me as the representative of your spiritual superior. I say nothing of the duty from the vassal to the sub-prior, but Father Eustace expects from the pupil whom he has nurtured, he expects from Edward Glendinning, that he will not by any deed of sudden violence, however justified in his own mind by the provocation, break through the respect due to public justice, or that which he has an especial right to claim from him. Fear nothing, my reverend father, for so in an hundred senses may I well term you, said the young man, fear not. Fear not, I would say, that I will in any thing diminish the respect I owe to the venerable community by whom we have so long been protected, far less that I will do aught which can be personally less than respectful to you. But the blood of my brother must not cry for vengeance in vain. Your reverence knows our border creed. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will requite it, answered the monk. The heathenish custom of deadly feud which prevails in this land, through which each man seeks vengeance at his own hand when the death of a friend or kinsman has chanced, hath already deluged our veils with the blood of Scottish men, spilled by the hands of countrymen and kindred. It were endless to count up the fatal results. On the eastern border the homes are at feud with the Swintons and Cockburns. In our middle marches, the Scots and Kerrs have spilled as much brave blood in domestic feud as might have fought a pitched field in England, could they have but forgiven and forgotten a casual re-encounter that placed their names in opposition to each other. On the west frontier the Johnstones are at war with the Maxwells, the Jardines with the Bells, drawing with them the flower of the country which should place their breasts as a bulwark against England into private and bloody warfare of which it is the only end to waste and impair the forces of the country, already divided in itself. Do not, my dear son Edward, permit this bloody prejudice to master your mind. I cannot ask you to think of the crime supposed as if the blood spilled had been less dear to you. Alas, I know that is impossible. But I do require you, in proportion to your interest in the supposed sufferer, for as yet the whole is matter of supposition to bear on your mind the evidence on which the guilt of the accused person must be tried. He hath spoken with me, and I confess his tale is so extraordinary that I should have, without a moment's hesitation, rejected it as incredible. But that an affair which chanced to myself in this very glen, more of that another time. 
Suffice it for the present to say that from what I have myself experienced, I deem it possible that, extraordinary as Sir Piercy Shafton's story may seem, I hold it not utterly impossible. Father, said Edward Glendinning, when he saw that his preceptor paused, unwilling farther to explain upon what grounds he was inclined to give a certain degree of credit to Sir Piercy Shafton's story, while he admitted it as improbable. Father, to me you have been in every sense. You know that my hand grasped more readily to the book than to the sword, and that I lacked utterly the ready and bold spirit which distinguished— Here his voice faltered, and he paused for a moment, and then went on with resolution and rapidity. I would say that I was unequal to Halbert in promptitude of heart and of hand. But Halbert is gone, and I stand his representative, and that of my father, his successor in all his rights. While he said this his eyes shot fire, and bound to assert and maintain them as he would have done. Therefore I am a changed man, increased in courage as in my rights and pretensions. And, reverend father, respectfully but plainly and firmly do I say, his blood, if it has been shed by this man, shall be atoned. Halbert shall not sleep neglected in his lonely grave. As if with him the spirit of my father had ceased for ever. His blood flows in my veins and while his has been poured forth unrequited, mine will permit me no rest. My poverty and meanness of rank shall not avail the lordly murderer. My calm nature and peaceful studies shall not be his protection. Even the obligations, holy father, which I acknowledge to you, shall not be his protection. I wait with patience the judgment of the abbot and chapter for the slaughter of one of their most anciently descended vassals. If they do right to my brother's memory, it is well." But mark me, father, if they shall fail in rendering me that justice. I bear a heart and a hand which, though I love not such extremities, are capable of remedying such an error. He who takes up my brother's succession must avenge his death. The monk perceived with surprise that Edward, with his extreme diffidence, humility, and obedient assiduity, for such were his general characteristics, had still boiling in his veins the wild principles of those from whom he was descended and by whom he was surrounded. His eyes sparkled, his frame was agitated, and the extremity of his desire for vengeance seemed to give a vehemence to his manner resembling the restlessness of joy. "'May God help us,' said Father Eustace, "'for frail wretches as we are, we cannot help ourselves under sudden and strong temptation. Edward, I will rely on your word that you do nothing rashly.' "'That will I not,' said Edward that, my better than father, I surely will not. But the blood of my brother, the tears of my mother, and, and, and of Mary Avenel, shall not be shed in vain. I will not deceive you, father. If this Piercy Shafton hath slain my brother, he dies, if the whole blood of the whole house of Piercy were in his veins. There was a deep and solemn determination in the utterance of Edward Glendinning, expressive of a rooted resolution. The sub-prior sighed deeply, and for a moment yielded to circumstances, and urged the acquiescence of his pupil no farther. He commanded lights to be placed in the lower chamber, which for a time he paced in silence. A thousand ideas, and even differing principles, debated with each other in his bosom. He greatly doubted the English knight's account of the duel, and of what had followed it. Yet the extraordinary and supernatural circumstances— which had befallen the sacristan and himself in that very glen, prevented him from being absolutely incredulous on the score of the wonderful wound and recovery of Sir Piercy Shafton, and prevented him from at once condemning as impossible that which was altogether improbable. Then he was at a loss how to control the fraternal affections of Edward, with respect to whom he felt something like the keeper of a wild animal, a lion's whelp or a tiger's cub, which he has held under his command from infancy, but which, when grown to maturity, on some sudden provocation, displays his fangs and talons, erects his crest, resumes his savage nature, and bids defiance at once to his keeper and to all mankind. How to restrain and mitigate an ire, which the universal example of the times rendered deadly and inveterate, was sufficient cause of anxiety to Father Eustace but he had also to consider the situation of his community, dishonoured 
and degraded by submitting to suffer the slaughter of a vassal to pass unavenged. A circumstance which of itself might in those times have afforded pretext for a revolt among their wavering adherents, or, on the other hand, exposed the community to imminent danger, should they proceed against a subject of England of high degree, connected with the House of Northumberland, and other northern families of high rank, who, as they possessed the means, could not be supposed to lack inclination to wreak upon the patrimony of St. Mary of Kennequare any violence which might be offered to their kinsmen. In either case the sub-prior well knew that the ostensible cause of feud, insurrection, or incursion being once afforded, the case would not be ruled either by reason or by evidence, and he groaned in spirit when, upon counting up the chances which arose in this ambiguous dilemma, he found he had only a choice of difficulties. He was a monk, but he felt also as a man, indignant at the supposed slaughter of young Glendinning by one skilful in all the practice of arms, in which the vassal of the monastery was most likely to be deficient, and to aid the resentment which he felt for the loss of a youth whom he had known from infancy, came in full force the sense of dishonour arising to his community from passing over so gross an insult unavenged. Then the light in which it might be viewed by those who at present presided in the stormy court of Scotland, attached as they were to the Reformation, and allied by common faith and common interest with Queen Elizabeth, was a formidable subject of apprehension. The sub-prior well knew how they lusted after the revenues of the Church, to express it in the ordinary phrase of the religious of the time, and how readily they would grasp at such a pretext for encroaching on those of St. Mary's, as would be afforded by the suffering to pass unpunished the death of a native Scottishman by a Catholic Englishman, a rebel to Queen Elizabeth. On the other hand, to deliver up to England, or, which was nearly the same thing, the Scottish administration, an English knight leagued with the Piercy by kindred and political intrigue, a faithful follower of the Catholic Church who had fled to the Halidome for protection, was, in the estimation of the sub-prior, an act most unworthy in itself, and meriting the malediction of heaven, besides being, moreover, fraught with great temporal risk. If the government of Scotland was now almost entirely in the hands of the Protestant party, the Queen was still a Catholic, and there was no knowing when, amid the sudden changes which agitated that tumultuous country, she might find herself at the head of her own affairs, and able to protect those of her own faith. Then, if the Court of England and its Queen were zealously Protestant, the northern counties, whose friendship or enmity were of most consequence in the first instance to the community of St. Mary's, contained many Catholics, the heads of whom were able, and must be supposed willing, to avenge any injury suffered by Sir Piercy Shafton. On either side the sub-prior, thinking according to his sense of duty most anxiously for the safety and welfare of his monastery, saw the greatest risk of damage, blame, inroad, and confiscation. The only course on which he could determine was to stand by the helm like a resolute pilot, watch every contingence, do his best to weather each reef and shoal, and commit the rest to heaven and his patroness. As he left the apartment, the knight called after him, beseeching he would order his trunk-mails to be sent into his apartment, understanding he was to be guarded there for the night, as he wished to make some alteration in his apparel. Footnote. Sir Piercy Shafton's extreme love of dress was an attribute of the coxcombs of this period. The display made by their forefathers was in the numbers of their retinue, but as the actual influence of the nobility began to be restrained both in France and England by the increasing power of the crown, the indulgence of vanity in personal display became more inordinate. There are many allusions to this change of custom in Shakespeare and other dramatic writers where the reader may find mention of bonds entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day. Johnson informs us that for the first entrance of a gallant, twere good you turned four or five hundred acres of your best land into two or three trunks of apparel. Every man out of his humor. In the memory of the Somerville family a curious instance occurs of this fashionable species of extravagance. In the year 1537, when James V brought over his short-lived bride from France, 
The Lord Somerville of the day was so profuse in the expense of his apparel, that the money which he borrowed on the occasion was compensated by a perpetual annuity of threescore pounds Scottish, payable out of the barony of Carnworth till doomsday, which was assigned by the creditor to St. Magdalen's Chapel. By this deep expense the Lord Somerville had rendered to himself so glorious in apparel, that the king, who saw so brave a gallant enter the gate of Holyrood, followed by only two pages, called upon several of the courtiers to ascertain who it could be who was so richly dressed and so slightly attended. And he was not recognized until he entered the presence-chamber. "'You are very brave, my lord,' said the king, as he received his homage. "'But where are all your men and attendants?' The Lord Somerville readily answered, "'If it please your majesty, here they are,' pointing to the lace that was on his own and his page's clothes. Whereat the king laughed heartily, and having surveyed the finery more nearly, bade him have away with it all, and let him have his stout band of spears again. There is a scene in Johnson's Every Man Out of His Humour, Act Four, Scene Six, in which a euphuist of the time gives an account of the effects of a duel on the clothes of himself and his opponent, and never departs a syllable from the catalogue of his wardrobe. We shall insert it in evidence that the foppery of our ancestors was not inferior to that of our own time. Fastidious. Good faith, Signor. Now you speak of a quarrel, I'll acquaint you with a difference that happened between a gallant and myself, Sir Pontavolo. You know him if I should name him, Signor Lucolento. Pontavolo. Lucolento, what inauspicious chance interposed itself to your two lives? Fastidious. Faith, sir the same that sundered Agamemnon, and great Thetis's son. But let the cause escape, sir. He sent me a challenge, mixed with some few braves, which I restored, and in fine we met. Now indeed, sir, I must tell you, he did offer at first very desperately, but without judgment. For look you, sir, I cast myself into this figure. Now he came violently on, and withal advancing his rapier to strike, I thought to have took his arm, for he had left his body to my election, and I was sure he could not recover his guard. Sir, I missed my purpose in his arm, rashed his doublet sleeves, ran him close by the left cheek and through his hair. He again liked me here. I had on a gold cable hat-band, then new come up, about a Murray French hat I had. Cuts my hat-band, and yet it was massy goldsmith's work, cuts my brim which by good fortune being thick embroidered with gold twist and spangles, disappointed the force of the blow. Nevertheless it grazed on my shoulder, takes me away six pearls of an Italian cutwork band I wore, cost me three pounds in the exchange but three days before. Puntervolo, this was a strange encounter. Fastidious. Nay, you shall hear, sir. With this we both fell out and breathed. Now upon the second sign of his assault I betook me to my former manner of defence. He, on the other side, abandoned his body to the same danger as before, and follows me still with blows. But I, being loath to take the deadly advantage that lay before me of his left side, made a kind of stramazon, ran him up to the hilt, through the doublet, through the shirt, and yet missed the skin. He, making a reverse blow, falls upon my embossed girdle. I had thrown off the hangers a little before, strikes off a skirt of a thick-laced satin doublet I had, lined with four taffetas, cuts off two panes embroidered with pearl, rends through the drawings out of tissue, enters the linings, and spicks the flesh. Car, I wonder he speaks not of his wrought shirt. Fastidious. Here, in the opinion of mutual damage, we paused. But ere I proceed, I must tell you, Signor, that in the last encounter, not having leisure to put off my silver spurs, one of the rowels catched hold of the ruffles of my boot, and being Spanish leather and subject to tear, overthrows me, rends me two pair of silk stockings that I put on, being somewhat of a raw morning, a peach colour and another, and strikes me some half-inch deep into the side of the calf. He, seeing the blood come, presently takes horse and away, I having bound up my wound with a piece of my wrought shirt. Car. Oh, comes it in there. Fastidious. Ride after him, 
and lighting at the court gate both together, embraced and marched hand in hand up to the presence. Was not this business well carried? Macy. Well, yes, and by this we can guess what apparel the gentleman wore. Puntervolo. For valor. It was a designment begun with much resolution, maintained with as much prowess, and ended with more humanity. End footnote. Ay, ay, said the monk, muttering as he went up the winding stair, carry him his trumpery with all dispatch. Alas, that man with so many noble objects of pursuit will amuse himself like a jackanape, with a laced jerkin and a cap and bells. I must now to the melancholy work of consoling that which is well-nigh inconsolable, a mother weeping for her first-born. Advancing, after a gentle knock, into the apartment of the women, he found that Mary Avenel had retired to bed, extremely indisposed, and that Dame Glendinning and Tibb were indulging their sorrows by the side of a decaying fire, and by the light of a small iron lamp, or cruise, as it was termed. Poor Elspeth's apron was thrown over her head, and bitterly did she sob and weep, for her beautiful, her brave, the very image of her dear Simon Glendinning, the stay of her widowhood, and the support of her old age. The faithful Tib echoed her complaints, and more violently clamorous made deep promises of revenge on Sir Piercy Shafton. If there were a man left in the South who could draw a winger, or a woman that could throw a rape, the presence of the sub-prior imposed silence on these clamors. He sate down by the unfortunate mother, and essayed by such topics as his religion and reason suggested, to interpret the current of Dame Glendinning's feeling. But the attempt was in vain. She listened, indeed, with some little interest, while he pledged his word and his influence with the abbot, that the family which had lost their eldest-born by means of a guest received at his command, should experience particular protection at the hands of the community and that the fief which belonged to Simon Glendinning should, with extended bounds and added privileges, be conferred on Edward. But it was only for a very brief space that the mother's sobs were apparently softer, and her grief more mild. She soon blamed herself for casting a moment's thought upon world's gear while poor Halbert was lying stretched in his bloody shirt. The sub-prior was not more fortunate when he promised that Halbert's body should be removed to hallowed ground and his soul secured by the prayers of the church in his behalf. Grief would have its natural course, and the voice of the Comforter was wasted in vain. End of chapter 27 Part B Chapter 28 Part A of The Monastery by Walter Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Part A he is at liberty, I have ventured for him. If the law find and condemn me for it, some living wenches, some honest-hearted maids, will sing my dirge, and tell to memory my death was noble, dying almost a martyr. THE TWO NOBLE KINSMEN The sub-prior of St. Mary's, in taking his departure from the spence which Sir Piercy Shafton was confined, and in which some preparations were made for his passing the night as the room which might be most conveniently guarded, left more than one perplexed person behind him. There was connected with this chamber, and opening into it, a small outshot or projecting part of the building, occupied by a sleeping apartment, which upon ordinary occasions was that of Mary Avenel, and which in the unusual number of guests who had come to the tower on the former evening had also accommodated Mysie Happer, the miller's daughter. For anciently, as well as in the present day, a Scottish house was always rather too narrow and limited for the extent of the owner's hospitality, and some shift and contrivance was necessary upon any unusual occasion to ensure the accommodation of all the guests. The fatal news of Halbert Glendinning's death had thrown all former arrangements into confusion. Mary Avenel, whose case required immediate attention, had been transported into the apartment hitherto occupied by Halbert and his brother, as the latter proposed to watch all night in order to prevent the escape of the prisoner. Poor Mysie had been altogether overlooked, and had naturally enough betaken herself to the little apartment which she had hitherto occupied, ignorant that the Spence, through which lay the only access to it, was to be the sleeping-chamber of Sir Piercy Shafton. 
The measures taken for securing him there had been so sudden that she was not aware of it, until she found that the other females had been removed from the Spence, by the sub-prior's direction, and having once missed the opportunity of retreating along with them, bashfulness and the high respect which she was taught to bear to the monks prevented her venturing forth alone, and intruding herself on the presence of Father Eustace, while in secret conference with the Southron. There appeared no remedy but to wait till their interview was over, and as the door was thin, and did not shut very closely, she could hear every word that passed betwixt them. It thus happened that without any intended intrusion on her part she became privy to the whole conversation of the sub-prior and the English knight, and could also observe from the window of her little retreat that more than one of the young men summoned by Edward arrived successively at the tower. These circumstances led her to entertain most serious apprehension that the life of Sir Piercy Shafton was in great and instant peril. Woman is naturally compassionate, and not less willingly so, when youth and fair features are on the side of him who claims her sympathy. The handsome presence, elaborate dress, and address of Sir Piercy Shafton, which had failed to make any favourable impression on the grave and lofty character of Mary Avenel, had completely dazzled and bewildered the poor maid of the mill. The knight had perceived this result, and, flattered by seeing that his merit was not universally underrated, he had bestowed on Mysie a good deal more of his courtesy than, in his opinion, her rank warranted. It was not cast away, but received with a devout sense of his condescension, and with gratitude for his personal notice, which, joined to her fears for his safety, and the natural tenderness of her disposition, began to make wild work in her heart. To be sure, it was very wrong in him to slay Halbert Glendinning, it was thus she argued the case with herself, but then he was a gentleman born, and a soldier, and so gentle and courteous withal, that she was sure the quarrel had been all of young Glendinning's own seeking, for it was well known that both these lads were so taken up with that Mary Avenel, that they never looked at another lass in the Halidome, more than if they were of a different degree. And then Halbert's dress was as clownish as his manners were haughty, and this poor young gentleman, who was habited like any prince, banished from his own land, was first drawn into a quarrel by a rude brangler, and then persecuted and like to be put to death by his kin and allies. Mysie wept bitterly at the thought and then her heart rising against such cruelty and oppression to a defenceless stranger, who dressed with so much skill and spoke with so much grace, she began to consider whether she should not render him some assistance in this extremity. Her mind was now entirely altered from its original purpose. At first her only anxiety had been to find the means of escaping from the interior apartment, without being noticed by any one but now she began to think that heaven had placed her there for the safety and protection of the persecuted stranger. She was of a simple and affectionate, but at the same time an alert and enterprising character, possessing more than female strength of body, and more than female courage, though with feelings as capable of being bewildered with gallantry of dress and language as a fine gentleman of any generation would have desired to exercise his talents upon. I will save him, she thought. That is the first thing to be resolved. And then I wonder what he will say to the poor miller's maiden, that has done for him what all the dainty dames in London, or Holyrood, would have been afraid to venture upon. Prudence began to pull her sleeve as she indulged speculations so hazardous, and hinted to her that the warmer Sir Piercy Shafton's gratitude might prove it was the more likely to be fraught with danger to his benefactress. Alas, poor Prudence! thou mayest say with our moral teacher, I preach for ever, but I preach in vain. The miller's maiden, while you pour your warning into her unwilling bosom, has glanced her eye on the small mirror by which she has placed her little lamp, and it returns to her a countenance and eyes, pretty and sparkling at all times, but ennobled at present with the energy of expression proper to those who have dared to form, and stand prepared to execute, deeds of generous audacity. Will these features, will these eyes, joined to the benefit I am about to confer upon Sir Piercy Shafton, do nothing towards removing the distance of rank between us? Such was the question which female vanity asked of fancy, 
and though even fancy dared not answer in a ready affirmative, a middle conclusion was adopted. Let me first succour the gallant youth, and trust to fortune for the rest. Banishing, therefore, from her mind everything that was personal to herself, the rash but generous girl turned her whole thoughts to the means of executing this enterprise. The difficulties which interposed were of no ordinary nature. The vengeance of the men of that country, in cases of deadly feud, that is, in cases of a quarrel excited by the slaughter of any of their relations, was one of their most marked characteristics, and Edward, however gentle in other respects, was so fond of his brother, that there could be no doubt that he would be as signal in his revenge as the customs of the country authorized. There were to be passed the inner door of the apartment, the two gates of the tower itself, and the gate of the courtyard, ere the prisoner was at liberty and then a guide and means of flight were to be provided, otherwise ultimate escape was impossible. But where the will of woman is strongly bent on the accomplishment of such a purpose, her wit is seldom baffled by difficulties, however embarrassing. The sub-prior had not long left the apartment ere Mysie had devised a scheme for Sir Piercy Shafton's freedom, daring indeed but likely to be successful if dexterously conducted. It was necessary, however, that she should remain where she was till so late an hour that all in the tower should have betaken themselves to repose, excepting those whose duty made them watchers. The interval she employed in observing the movements of the person in whose service she was thus boldly a volunteer. She could hear Sir Piercy Shafton pace the floor to and fro, in reflection doubtless on his own untoward fate and precarious situation. By and by she heard him making a rustling among his trunks, which, agreeable to the order of the sub-prior, had been placed in the apartment to which he was confined, and which he was probably amusing more melancholy thoughts by examining and arranging. Then she could hear him resume his walk through the room, and, as if his spirits had been somewhat relieved and elevated by the survey of his wardrobe, she could distinguish that at one turn he half recited a sonnet, at another half whistled a galliard and at the third hummed a saraband. At length she could understand that he extended himself on the temporary couch which had been allotted to him, after muttering his prayers hastily, and in a short time she concluded he must be fast asleep. She employed the moment which intervened in considering her enterprise under every different aspect, and dangerous as it was, the steady review which she took of the various perils accompanying her purpose furnished her with plausible devices for obviating them. Love and generous compassion, which give singly such powerful impulse to the female heart, were in this case united, and championed her to the last extremity of hazard. It was an hour past midnight. All in the tower slept sound but those who had undertaken to guard the English prisoner. Or, if sorrow and suffering drove sleep from the bed of Dame Glendinning and her foster-daughter, they were too much wrapped in their own griefs to attend to external sounds. The means of striking light were at hand in the small apartment, and thus the miller's maid was enabled to light and trim a small lamp. With a trembling step and throbbing heart, she undid the door which separated her from the apartment in which the southern knight was confined, and almost flinched from her fixed purpose when she found herself in the same room with the sleeping prisoner. She scarcely trusted herself to look upon him, as he lay wrapped in his cloak, and fast asleep upon the pallet-bed, but turned her eyes away while she gently pulled his mantle with no more force than was just equal to awaken him. He moved not until she had twitched his cloak a second and a third time, and then at length, looking up, was about to make an exclamation in the suddenness of his surprise. Mysie's bashfulness was conquered by her fear. She placed her fingers on her lips, in token that he must observe the most strict silence, and then pointed to the door to intimate that it was watched. Sir Piercy Shafton now collected himself, and sat upright on his couch. He gazed with surprise on the graceful figure of the young woman who stood before him. Her well-formed person, her flowing hair, and the outline of her features, showed dimly, and yet to advantage, by the partial and feeble light which she held in her hand. The romantic imagination of the gallant would soon have coined some compliment proper for the occasion, but Mysie left him not time. End of chapter 28, part A Chapter 28 
Part B of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight. Part B. I come, she said, to save your life, which is else in great peril. If you answer me, speak as low as you can, for they have sentineled your door with armed men. Comeliest of Miller's daughters, answered Sir Piercy, who by this time was sitting upright on his couch, dread nothing for my safety. Credit me that, as in very truth I have not spilled the red puddle, which these villagios call the blood, of their most uncivil relation, so I am under no apprehension whatever for the issue of this restraint, seeing that it cannot but be harmless to me. Natheless, to thee, O most Melendinar beauty, I return the thanks which thy courtesy may justly claim. "'Nay, but Sir Knight,' answered the maiden, in a whisper as low as it was tremulous, "'I deserve no thanks unless you will act by my counsel. Edward Glendinning hath sent for Dan of the Howlethurst, and young Aidy of Akenshaw, and they are come with three men more, and with bow, and jack, and spear, and I heard them say to each other, and to Edward, as they alighted in the court, that they would have amends for the death of their kinsmen, if the monk's cowl should smoke for it. And the vassals are so willful now, that the abbot himself dare not control them, for fear they turn heretics, and refuse to pay their few duties. "'In faith,' said Sir Piercy Shafton, "'it may be a shrewd temptation, and perchance the monks may rid themselves of trouble and cumber by handing me over the march to Sir John Foster, or Lord Hunson, the English wardens, and so make peace with their vassals and with England at once. Fairest Molinara, I will for once walk by thy reed, and if thou dost contrive to extricate me from this vile kennel, I will so celebrate thy wit and beauty, that the baker's nymph of Raphael d'Urbino shall seem but a gypsy in comparison of my Molinara. I pray you, then, be silent, said the miller's daughter for if your speech betrays that you are awake my scheme fails utterly and it is heaven's mercy and our ladies that we are not already overheard and discovered i am silent replied the southern even as the starless night but yet if this contrivance of thine should endanger thy safety fair and no less kind than fair damsel it were utterly unworthy of me to accept it at thy hand do not think of me said mysie hastily i am safe I will take thought for myself, if I once saw you out of this dangerous dwelling. If you would provide yourself with any part of your apparel or goods, lose no time." The knight did, however, lose some time, ere he could settle in his own mind what to take and what to abandon of his wardrobe, each article of which seemed endeared to him by recollection of the feasts and revels at which it had been exhibited. For some little while Mysie left him to make his selections at leisure for she herself had also some preparations to make for flight. But when, returning from the chamber into which she had retired, with a small bundle in her hand, she found him still indecisive, she insisted in plain terms that he should either make up his baggage for the enterprise, or give it up entirely. Thus urged, the disconsolate knight hastily made up a few clothes into a bundle, regarded his trunk-mails with a mute expression of parting sorrow and intimated his readiness to wait upon his kind guide. She led the way to the door of the apartment, having first carefully extinguished her lamp, and motioning to the knight to stand close behind her, tapped once or twice at the door. She was at length answered by Edward Glendinning, who demanded to know who knocked within, and what was desired. "'Speak low,' said Mysie Happer, "'or you will awaken the English knight. It is I, Mysie Happer, who knock. I wish to get out.' You have locked me up, and I was obliged to wait till the Southron slept." "'Locked you up?' replied Edward in surprise. "'Yes,' answered the miller's daughter. "'You have locked me up into this room. I was in Mary Avenel's sleeping apartment.' "'And can you not remain there till morning?' replied Edward, since it has so chanced." "'What?' said the miller's daughter, in a tone of offended delicacy. "'I remain here a moment longer than I can get out without discovery?' I would not, for all the hallowed dome of St. Mary's, remain a minute longer in the neighbourhood of a man's apartment than I can help it. For whom, or for what, do you hold me? I promise you my father's daughter has been better brought up than to put in peril her good name." "'Come forth, then, and get to thy chamber in silence,' said Edward. So saying, he undid the bolt. The staircase without was in utter darkness, as Mysie had before ascertained. 
So soon as she stepped out, she took hold of Edward as if to support herself, thus interposing her person betwixt him and Sir Piercy Shafton, by whom she was closely followed. Thus screened from observation, the Englishman slipped past on tiptoe, unshod and in silence, while the damsel complained to Edward that she wanted a light. "'I cannot give you a light,' said he, "'for I cannot leave this post. But there is a fire below.' "'I will sit below till morning,' said the maid of the mill. And, tripping downstairs, heard Edward bolt and bar the door of the now tenantless apartment with vain caution. At the foot of the stair which she descended, she found the object of her care waiting her farther directions. She recommended to him the most absolute silence, which, for once in his life he seemed not unwilling to observe, conducted him with as much caution as if he were walking on cracked ice to a dark recess, used for depositing wood, and instructed him to ensconce himself behind the faggots. She herself lighted her lamp once more at the kitchen fire and took her distaff and spindle, that she might not seem to be unemployed, in case any one came into the apartment. From time to time, however, she stole towards the window on tiptoe, to catch the first glance of the dawn, for the farther prosecution of her adventurous project. At length she saw, to her great joy, the first peep of the morning brighten upon the grey clouds of the east, and clasping her hands together, thanked Our Lady for the sight and implored protection during the remainder of her enterprise. Ere she had finished her prayer, she started at feeling a man's arm across her shoulder, while a rough voice spoke in her ear. What? Men's full misey of the mill so soon at her prayers? Now, benison on the bonny eyes that open so early, I'll have a kiss for good morrow's sake. Dan of the Hollethurst, for he was the gallant who paid misey this compliment, suited the action with the word and the action, as is usual in such cases of rustic gallantry, was rewarded with a cuff, which Dan received as a fine gentleman receives a tap with a fan, but which, delivered by the energetic arm of the miller's maiden, would have certainly astonished a less robust gallant. "'How now, Sir Coxcomb?' said she. "'And must you be away from your guard over the English knight, to plague quiet folks with your horse-tricks?' "'Truly you are mistaken, pretty Mysie,' said the clown, "'for I have not yet relieved Edward at his post, "'and were it not a shame to let him stay any longer by my faith, "'I could find it in my heart not to quit you these two hours.' "'Oh, you have hours and hours enough to see any one,' said Mysie. "'But you must think of the distress of the household, even now, "'and get Edward to sleep for a while, for he has kept watch this whole night.' "'I will have another kiss first, answered Dan of the Hollethurst. But Mysie was now on her guard, and, conscious of the vicinity of the wood-hole, offered such strenuous resistance that the swain cursed the nymph's bad humour with very unpastoral phrase and emphasis, and ran upstairs to relieve the guard of his comrade. Stealing to the door, she heard the new sentinel hold a brief conversation with Edward, after which the latter withdrew, and the former entered upon the duties of his watch. Mysie suffered him to walk there a little while undisturbed, until the dawning became more general, by which time she supposed he might have digested her coyness, and then presenting herself before the watchful sentinel, demanded of him the keys of the outer tower and of the courtyard gate. "'And for what purpose?' answered the warder. "'To milk the cows and drive them out to their pasture,' said Mysie. "'You would not have the poor beasts kept in the byre all morning, and the family in such distress that there is nay ain fit to do a turn but the byre-woman and myself. "'And where is the byre-woman?' said Dan. "'Sitting with me in the kitchen, in case these distressed folks want anything.' "'There are the keys, then, my Zidorts,' said the sentinel. "'Many thanks, Dan ne'er do weel answered the maid of the mill, and escaped downstairs in a moment. "'To hasten to the wood-hole, and there to robe the English knight in a short gown and petticoat, which she had provided for the purpose, was the work of another moment. She then undid the gates of the tower, and made towards the byre, or cow-house, which stood in one corner of the courtyard. Sir Piercy Shafton remonstrated against the delay which this would occasion. "'Fair and generous Molinara,' he said, "'had we not better undo the outward gate and make the best of our way hence?' even like a pair of sea-mews, who make towards shelter of the rocks as the storm waxes high. 
"'We must drive out the cows first, said Mysie, "'for a sin it were to spoil the poor widow's cattle, "'both for her sake and the poor beast's own. "'And I have no mind any one shall leave the tower in a hurry to follow us. "'Besides, you must have your horse, "'for you will need a fleet one ere all be done.' So saying, she locked and double-locked both the inward and outward door of the tower, proceeded to the cow-house, turned out the cattle, and giving the knight his own horse to lead, drove them before her out at the courtyard gate, intending to return for her own palfrey. But the noise attending the first operation caught the wakeful attention of Edward, who, starting to the bartizan, called to know what the matter was. Mysie answered with great readiness that she was driving out the cows, for that they would be spoiled for want of looking to. "'I thank thee, kind maiden,' said Edward. "'And yet,' he added, after a moment's pause, "'what damsel is that thou hast with thee?' Mysie was about to answer, when Sir Piercy Shafton, who apparently did not desire that the great work of his liberation should be executed without the interposition of his own ingenuity, exclaimed from beneath, "'I am she, O most bucolical juvenile, under whose charge are placed the milky mothers of the herd!' "'Hell and darkness!' exclaimed Edward, in a transport of fury and astonishment. "'It is Piercy Shafton. What? Treason! Treason! Ho! Dan! Jasper! Martin! The villain escapes!' "'To horse! To horse!' cried Mysie, and in an instant mounted behind the knight, who was already in the saddle. Edward caught up a crossbow and let fly a bolt which whistled so near Mysie's ear that she called to her companion, "'Spur! Spur, Sir Knight! The next will not miss us. Had it been Halbert instead of Edward who bent that bow, we had been dead.' The knight pressed his horse, which dashed past the cows, and down the knoll on which the tower was situated. Then, taking the road down the valley, the gallant animal, reckless of its double burden, soon conveyed them out of hearing of the tumult and alarm with which their departure filled the tower of Glendearg. Thus it strangely happened that two men were flying in different directions at the same time, each accused of being the other's murderer. End of chapter 28, Part B Chapter 29, Part A of The Monastery by Walter Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29, Part A Sure he cannot be so unmanly as to leave me here. If he do, maids will not so easily trust men again. THE TWO NOBLE KINSMEN The knight continued to keep the good horse at a pace as quick as the road permitted, until they had cleared the valley of Glendearg, and entered upon the broad dale of the Tweed, which now rolled before them in crystal beauty, displaying on its opposite bank the huge grey monastery of St. Mary's, whose towers and pinnacles were scarce yet touched by the newly risen sun, so deeply the edifice lies shrouded under the mountains which rise to the southward. Turning to the left, the knight continued his road down to the northern bank of the river, until they arrived nearly opposite to the weir, or dam dyke, where Father Philip concluded his extraordinary aquatic excursion. Sir Piercy Shafton, whose brain seldom admitted more than one idea at a time, had hitherto pushed forward without very distinctly considering where he was going. But the sight of the monastery so near to him reminded him that he was still on dangerous ground, and that he must necessarily provide for his safety by choosing some settled plan of escape. The situation of his guide and deliverer also occurred to him, for he was far from being either selfish or ungrateful. He listened, and discovered that the miller's daughter was sobbing and weeping bitterly as she rested her head on his shoulder. "'What ails thee?' he said, my generous Malinera. "'Is there aught that Piercy Shafton can do which may show his gratitude to his deliverer?' Mysie pointed with her finger across the river, but ventured not to turn her eyes in that direction. "'Nay, but speak plain, most generous damsel,' said the knight who for once was puzzled as much as his own elegance of speech was wont to puzzle others. "'For I swear to you that I comprehend naught by the extension of thy fair digit.' "'Yonder is my father's house,' said Mysie, in a voice interrupted by the increased burst of her sorrow. "'And I was carrying thee discourteously to a distance from thy habitation?' said Shafton, imagining he had found out the source of her grief. Woe worth the hour that Piercy Shafton, in attention to his own safety, neglected the accommodation of any female, 
far less of his most beneficent liberatrice. Dismount, then, O lovely Molinara, unless thou wouldst rather that I should transport thee on horseback to the house of thy molundinary father, which, if thou sayest the word, I am prompt to do, defying all dangers which may arise to me personally, whether by monk or miller. Mysie suppressed her sobs, and with considerable difficulty muttered her desire to alight, and take her fortune by herself. Sir Piercy Shafton, too devoted a squire of dames to consider the most lowly as exempted from a respectful attention, independent of the claims which the miller's maiden possessed over him, dismounted instantly from his horse, and received in his arms the poor girl who still wept bitterly, and, when placed on the ground, seemed scarce able to support herself or at least still clung, though, as it appeared, unconsciously, to the support he had afforded. He carried her to a weeping birch-tree, which grew on the greensward bank, around which the road winded, and placing her on the ground beneath it, exhorted her to compose herself. A strong touch of natural feeling struggled with, and half overcame, his acquired affectation, while he said, "'Credit me, most generous damsel!' The service you have done to Piercy Shafton he would have deemed too dearly bought, had he foreseen it was to cost you these tears and singles. Show me the cause of your grief, and if I can do aught to remove it, believe that the rights you have acquired over me will make your commands sacred as those of an empress. Speak then, fair Malinara, and command him whom fortune hath rendered at once your debtor and your champion. What are your orders? "'Only that you will fly and save yourself,' said Mysie, mustering up her utmost efforts to utter these few words. "'Yet,' said the knight, "'let me not leave you without some token of remembrance.' Mysie would have said there needed none, and most truly would she have spoken, could she have spoken for weeping. "'Piercy Shafton is poor,' he continued, "'but let this chain testify he is not ungrateful to his deliverer.' He took from his neck the rich chain and medallion we have formerly mentioned and put it into the powerless hand of the poor maiden, who neither received nor rejected it, but, occupied with more intense feelings, seemed scarce aware of what he was doing. "'We shall meet again,' said Sir Piercy Shafton. "'At least I trust so. Meanwhile, weep no more, fair Molinara, and thou lovest me.' The phrase of conjuration was but used as an ordinary commonplace expression of the time, but bore a deeper sense to poor Mysie's ear. She dried her tears, and when the knight, in all kind and chivalrous courtesy, stooped to embrace her at their parting, she rose humbly up to receive the proffered honour, in a posture of more deference, and meekly and gratefully accepted the offered salute. Sir Piercy Shafton mounted his horse, and began to ride off. But curiosity, or perhaps a stronger feeling, soon induced him to look back, when he beheld the miller's daughter standing still motionless on the spot where they had parted. Her eyes turned after him, and the unheeded chain hanging from her hand. It was at this moment that a glimpse of the real state of Mysie's affections, and of the motive from which she had acted in the whole matter, glanced on Sir Piercy Shafton's mind. The gallants of that age, disinterested, aspiring, and lofty-minded, even in their coxcombry, were strangers to those degrading and mischievous pursuits which are usually termed low amours. They did not chase the humble maidens of the plain, or degrade their own rank, to deprive rural innocence of peace and virtue. It followed, of course, that, as conquests in this class were no part of their ambition, they were in most cases totally overlooked and unsuspected, left unimproved, as a modern would call it, where, as on the present occasion, they were casually made. The companion of Astrophel, and flower of the tilt-yard of Feliciana, had no more idea that his graces and good parts could attach the love of Mysie Happer than a first-rate beauty in the boxes dreams of the fatal wound which her charms may inflict on some attorney's romantic apprentice in the pit. I suppose, in any ordinary case, the pride of rank and distinction would have pronounced on the humble admirer the doom which Beau Fielding denounced against the whole female world. Let them look and die. But the obligations under which he lay to the enamoured maiden, Miller's daughter as she was, precluded the possibility of Sir Piercy's treating the matter en cavalier, and much embarrassed, yet a little flattered at the same time, he rode back to try what could be done for the damsel's relief. 
The innate modesty of poor Mysie could not prevent her showing two obvious signs of joy at Sir Piercy Shafton's return. She was betrayed by the sparkle of the rekindling eye, and a caress which, however timidly bestowed, she could not help giving to the neck of the horse which brought back the beloved rider. "'What farther can I do for you, kind Molinara? said Sir Piercy Shafton himself, hesitating and blushing. For to the grace of Queen Bess's age be it spoken, her courtiers wore more iron on their breasts than brass on their foreheads and even amid their vanities preserved still the decaying spirit of chivalry which inspired of yore the very gentle knight of chaucer who in his port was modest as a maid mysie blushed deeply with her eyes fixed on the ground and sir piercie proceeded in the same tone of embarrassed kindness are you afraid to return home alone my kind molinara would you that i should accompany you Alas, said Mysie, looking up, and her cheek changing from scarlet to pale, I have no home left. How? No home? said Shafton. Says my generous Molinara, she hath no home, when yonder stands the house of her father, and but a crystal stream between. Alas, answered the miller's maiden, I have no longer either home or father. He is a devoted servant to the abbey. I have offended the abbot, and if I return home my father will kill me. He dare not injure thee by heaven, said Sir Piercy. I swear to thee, by my honour and knighthood, that the forces of my cousin of Northumberland shall lay the monastery so flat, that a horse shall not stumble as he rides over it, if they should dare to injure a hair of your head. Therefore be hopeful and content, kind Mycinda, and know you have obliged one who can and will avenge the slightest wrong offered to you. He sprung from his horse as he spoke, and in the animation of his argument grasped the willing hand of Mysie, or Mycinda as he had now christened her. He gazed, too, upon full black eyes, fixed upon his own with an expression which, however subdued by maidenly shame, it was impossible to mistake on cheeks where something like hope began to restore the natural colour, and on two lips which, like double rosebuds, were kept a little apart by expectation, and showed within a line of teeth as white as pearl. All this was dangerous to look upon, and Sir Piercy Shafton, after repeating with less and less force his request that the fair Mycinda would allow him to carry her to her father's, ended by asking the fair Mycinda to go along with him. At least, he added, until I shall be able to conduct you to a place of safety. Mysie Happer made no answer, but blushing scarlet betwixt joy and shame, mutely expressed her willingness to accompany the Southron knight, by knitting her bundle closer and preparing to resume her seat on croup. "'And what is your pleasure that I should do with this?' she said, holding up the chain, as if she had been for the first time aware that it was in her hand. "'Keep it, fairest Mycinda, for my sake,' said the knight. "'Not so, sir,' answered Mysie gravely. "'The maidens of my country take no such gifts from their superiors, and I need no token to remind me of this morning.' Most earnestly and courteously did the knight urge her acceptance of the proposed guerdon, but on this point Mysie was resolute, feeling, perhaps, that to accept of anything bearing the appearance of reward would be to place the service she had rendered him on a mercenary footing. In short, she would only agree to conceal the chain, lest it might prove the means of detecting the owner, until Sir Piercy should be placed in perfect safety. They mounted and resumed their journey of which Mysie, as bold and sharp-witted in some points as she was simple and susceptible in others, now took in some degree the direction, having only inquired its general destination and learned that Sir Piercy Shafton desired to go to Edinburgh, where he hoped to find friends and protection. Possessed of this information, Mysie availed herself of her local knowledge to get as soon as possible out of the bounds of the Halidome and into those of a temporal baron supposed to be addicted to the reformed doctrines, and upon whose limits, at least, she thought their pursuers would not attempt to hazard any violence. She was not indeed very apprehensive of her pursuit, reckoning with some confidence that the inhabitants of the Tower of Glendirg would find it a matter of difficulty to surmount the obstacles arising from their own bolts and bars, with which she had carefully secured them before setting forth on the retreat. They journeyed on, therefore, in tolerable security, and Sir Piercy Shafton found leisure to amuse the time in high-flown speeches and long anecdotes of the court of Feliciana, 
to which Mysie bent an ear not a whit less attentive that she did not understand one word out of three which was uttered by her fellow-traveller. She listened, however, and admired upon trust, as many a wise man has been contented to treat the conversation of a handsome but silly mistress. As for Sir Piercy, he was in his element, and well assured of the interest and full approbation of his auditor, he went on spouting euphuism of more than usual obscurity, and at more than usual length. Thus passed the morning, and noon brought them within sight of a winding stream, on the side of which arose an ancient baronial castle, surrounded by some large trees. At a small distance from the gate of the mansion extended, as in those days was usual, a straggling hamlet, having a church in the centre. "'There are two hostelries in this Kirktown,' said Mysie, "'but the worst is best for our purpose, for it stands apart from the other houses. And I ken the man wheel, for he has dealt with my father for malt. This causa scientiae, to use a lawyer's phrase, was ill-chosen for Mysie's purpose, for Sir Piercy Shafton had, by dint of his own loquacity, been talking himself all this while into a high esteem for his fellow-traveller, and, pleased with the gracious reception which she afforded to his powers of conversation, had well-nigh forgotten that she was not herself one of those high-born beauties of whom he was recounting so many stories when this unlucky speech at once placed the most disadvantageous circumstances attending her lineage under his immediate recollection. He said nothing, however. What indeed could he say? Nothing was so natural as that a miller's daughter should be acquainted with publicans who dealt with her father for malt, and all that was to be wondered at was the concurrence of events which had rendered such a female the companion and guide of Sir Piercy Shafton, of Wilverton, kinsman of the great Earl of Northumberland, whom princes and sovereigns themselves termed cousin because of the Piercy blood. Footnote. Froissart tells us somewhere, the readers of romances are indifferent to accurate reference, that the King of France called one of the Piercy's cousin because of the blood of Northumberland. End footnote. He felt the disgrace of strolling through the country with a miller's maiden on the crupper behind him and was even ungrateful enough to feel some emotions of shame when he halted his horse at the door of the little inn. But the alert intelligence of Mysie Happer spared him farther sense of derogation, by instantly springing from his horse, and cramming the ears of mine host, who came out with his mouth agape to receive a guest of the knight's appearance, with an imagined tale, in which circumstance on circumstance were huddled so fast as to astonish Sir Piercy Shafton, whose own invention was none of the most brilliant. She explained to the publican that this was a great English knight travelling from the monastery to the court of Scotland, after having paid his vows to St. Mary, and that she had been directed to conduct him so far on the road, and that Ball, her palfrey, had fallen by the way because he had been overwrought with carrying home the last melder of meal to the portioner of Langhope, and that she had turned in Ball to graze in the Tasker's Park, near Cripplecross, for he had stood as still as Lot's wife with very weariness, and that the knight had courteously insisted she should ride behind him, and that she had brought him to her kenned friend's hostelry rather than to proud Peter Petty's, who got his malt at the Mellerstain Mills and that he must get the best that the house afforded, and that he must get it ready in a moment of time, and that she was ready to help in the kitchen. All this ran glibly off the tongue without pause on the part of Mysie Happer, or doubt on that of the landlord. The guest's horse was conducted to the stable, and he himself installed in the cleanest corner and best seat which the place afforded. Mysie, ever active and officious, was at once engaged in preparing food, in spreading the table, and in making all the better arrangements which her experience could suggest for the honour and comfort of her companion. He would fain have resisted this, for while it was impossible not to be gratified with the eager and alert kindness which was so active in his service, he felt an undefinable pain in seeing Mycinda engaged in these menial services, and discharging them, moreover, as one to whom they were but too familiar. Yet this jarring feeling was mixed with and perhaps balanced by, the extreme grace with which the neat-handed maiden executed these tasks, however mean in themselves, and gave to the wretched corner of a miserable inn of the period the air of a bower in which an enamoured fairy, or at least a shepherdess of Arcadia, 
was displaying with unavailing solicitude her designs on the heart of some knight destined by fortune to higher thoughts and a more splendid union the lightness and grace with which mysie covered the little round table with a snow-white cloth and arranged upon it the hastily roasted capon with its accompanying stoop of bordeaux were but plebeian graces in themselves but yet there were very flattering ideas excited by each glance she was so very well made agile at once and graceful with her hand and arm as white as snow and her face in which a smile contended with a blush and her eyes which looked ever at shafton when he looked elsewhere and were dropped at once when they encountered his that she was irresistible in fine the affectionate delicacy of her whole demeanour joined to the promptitude and boldness she had so lately evinced tended to ennoble the services she had rendered as if some sweet engaging grace put on some clothes to come abroad and took a waiter's place end of chapter 29 part a chapter 29 part b of the monastery by walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 29 part b but on the other hand came the damning reflection that these duties were not taught her by love to serve the beloved only but arose from the ordinary and natural habits of a miller's daughter accustomed doubtless to render the same service to every wealthier churl who frequented her father's mill this stopped the mouth of vanity and of the love which vanity had been hatching as effectually as a peck of literal flour would have done amidst this variety of emotions sir piercie shafton forgot not to ask the object of them to sit down and partake the good cheer which she had been so anxious to provide and to place in order he expected that this invitation would have been bashfully perhaps but certainly most thankfully accepted but he was partly flattered and partly piqued by the mixture of deference and resolution with which Mysie declined his invitation. Immediately after she vanished from the apartment, leaving the euphuist to consider whether he was most gratified or displeased by her disappearance. In fact, this was a point on which he would have found it difficult to make up his mind had there been any necessity for it. As there was none, he drank a few cups of claret and sang to himself a strophe or two of the canzonets of the divine Astrophel but in spite both of wine and of sir philip sidney the connection in which he now stood and that which he was in future to hold with the lovely molinara or mycinda as he had been pleased to denominate mycie happer recurred to his mind the fashion of the times as we have already noticed fortunately coincided with his own natural generosity of disposition which indeed amounted almost to extravagance in prohibiting as a deadly sin alike against gallantry chivalry and morality his rewarding the good offices he had received from this poor maiden by abusing any of the advantages which her confidence in his honour had afforded to do sir piercie justice it was an idea which never entered into his head and he would probably have dealt the most scientific imbrocata stoccata or punto reverso which the school of vincent saviola had taught him to any man who had dared to suggest to him such selfish and ungrateful meanness on the other hand he was a man and foresaw various circumstances which might render their journey together in this intimate fashion a scandal and a snare moreover he was a coxcomb and a courtier and felt there was something ridiculous in travelling the land with a miller's daughter behind his saddle giving rise to suspicions not very creditable to either and to ludicrous constructions so far as he himself was concerned i would he said half aloud that if such might be done without harm or discredit to the too ambitious yet too well distinguishing molinara she and i were fairly severed and bound on our different courses even as we see the goodly vessel bound for the distant seas hoist sails and bear away into the deep while the humble fly-boat carries to shore those friends who with wounded hearts and watery eyes have committed to their higher destinies the more daring adventurers by whom the fair frigate is manned he had scarce uttered the wish when it was gratified for the host entered to say that his worshipful knighthood's horse was ready to be brought forth as he had desired and on his inquiry for the the damsel that is the young woman mysie happer said the landlord has returned to her father's but she bade me say 
You could not miss the road for Edinburgh, in respect it was neither far away nor foul gate. It is seldom we are exactly blessed with the precise fulfilment of our wishes at the moment when we utter them, perhaps because heaven wisely withholds what, if granted, would be often received with ingratitude, though at least it chanced in the present instance. For when mine host said that Mysie was returned homeward, the knight was tempted to reply with an ejaculation of surprise and vexation, and a hasty demand, whither and when she had departed. The first emotions his prudence suppressed, the second found utterance. "'Where is she gain?' said the host, gazing on him, and repeating his question. "'She is gain hame to her father's, it is like, and she gaed just when she gave orders about your worship's horse, and saw it well fed. She might have trusted me, but millers and millers' kin think a body as thief like themselves. And she's three miles on the gate by this time. Is she gone, then, muttered Sir Piercy, making two or three hasty strides through the narrow apartment. Is she gone? Well, then, let her go. She could have had but disgrace by abiding by me, and I little credit by her society. That I should have thought there was such difficulty in shaking her off. I warrant she is by this time laughing with some clown she has encountered and my rich chain will prove a good dowry, and ought it not to prove so, and has she not deserved it were it ten times more valuable. Piercy Shafton, Piercy Shafton, dost thou grudge thy deliverer the guerdon she hath so dearly won? The selfish air of this northern land hath infected thee, Piercy Shafton, and blighted the blossoms of thy generosity, even as it is said to shrivel the flowers of the mulberry. Yet I thought, he added, after a moment's pause, that she would not so easily and voluntarily have parted from me, but it skills not thinking of it. Cast my reckoning, mine host, and let your groom lead forth my nag. The good host seemed also to have some mental point to discuss, for he answered not instantly, debating perhaps whether his conscience would bear a double charge for the same guests. Apparently his conscience replied in the negative, though not without hesitation, for he at length replied, it's daffing to lee. I winna deny that the lawing is clean paid. Ne'ertheless, if your worshipful knighthood pleases to give aught for increase of trouble— How, said the knight, the reckoning paid? And by whom, I pray you? E'en by Mysie Happer, if truth mun be spoken, as I said before, answered the honest landlord, with as many compunctious visitings for telling the verity as another might have felt for making a lie in the circumstances and out of the money supplied for your honour's journey by the abbot, as she told to me, and laith were I to surcharge any gentleman that darkens my doors. He added in the confidence of honesty which his frank avowal entitled him to entertain, Nevertheless, as I said before, if it pleases your knighthood of free good will to consider extraordinary trouble, the knight cut short his argument by throwing the landlord a rose-noble, which probably doubled the value of a Scottish reckoning though it would have defrayed but a half one at the three cranes or the vintry. The bounty so much delighted mine host that he ran to fill the stirrup-cup, for which no charge was ever made, from a butt yet charier than that which he had pierced for the former stoop. The knight paced slowly to horse, partook of his courtesy, and thanked him with the stiff condescension of the court of Elizabeth, then mounted and followed the northern path, which was pointed out as the nearest to Edinburgh, and which, though very unlike a modern highway, bore yet so distinct a resemblance to a public and frequented road as not to be easily mistaken. "'I shall not need her guidance, it seems,' said he to himself as he rode slowly onward, and I suppose that was one reason of her abrupt departure, so different from what one might have expected. Well, I am well rid of her. Do we not pray to be liberated from temptation?' Yet that she should have erred so much in estimation of her own situation and mine, as to think of defraying the reckoning. I would I saw her once more, but to explain to her the solecism of which her inexperience hath rendered her guilty. And I fear, he added, as he emerged from some straggling trees, and looked out upon a wild Moorish country, composed of a succession of swelling lumpish hills, I fear I shall soon want the aid of this Ariadne, who might afford me a clue through the recesses of yonder mountainous labyrinth." As the knight thus communed with himself, his attention was caught by the sound of a horse's footsteps, and a lad, mounted on a little grey Scottish nag, about fourteen hands high, coming along a path which led from behind the trees, joined him on the high road, 
if it could be termed such. The dress of the lad was completely in village fashion, yet neat and handsome in appearance. He had a jerkin of grey cloth, slashed and trimmed, with black hose of the same, with deerskin rullions or sandals, and handsome silver spurs. A cloak of a dark mulberry colour was closely drawn round the upper part of his person, and the cape in part muffled his face, which was also obscured by his bonnet of black velvet cloth, and its little plume of feathers. Sir Piercy Shafton, fond of society, desirous also to have a guide, and moreover prepossessed in favour of so handsome a youth, failed not to ask him whence he came, and whither he was going. The youth looked another way as he answered, that he was going to Edinburgh to seek service in some nobleman's family. "'I fear me you have run away from your last master,' said Sir Piercy, "'since you dare not look me in the face while you answer my question.' "'Indeed, sir, I have not,' answered the lad bashfully, while as if with reluctance he turned round his face, and instantly withdrew it. It was a glance, but the discovery was complete. There was no mistaking the dark full eye, the cheek in which much embarrassment could not altogether disguise an expression of comic humour, and the whole figure at once betrayed, under her metamorphosis, the maid of the mill. The recognition was joyful, and Sir Piercy Shafton was too much pleased to have regained his companion to remember the very good reasons which had consoled him for losing her. To his questions respecting her dress, she answered that she had obtained it in the Kirkdown from a friend. It was the holiday suit of a son of hers, who had taken the field with his liege lord, the baron of the land. She had borrowed the suit under pretense she meant to play in some mumming or rural masquerade. She had left, she said, her own apparel in exchange, which was better worth ten crowns than this was worth four. "'And the nag, my ingenious Molinara,' said Sir Piercy, "'whence comes the nag?' "'I borrowed him from our host at the Gled's Nest,' she replied and added, half stifling a laugh, he is sent to get, instead of it, our ball, which I left in the Tasker's Park at Cripple Cross. He will be lucky if he find it there. But then the poor man will lose his horse, most argute, Mycinda, said Sir Piercy Shafton, whose English notions of property were a little startled at a mode of acquisition more congenial to the ideas of a miller's daughter, and he a border miller to boot, than with those of an English person of quality. "'And if he does lose his horse,' said Mysie, laughing, "'surely he is not the first man on the marches who has had such a mischance. "'But he will be no loser, for I warrant he will stop the value out of monies "'which he has owed my father this many a day.' "'But then your father will be the loser,' objected yet again the pernicious uprightness of Sir Piercy Shafton. "'What signifies it now to talk of my father?' said the damsel pettishly. Then instantly changing to a tone of deep feeling, she added, My father has this day lost that which will make him hold light the loss of all the gear he has left. Struck with the accents of remorseful sorrow in which his companion uttered these few words, the English knight felt himself bound both in honour and conscience to expostulate with her as strongly as he could, on the risk of the step which she had now taken, and on the propriety of her returning to her father's house. The manner of his discourse though adorned with many unnecessary flourishes, was honourable both to his head and heart. The maid of the mill listened to his flowing periods, with her head sunk on her bosom as she rode, like one in deep thought or deeper sorrow. When he had finished, she raised up her countenance, looked full on the night, and replied with great firmness, "'If you are weary of my company, Sir Piercy Shafton, you have but to say so, and the miller's daughter will be no farther cumber to you.' and do not think I will be a burden to you if we travel together to Edinburgh. I have wit enough and pride enough to be a willing burden to no man. But if you reject not my company at present, and fear not it will be burdensome to you hereafter, speak no more to me of returning back. All that you can say to me I have said to myself, and that I am now here is a sign that I have said it to no purpose. Let this subject therefore be forever ended betwixt us." I have already in some small fashion been useful to you, and the time may come I may be more so, for this is not your land of England, where men say justice is done with little fear or favour to great and to small, but it is a land where men do by the strong hand and defend by the ready wit, and I know better than you the perils you are exposed to. Sir Piercy Shafton was somewhat mortified to find that the damsel conceived her presence useful to him as a protectress as well as guide 
and said something of seeking protection of naught save his own arm and his good sword. Mysie answered very quietly that she nothing doubted his bravery, but it was that very quality of bravery which was most likely to involve him in danger. Sir Piercy Shafton, whose head never kept very long in any continued train of thinking, acquiesced without much reply, resolving in his own mind that the maiden only used this apology to disguise her real motive of affection to his person. The romance of the situation flattered his vanity and elevated his imagination, as placing him in the situation of one whose romantic heroes, of whom he had read the histories, where similar transformations made a distinguished figure. He took many a sidelong glance at his page, whose habits of country sport and country exercise had rendered her quite adequate to sustain the character she had assumed. She managed the little nag with dexterity, and even with grace, nor did anything appear that could have betrayed her disguise, except when a bashful consciousness of her companion's eye being fixed on her gave her an appearance of temporary embarrassment, which greatly added to her beauty. The couple rode forward, as in the morning, pleased with themselves and with each other, until they arrived at the village where they were to repose for the night, and where all the inhabitants of the little inn, both male and female, joined in extolling the good grace and handsome countenance of the English knight, and the uncommon beauty of his youthful attendant. It was here that Mysie Happer first made Sir Piercy Shafton sensible of the reserved manner in which she proposed to, to live with him. She announced him as her master and waiting upon him with the reverent demeanour of an actual domestic permitted not the least approach to familiarity, not even such as the knight might with the utmost innocence have ventured upon. For example, Sir Piercy, who as we know was a great connoisseur in dress, was detailing to her the advantageous change which he proposed to make in her attire as soon as they should reach Edinburgh, by arraying her in his own colours of pink and carnation. Mysie Happer listened with great complacency to the unction with which he dilated upon welts, laces, slashes, and trimmings, until carried away by the enthusiasm with which he was asserting the superiority of the falling band over the Spanish ruff, he approached his hand, in the way of illustration, towards the collar of his page's doublet. She instantly stepped back, and gravely reminded him that she was alone and under his protection. "'You cannot but remember the cause which has brought me here,' she continued. "'Make the least approach to any familiarity which you would not offer to a princess surrounded by her court, and you have seen the last of the miller's daughter. She will vanish as the chaff disappears from the Shiling Hill.'" Footnote. The place where corn was winnowed, while that operation was performed by the hand, was called in Scotland the Shiling Hill. End footnote. When the west wind blows. I do protest, fair Molinara, said Sir Piercy Shafton, but the fair Molinara had disappeared before his protest could be uttered. A most singular wench, he said to himself, and by this hand, as discreet as she is fair-featured, certes shame it were to offer her scathe or dishonour. She makes similes, too, though somewhat savouring of her condition. Had she but read Euphues, and forgotten that accursed mill and Shiling Hill, it is my thought that her converse would be broidered with as many and as choice pearls of compliment as that of the most rhetorical lady in the court of Feliciana. I trust she means to return to bear me company. But that was no part of Mysie's prudential scheme. It was then drawing to dusk, and he saw her not again until the next morning, when the horses were brought to the door that they might prosecute their journey. But our story here necessarily leaves the English knight and his page to return to the Tower of Glendearg. End of chapter 29, part B Chapter 30 of The Monastery by Walter Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 You call it an ill angel, it may be so, but sure I am among the ranks which fell, tis the first fiend e'er counselled man to rise and win the bliss the sprite himself had forfeited. Old Play We must resume our narrative at the period when Mary Avenel was conveyed to the apartment which had been formerly occupied by the two Glendinnings, and when her faithful attendant, Tibby, had exhausted herself in useless attempts to compose and to comfort her. Father Eustace also dealt forth with well-meant kindness those apothems and dogmata of consolation which friendship almost always offers to grief 
though they are uniformly offered in vain. She was at length left to indulge in the desolation of her own sorrowful feelings. She felt as those who, loving for the first time, have lost what they loved, before time and repeated calamity have taught them that every loss is to a certain extent reparable or endurable. Such grief may be conceived better than it can be described, as is well known to those who have experienced it. But Mary Avenel had been taught by the peculiarity of her situation to regard herself as the child of destiny, and the melancholy and reflecting turn of her disposition gave to her sorrows a depth and breadth peculiar to her character. The grave, and it was a bloody grave, had closed, as she believed, over the youth to whom she was secretly but most warmly attached. The force and ardour of Halbert's character bearing a singular correspondence to the energy of which her own was capable. Her sorrow did not exhaust itself in sighs and tears, but when the first shock had passed away, concentrated itself with deep and steady meditation, to collect and calculate like a bankrupt debtor the full amount of her loss. It seemed as if all that connected her with earth had vanished with this broken tie. She had never dared to anticipate the probability of an ultimate union with Halbert. Yet now his supposed fall seemed that of the only tree which was to shelter her from the storm. She respected the more gentle character and more peaceful attainments of the younger Glendinning, but it had not escaped her, what never indeed escaped woman in such circumstances, that he was disposed to place himself in competition with what she, the daughter of a proud and warlike race, deemed the more manly qualities of his elder brother. And there was no time when a woman does so little justice to the character of a surviving lover as when comparing him with the preferred rival of whom she has been recently deprived. The motherly but coarse kindness of Dame Glendinning, and the doting fondness of her old domestic, seemed now the only kind feeling of which she formed the object, and she could not but reflect how little these were to be compared with the devoted attachment of a high-souled youth, whom the least glance of her eye could command, as the high-mettled steed is governed by the bridle of the rider. It was when plunged among these desolating reflections, that Mary Avenel felt the void of mind, arising from the narrow and bigoted ignorance in which Rome then educated the children of her church. Their whole religion was a ritual, and their prayers were the formal iteration of unknown words, which, in the hour of affliction, could yield but little consolation to those who, from habit, resorted to them. Unused to the practice of mental devotion, and a personal approach to the Divine Presence by prayer, she could not help exclaiming in her distress, there is no aid for me on earth, and I know not how to ask it from heaven." As she spoke thus in an agony of sorrow, she cast her eyes into the apartment, and saw the mysterious spirit, which waited upon the fortunes of her house, standing in the moonlight in the midst of the room. The same form, as the reader knows, had more than once offered itself to her sight, and either her native boldness of mind, or some peculiarity, attached to her from her birth, made her now look upon it without shrinking. But the White Lady of Avenel was now more distinctly visible and more closely present than she had ever before seemed to be, and Mary was appalled by her presence. She would, however, have spoken, but there ran a tradition that, though others who had seen the White Lady had asked questions and received answers, yet those of the House of Avenel who had ventured to speak to her had never long survived the colloquy. The figure, besides, as sitting up in her bed, Mary Avenel gazed on it, intently, seemed by its gestures to caution her to keep silence, and at the same time to bespeak attention. The white lady then seemed to press one of the planks of the floor with her foot, while in her usual low melancholy and musical chant she repeated the following verses. Maiden, whose sorrows wail the living dead, whose eyes shall commune with the dead alive, Maiden, attend. Beneath my foot lies hid the word, the law, the path, which thou dost strive to find and canst not find. Could spirits shed tears for their lot, it were my lot to weep, showing the road which I shall never tread. Though my foot points it. Sleep, eternal sleep, dark, long, and cold forgetfulness, my lot. But do not thou at human ills repine. Secure there lies full guerdon in this spot for all the woes that wait frail Adam's line. Stoop, then, and make it yours. 
I may not make it mine. The phantom stooped towards the floor as she concluded, as if with the intention of laying her hand on the board on which she stood. But ere she had completed the gesture, her form became indistinct, was presently only like the shade of a fleecy cloud, which passed betwixt earth and moon, and was soon altogether invisible. A strong impression of fear, the first which she had experienced in her life to any agitating extent, seized upon the mind of Mary Avenel, and for a minute she felt a disposition to faint. She repelled it, however, mustered her courage, and addressed herself to saints and angels as her church recommended. Broken slumbers at length stole on her exhausted mind and frame, and she slept until the dawn was about to rise, when she was awakened by the cry of, Treason! Treason! Follow! Follow! which arose in the tower, when it was found that Piercy Shafton had made his escape. Apprehensive of some new misfortune, Mary Avenel hastily arranged the dress which she had not laid aside, and venturing to quit her chamber, learned from Tib, who with her grey hairs dishevelled like those of a sibyl, was flying from room to room, that the bloody Southron villain had made his escape, and that Halbert Glendinning, poor bairn, would sleep unrevenged and unquiet in his bloody grave. In the lower apartments the young men were roaring like thunder, and venting in oaths and exclamations against the fugitives the rage which they experienced, in finding themselves locked up within the tower, and debarred from their vindictive pursuit by the wily precautions of Mysie Happer. The authoritative voice of the sub-prior commanding silence was next heard, upon which Mary Avenel, whose tone of feeling did not lead her to enter into counsel or society with the rest of the party, again retired to her solitary chamber. The rest of the family held counsel in the spence, Edward almost beside himself with rage, and the sub-prior in no small degree offended at the effrontery of Mysie Happer in attempting such a scheme, as well as at the mingled boldness and dexterity with which it had been executed. But neither surprise nor anger availed aught. The windows, well secured with iron bars for keeping assailants out, proved now as effectual for detaining the inhabitants within. The battlements were open, indeed, but without ladder or ropes to act as a substitute for wings there was no possibility of descending from them. They easily succeeded in alarming the inhabitants of the cottages beyond the precincts of the court, but the men had been called in to strengthen the guard for the night, and only women and children remained who could contribute nothing in the emergency, except their useless exclamations of surprise and there were no neighbours for miles around. Dame Elspeth, however, though drowned in tears, was not so unmindful of external affairs, but that she could find voice enough to tell the women and children without to leave their skirling, and look after the cows that she could not get minded, what with the awful distraction of her mind, what with that false slut having locked them up in their ain tower as fast as if they had been in the jeddart tollbooth. Meanwhile, the men finding other modes of exit impossible, unanimously concluded to force the doors with such tools as the house afforded for that purpose. These were not very proper for the occasion, and the strength of the doors was great. The interior one, formed of oak, occupied them for three mortal hours, and there was little prospect of the iron door being forced in double the time. While they were engaged in this ungrateful toil, Mary Avenel had with much less labour acquired exact knowledge of what the spirit had intimated in her mystic rhyme. On examining the spot, which the phantom had indicated by her gestures, it was not difficult to discover that a board had been loosened, which might be raised at pleasure. On removing this piece of plank, Mary Avenel was astonished to find the black book, well remembered by her as her mother's favourite study, of which she immediately took possession, with as much joy as her present situation rendered her capable of feeling. Ignorant in a great measure of its contents, Mary Avenel had been taught from her infancy to hold this volume in sacred veneration. It is probable that the deceased lady of Walter Avenel only postponed initiating her daughter into the mysteries of the divine word, until she should be better able to comprehend both the lessons which it taught and the risk at which in those times they were studied. Death interposed, and removed her before the times became favourable to the reformers and before her daughter was so far advanced in age as to be fit to receive religious instruction of this deep import. But the affectionate mother had made preparations for the earthly work which she had most at heart. 
There were slips of paper inserted in the volume, in which, by an appeal to and a comparison of various passages in Holy Writ, the errors and human inventions with which the Church of Rome had defaced the simple edifice of Christianity, as erected by its divine architect, were pointed out. These controversial topics were treated with a spirit of calmness and Christian charity, which might have been an example to the theologians of the period, but they were clearly, fairly, and plainly argued, and supported by the necessary proofs and references. Other papers there were which had no reference whatever to polemics, but were the simple effusions of a devout mind communing with itself. Among these was one frequently used, as it seemed from the state of the manuscript, on which the mother of Mary had transcribed and placed together those affecting texts to which the heart has recourse, in affliction, and which assures us at once of the sympathy and protection afforded to the children of the promise. In Mary Avenel's state of mind these attracted her above all the other lessons, which, coming from a hand so dear, had reached her at a time so critical, and in a manner so touching. She read the affecting promise, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee and the consoling exhortation, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. She read them, and her heart acquiesced in the conclusion. Surely this is the word of God. There are those to whom a sense of religion has come in storm and tempest. There are those whom it is summoned amid scenes of revelry and idle vanity. There are those, too, who have heard its still small voice amid rural leisure and placid contentment. But perhaps the knowledge which causeth not to err is most frequently impressed upon the mind during seasons of affliction, and tears are the softened showers which cause the seed of heaven to spring and take root in the human breast. At least it was thus with Mary Avenel. She was insensible to the discordant noise which rang below, the clang of bars and the jarring symphony of the levers which they used to force them, the measured shouts of the laboring inmates as they combined their strength for each heave and gave time with their voices to the exertion of their arms, and their deeply muttered vows of revenge on the fugitives who had bequeathed them at their departure a task so toilsome and difficult. Not all this din combined in hideous concert, and expressive of aught but peace, love, and forgiveness, could divert Mary Avenel from the new course of study on which she had so singularly entered. The serenity of heaven, she said, is above me, the sounds which are around are but those of earth and earthly passion. And little impression was made on the iron grate, when they who laboured at it received a sudden reinforcement by the unexpected arrival of Christie of the Clint Hill. He came at the head of a small party, consisting of four horsemen, who bore in their caps the sprig of holly, which was the badge of Avenel. "'What ho, my masters,' he said, "'I bring you a prisoner.' "'You had better have brought us liberty,' said Dan of the Howlet Hurst. Christie looked at the state of affairs with great surprise. "'And I were to be hanged for it,' he said. "'As I may, for as little a matter, I could not forbear laughing at seeing men peeping through their own bars like so many rats in a rat-trap, and he with the beard behind like the oldest rat in the cellar.' "'Hush, thou unmannered knave,' said Edward. "'It is the sub-prior, and this is neither time, place, nor company for your ruffian jests.' "'What ho! Is my young master Malapert?' said Christie. "'Why, man, were he my own carnal father, instead of being father to half the world, I would have my laugh out. And now it is over I must assist you, I reckon, for you are setting very greenly about this gear. Put the pinch nearer the staple, man, and hand me an iron crow through the grate, for that's the fowl to fly away with a wicket on its shoulders. I have broke into as many grates as you have teeth in your young head. Ay, and broke out of them, too, as the captain of the castle of Loch Maben knows full well. Christie did not boast more skill than he really possessed, for, applying their combined strength, under the direction of that experienced engineer, bolt and staple gave way before them, and in less than half an hour the grate, which had so long repelled their force, stood open before them. "'And now,' said Edward, "'to horse my mates, and pursue the villain Shafton.' "'Halt there,' said Christie of the Clinthill. "'Pursue your guest, my master's friend, and my own? "'There go two words to that bargain. "'What the foul fiend would you pursue him for?' "'Let me pass,' said Edward vehemently. "'I will be stayed by no man. "'The villain has murdered my brother.' "'What says he?' said Christie, turning to the others. "'Murdered? Who was murdered? And by whom?' 
"'The Englishman, Sir Piercy Shafton,' said Dan of the Howlethurst, "'has murdered young Halbert Glendinning yesterday morning, and we have all risen to the fray.' "'It is a bedlam business, I think,' said Christie. First I find you all locked up in your own tower, and next I am come to prevent you revenging a murder that was never committed. "'I tell you,' said Edward, "'that my brother was slain and buried yesterday morning by this false Englishman.' "'And I tell you,' answered Christie, "'that I saw him alive and well last night. I would I knew his trick of getting out of the grave. Most men find it more hard to break through a green sod than a grated door.' Everybody now paused, and looked on Christie in astonishment, until the sub-prior, who had hitherto avoided communication with him, came up and required earnestly to know whether he meant really to maintain that Halbert Glendinning lived. "'Father,' he said, with more respect than he usually showed to any one save his master, "'I confess I may sometimes jest with those of your coat, but not with you, because, as you may partly recollect, I owe you a life. It is certain as the sun is in heaven.' that Halbert Glendinning supped at the house of my master the Baron of Avenel last night, and that he came thither in company with an old man of whom more anon. "'And where is he now?' "'The devil only can answer that question,' replied Christie, "'for the devil has possessed the whole family, I think. He took fright, the foolish lad, at something or other which our Baron did in his moody humour. And so he jumped into the lake and swam ashore like a wild duck.' Robin of Redcastle spoiled a good gelding in chasing him this morning. "'And why did he chase the youth?' asked the sub-prior. "'What harm had he done?' "'None that I know of,' said Christie. "'But such was the baron's order, being in his mood, and all the world having gone mad, as I have said before.' "'Whither away so fast, Edward?' said the monk. "'To Coinan Shion, father,' answered the youth. "'Martin and Dan, take pickaxe and mattock, and follow me if you be men.' "'Right,' said the monk, "'and fail not to give us instant notice what you find.' "'If you find aught there like Halbert Glendinning,' said Christie, hallooing after Edward, "'I will be bound to eat him unsalted.' "'Tis a sight to see how that fellow takes the bent. "'It is in the time of action men see what lads are made of. "'Halbert was aye skipping up and down like a roo, "'and his brother used to sit in the chimney-nook with his book and sick like trash. "'But the lad was like a loaded hackbutt.' which will stand in the corner as quiet as an old crutch until you draw the trigger, and then there is nothing but flash and smoke. But here comes my prisoner, and setting other matters aside, I must pray a word with you, Sir Sub-Prior, respecting him. I came on before to treat about him, but I was interrupted with this fashery. As he spoke, two more of Avenel's troopers rode into the courtyard, leading betwixt them a horse, on which, with his hands bound to his side, sate the reformed preacher, Henry Warden. End of chapter 30。Chapter 31, Part A of the Monastery by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31, Part A. At school I knew him, a sharp witted youth, grave, thoughtful, and reserved among his mates turning the hours of sport and food to labor, starving his body to inform his mind. Old Play The sub-prior, at the borderer's request, had not failed to return to the tower, into which he was followed by Christie of the Clint Hill, who, shutting the door of the apartment, drew near, and began his discourse with great confidence and familiarity. "'My master,' he said, sends me with his commendations to you, sir, sub-prior, above all the community of St. Mary's, and more specially than even to the abbot himself, for though he be termed my lord, and so forth, all the world knows that you are the tongue of the trump. If you have aught to say to me concerning the community, said the sub-prior, it were well you proceeded in it without farther delay. Time presses, and the fate of young Glendinning dwells on my mind. I will be cautioned for him, body for body, said Christie. I do protest to you, as sure as I am a living man, so surely is he one. Should I not tell his unhappy mother the joyful tidings, said Father Eustace, and yet better wait till they return from searching the grave? Well, Sir Jackman, your message to me from your master? My lord and master, said Christie, hath good reason to believe that from the information of certain back friends, whom he will reward at more leisure, 
your reverend community hath been led to deem him ill attached to holy church allied with heretics and those who favor heresy and a hungerer after the spoils of your abbey be brief good henchman said the sub-prior for the devil is ever most to be feared when he preacheth briefly then my master desires your friendship and to excuse himself from the maligner's calumnies he sends to your abbot that henry warden whose sermons have turned the world upside down to be dealt with as holy church directs and as the abbot's pleasure may determine the sub-prior's eyes sparkled at the intelligence for it had been accounted a matter of great importance that this man should be arrested possessed as he was known to be of so much zeal and popularity that scarcely the preaching of knox himself had been more awakening to the people and more formidable to the church of rome in fact that ancient system which so well accommodated its doctrines to the wants and wishes of a barbarous age had since the art of printing and the gradual diffusion of knowledge lain floating like some huge leviathan into which ten thousand reforming fishers were darting their harpoons the roman church of scotland in particular was at her last gasp actually blowing blood and water yet still with unremitted though animal exertions maintaining the conflict with the assailants who on every side were plunging their weapons into her bulky body in many large towns the monasteries had been suppressed by the fury of the populace in other places their possessions had been usurped by the power of the reformed nobles but still the hierarchy made a part of the common law of the realm and might claim both its property and its privileges wherever it had the means of asserting them the community of st mary's of kennaquare was considered as being particularly in this situation they had retained undiminished their territorial power and influence and the great barons in the neighborhood partly from their attachment to the party in the state who still upheld the old system of religion partly because each grudged the share of the prey which the others must necessarily claim had as yet abstained from despoiling the halidome the community was also understood to be protected by the powerful earls of northumberland and westmoreland whose zealous attachment to the catholic faith caused at a later period the great rebellion of the tenth of elizabeth thus happily placed it was supposed by the friends of the decaying cause of the roman catholic faith that some determined example of courage and resolution exercised where the franchises of the church were yet entire and her jurisdiction undisputed might awe the progress of the new opinions into activity and protected by the laws which still existed and by the favor of the sovereign might be the means of securing the territory which rome yet preserved in scotland and perhaps of recovering that which she had lost the matter had been considered more than once by the northern catholics of scotland and they had held communication with those of the south father eustace devoted by his public and private vows had caught the flame and had eagerly advised that they should execute the doom of heresy on the first reformed preacher or according to his sense on the first heretic of eminence who should venture within the precincts of the halidome a heart naturally kind and noble was in this instance as it has been in many more deceived by its own generosity father eustace would have been a bad administrator of the inquisitorial power of spain where that power was omnipotent and where judgment was exercised without danger to those who inflicted it in such a situation his rigor might have relented in favor of the criminal whom it was at his pleasure to crush or to place at freedom but in scotland during this crisis the case was entirely different the question was whether one of the spirituality dared at the hazard of his own life to step forward to assert and exercise the rights of the church was there any who would venture to wield the thunder in her cause or must it remain like that in the hand of a painted jupiter the object of derision instead of terror the crisis was calculated to awake the soul of eustace for it comprised the question whether he dared at all hazards to himself to execute with stoical severity a measure which according to the general opinion was to be advantageous to the church and according to ancient law and to his firm belief was not only justifiable but meritorious while such resolutions were agitated amongst the catholics chance placed a victim within their grasp 
Henry Warden had, with the animation proper to the enthusiastic reformers of the age, transgressed, in the vehemence of his zeal, the bounds of the discretional liberty allowed to his sect so far, that it was thought the Queen's personal dignity was concerned in bringing him to justice. He fled from Edinburgh, with recommendations, however, from Lord James Stuart, afterwards the celebrated Earl of Murray, to some of the border chieftains of inferior rank, who were privately conjured, to procure him safe passage into England. One of the principal persons to whom such recommendation was addressed was Julian Avenel, for as yet, and for a considerable time afterwards, the correspondence and interest of Lord James lay rather with the subordinate leaders than with the chiefs of great power, and men of distinguished influence upon the border. Julian Avenel had intrigued without scruple with both parties, yet bad as he was, he certainly would not have practised aught against the guest whom Lord James had recommended to his hospitality, had it not been for what he termed the preacher's officious intermeddling in his family affairs. But when he had determined to make Warden Rue the lecture he had read him, and the scene of public scandal which he had caused in his hall, Julian resolved, with the constitutional shrewdness of his disposition, to combine his vengeance with his interest. And therefore, instead of doing violence on the person of Henry Warden within his own castle, he determined to deliver him up to the community of St. Mary's, and at once make them the instruments of his own revenge, and found a claim of personal recompense, either in money, or in a grant of abbey lands, at a low quit-rent, which last began now to be the established form in which the temporal nobles plundered the spirituality. The sub-prior, therefore, of St. Mary's unexpectedly saw the steadfast, active, and inflexible enemy of the church delivered into his hand, and felt himself called upon to make good his promises to the friends of the Catholic faith by quenching heresy in the blood of one of its most zealous professors. To the honour more of Father Eustace's heart than of his consistency, the communication that Henry Warden was placed within his power struck him with more sorrow than triumph, but his next feelings were those of exultation. It is sad, he said to himself, to cause human suffering. It is awful to cause human blood to be spilled, but the judge to whom the sword of St. Paul, as well as the keys of St. Peter, are confided, must not flinch from his task. Our weapon returns into our own bosom, if not wielded with a steady and unrelenting hand against the irreconcilable enemies of the Holy Church. Periat ist. It is the doom he has incurred, and were all the heretics in Scotland armed and at his back, they should not prevent its being pronounced, and if possible enforced. Bring the heretic before me, he said, issuing his commands aloud and in a tone of authority. Henry Warden was led in, his hands still bound, but his feet at liberty. "'Clear the apartment,' said the sub-prior, of all but the necessary guard on the prisoner. All retired except Christie of the Clinthill, who, having dismissed the inferior troopers whom he commanded, unsheathed his sword, and placed himself beside the door, as if taking upon him the character of sentinel. The judge and the accused met face to face and in that of both was enthroned the noble confidence of rectitude. The monk was about, at the utmost risk to himself and his community, to exercise what in his ignorance he conceived to be his duty. The preacher, actuated by a better informed, yet not a more ardent zeal, was prompt to submit to execution for God's sake, and to seal, were it necessary, his mission with his blood. Placed at such a distance of time as better enables us to appreciate the tendency of the principles on which they severally acted, we cannot doubt to which the palm ought to be awarded. But the zeal of Father Eustace was as free from passion and personal views as if it had been exerted in a better cause. They approached each other, armed each and prepared for intellectual conflict, and each intently regarding his opponent as if either hoped to spy out some defect, some chasm, in the armour of his antagonist. As they gazed on each other, old recollections began to awake in either bosom, at the sight of features long unseen and much altered, but not forgotten. The brow of the sub-prior dismissed by degrees its frown of command, the look of calm yet stern defiance gradually vanished from that of Warden, and both lost for an instant that of gloomy solemnity. 
They had been ancient and intimate friends in youth at a foreign university, but had been long separated from each other, and the change of name, which the preacher had adopted from motives of safety, and the monk from the common custom of the convent, had prevented the possibility of their hitherto recognizing each other in the opposite parts which they had been playing in the great polemical and political drama. But now the sub-prior exclaimed, "'Henry Wellwood!' and the preacher replied, "'William Allen!' and stirred by the old familiar names and never-to-be-forgotten recollections of college studies and college intimacy, their hands were for a moment locked in each other. "'Remove his bonds,' said the sub-prior, and assisted Christie in performing that office with his own hands, although the prisoner scarcely would consent to be unbound, repeating with emphasis that he rejoiced in the cause for which he suffered shame. When his hands were at liberty, however, he showed his sense of the kindness by again exchanging a grasp and a look of affection with the sub-prior. The salute was frank and generous on either side, yet it was but the friendly recognition and greeting which are wont to take place betwixt adverse champions, who do nothing in hate but all in honour. As each felt the pressure of the situation in which they stood, he quitted the grasp of the other's hand and fell back, confronting each other with looks more calm and sorrowful than expressive of any other passion. The sub-prior was the first to speak. And is this, then, the end of that restless activity of mind, that bold and indefatigable love of truth that urged investigation into its utmost limits and seemed to take heaven itself by storm? Is this the termination of Wellwood's career? And having known and loved him during the best years of our youth, do we meet in our old age as judge and criminal? Not as judge and criminal, said Henry Warden, for to avoid confusion we describe him by his later and best known name. Not as judge and criminal do we meet, but as a misguided oppressor and his ready and devoted victim. I too may ask, are these the harvest of the rich hopes excited by the classical learning, acute logical powers, and varied knowledge of William Allen, that he should sink to be the solitary drone of a cell, graced only above the swarm with the high commission of executing Roman malice on all who oppose Roman imposture? Not to thee, answered the sub-prior, be assured, not unto thee nor unto mortal man, will I render an account of the power with which the Church may have invested me. It was granted but as a deposit for her welfare, for her welfare it shall at every risk be exercised, without fear and without favour. I expected no less from your misguided zeal, answered the preacher, and in me have you met one on whom you may fearlessly exercise your authority, secure that his mind at least will defy your influence, as the snows of that Mont Blanc which we saw together, shrink not under the heat of the hottest summer sun. I do believe thee, said the sub-prior, I do believe that thine is indeed metal unmalleable by force. Let it yield then to persuasion. Let us debate these matters of faith, as we once were wont to conduct our scholastic disputes, when hours, nay, days, glided past in the mutual exercise of our intellectual powers. It may be thou mayest yet hear the voice of the shepherd, and return to the universal fold. End of chapter 31, part A, 